Hello. Um, welcome to a very unique type of stream compared to what I've been doing as of recently. And for those of you that are curious as to why this is happening, I feel that I need to preface this by saying that this has been a long time coming. This is something that has been sitting in the back of my mind for a while now, and it's only something that I now actively want to act upon. Now, as a Smash Brothers moveset creator myself, I'm often asked and compared to other creators, like Brawlfan, for example. So, it's only natural that people would be curious about my thoughts for people who are part of the same circle that I am. And there's no fault put on them for asking these kind of questions. And I've given my two cents. I've said that these movesets tend to be a little muddy, that they tend to lose focus of what the design is supposed to be, and basically trail off into just nonsense. Now this is something that, and these questions have been asked a lot, especially in the past few months. And essentially, I've reached a point where I'm tired of talking about them. And if, but it feels like it's something I can't escape from no matter how much I try to not bring it up. And one of the main reasons that I'm even so exposed to Brawl fans' content, because I need to also preface this, I don't actively watch Brawl fans' content. Like, I'm not somebody that subscribed to him. I'm not somebody that goes out of their way to watch a new upload when it's made. But, a majority of my exposure to Brawl fan has been through a single member of a Discord I'm a part of. And this guy practically worships Brawl fans' content. So much so that I had to ban him on three separate occasions because anytime I did a video on a character he also covered, he would come to my video, question every decision I made while recommending me ideas that were literally just ripped straight from Brawl fans' video. Big Boss, you probably know exactly who I'm talking about. But anyways, you couple that with the fact that he also likes to make these passive-aggressive comments about characters I've covered or characters that I, I've stated I'm going to cover and basically go over how they wouldn't work in Smash because he can't think of any ideas for them and essentially you've got a recipe for disaster. Most of my actual hatred for Brawl fan comes from this one guy. It's basically washed off onto me through osmosis. Now, as I was saying, I'm tired of talking about him. I've told people in the past why I don't like things, why I don't like his content. And it's gone to a point where telling people that I don't like something and saying something doesn't work, it's reached a point where people either are antagonizing me for it or they just straight up tune out and don't listen whatsoever. So today, this is a this stream is designed to, instead of just saying, I don't like because blank, I'm literally going to go over his content and explain how flawed the designs are in real time. And I'm doing it live so that you understand that these thoughts are my own and there's no script and there's no filter. I will keep this as professional as possible, but I'm going to warn you ahead of time that there may be rare instances where something slips through the cracks and I already apologize ahead of time for that. Also, once this stream is done, I'm never talking about this guy again. And if, anybody, and if anybody in the future ever asks me about Brawlfan or his content, I'm going to link them to this stream and I'm going to be done with the topic. 
I don't care if he comes out, if somebody comes to me in like four months and they're like, dude, 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 he just made a moveset that's like 12 times worse than the moveset you said was his worst. You gotta look at it. I don't care. I will dismiss it. After this, I'm done talking about him completely. And I'm going to say this right now. I don't know how much of this is actually going to stick. Because I'm not talking bad about anybody in the room. But the Smash community has a horrible track record of ignoring problems and stating that they know more about design and video games than those around them. I've had to explain word for word how fighting games work to people that claim themselves to be mid-tier players of the game. And it just goes straight through their ears. While that's funny, if this falls upon deaf ears, there's all the more reason for me to just stop. Because I've said what I've had to say, and who else am I critiquing? Nobody. I'm not critiquing anybody else. Also, I should also state this ahead of time because this is very important. Anything I talk about or show you is not a go-ahead to go to his videos and badmouth him. That literally doesn't fix anything and only causes more problems. As people are far less likely to listen to what you have to say if you lead with insults. If I find out that people went to his videos and slammed him with hateful comments because of this stream... I am going to specifically ask for your names and I will personally ban you from this channel. Because your actions are completely against what the point of this stream is going to be. The point of this stream is that you learn something about character design. And how much goes into designing a fighting game character. Because that's the point of the, because that's the point of the stream. It's a critique of the character design. It is not a roast, and I will not let anyone treat it as such. I should also preface this by saying, if you are against me doing this, and see this as some attempt to start a fight, you completely miss what the point of this stream is going to be. And you've, either sh and you've shown me that you're either unable or unwilling to listen to a viewpoint that could possibly collide with your own. If that's how you think about this stream now, before I even start talking about the videos, I ask that you leave. Because that kind of mindset is far more harmful to the Smash community than it is helpful. It does nothing for me, does nothing for Brawl Fan, does nothing for nobody. And this goes double for some folks because, spoilers, I haven't, as I said, I haven't said anything about the videos yet. And the stream has already been, has already gotten like a fair amount of dislikes. Again, I haven't said anything about the videos yet. You don't know a thing that I'm going to say about these videos yet. So I can't even give these people the benefit of the doubt that they heard the criticism and they just couldn't take it. This is children, because that's what you are if you can't accept the possibility of someone saying something you don't like, you're a child, wanting to quash someone's thoughts before their fifis might get hurt. Well, here's a newsflash. You're not doing yourself any favors, and you're giving people that like Brawl Fan a bad name. So if you can't take the possibility of someone saying something you don't like, Walk away. Nobody is forcing you to watch this. Nobody is forcing you to listen to this. You are free to leave. And as I said, no, there will not be critiques of other content creators. Pizza is a really good friend of mine, and I enjoy his content a lot. So much so that both our respect for him and the fact that going back to watch his content makes me feel sad that he's gone, he'll never get a critique. The point of this stream is to give you a clear and concise view on five videos that I've specifically chosen. Explain the design philosophy, how it doesn't work, and provide pointers and or advice that could make it better. There will be no comments like, oh, I hate his voice, or oh god, he's so annoying, because that literally doesn't say or solve anything. Insults go nowhere in today's social climate and only serve to cause problems.
It should also be made apparent <clears throat> that while I will not say nice things about Brawl fans' content, there is no hatred or vitriol towards the person behind his persona. I've said this before, but since there's a bigger audience here, I'll say it again. I have no hatred for Brawl fan as a person. Brawl fan as a person comes off as someone who is genuinely nice and pleasant to be around. And I will not take that away from him. This is purely about the content he creates. There is nothing wrong with Brawl fan as a person. And I want to be stone faced with you. I want to be as stone faced with you as I can before we start because I want my intentions to be clear and I want you to understand that no matter what I say, you are allowed to watch and enjoy whoever you want and should not be treated as a lesser person for liking a specific content creator. You're allowed to like what you like and if you still like his content, that's completely fine. All I want you to do is listen and learn. If you have questions, ask questions. Another great reason why this is being done live. Also, if you have any questions now, now's the time to do give them before we start. But I'm going to bring up the playlist. And as I said, I've chosen five videos. I've chosen them all for specific reasons. And while I will not say that this is objectively like his five worst videos, I think that they all show an aspect of his character design and design philosophy that needs to be brought into question. All five of them for different reasons. The only two videos on this list that I would, con I would consider absolutely horribly awful are the bomb two, Evie and Isaac. I think that Isaac is his worst. Which is exactly why he's at the bottom. It's basically going to go from the least offensive one to the most offensive one. Wander ask if you can't take me saying something about a creator you like, get out. That's all I'm going to tell you. If you can't accept the possibility that what I'm about to say is constructive criticism... Leave. What's objectively incorrect about suggesting that this be done privately is because I know for a fact that if I take this to Brawl Fan, he will not listen to a word I say. Because why would you listen to just me? I'm one person. I'm one person whose comment would be swamped by an ocean of people asking for requests and masking requests as praise. It would go nowhere. It would solve nothing. That, and from personal experience talking with Delsethin, talking with people that are Smash creators goes absolutely nowhere because they absolutely refuse to listen to anything you have to say. And they will more than likely just either tune you out completely or run away from the conversation, which is exactly what he did. Again, this is not his objectively five worst videos. I don't think that while, the, that while Dark Matter Zero and Cynthia aren't good, I don't think that they are ne nowhere near as bad as the two at the bottom. There are probably videos he's made that are worse than Dark Matter Zero and Cynthia.
So, as I said before, and I'll, I'll ask again, before we get started, does anybody have any questions? Yes, I know that I need to wait for it to catch up. It needs to catch up because, you know, this is a stream. There's a delay. So I'll give you, so I'll just wait for it to catch up and I'll answer any questions that you might have before we get started. I've already said that these five videos were specifically chosen because they all accentuate problems with Brawl Fan's design philosophy. All of them for different reasons. I don't take requests. Jurassic. There is never going to be requests. I do not take them. If you want a Rathalos moveset, I have a Patreon for it. Am I okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Honestly, I'm more nervous than I am pissed off. Because I legitimately am like thinking, what if this just what if this just goes through everybody's ears and this leads to nothing but problems? But at the same time, I'm like, I want to be done with this. I'm gonna say my two cents, and if they can't take it, then that's not my problem anymore. Am I upset? Yeah. I kind of am. I hate being actively compared to this guy. But yeah, I'm more nervous than I am pissed. Any moveset of his that you particularly like? I think his Unite movesets are fine. If that's anything. I think it's unfair to go back and, and judge his earliest work because everybody's because he's just starting out. Obviously, there's going to be flaws there in terms of video development. So I'm not going to go to his oldest videos and be like, why does this sound awful? Why is it like this compared to the way it is now? No, that's, that's unfair. I would not do that. All right. So, probably where I, you know, put the bookmark that this is where the this is where the critique starts. We are starting with bra we're starting with dark matter, then we're going to zero, then Cynthia, then Evie, and then Isaac. Now, I'm going to be as I watch this, there's going to be lots of instances where I'm pausing to talk. So this isn't like I, I watch it all the way through and then I talk about it at the end. No. I'm also going to be skipping the intro and the character introduction slash backstory. Because honestly, I don't think you need that kind of stuff in a moveset. I don't need to be told... This person came from here, and then they did this, and then this happened, and then their mother ate a steak that was two days past expiration date and died of dysentery. I don't need to know this information. It has no bearing on the moose set. If anything, it only serves to take up more time. So that's going to be skipped. We're starting with the moose set. And then... At the end, I'll give my thought, my concluding thoughts on top of everything I say throughout the video, and then I'll move on to the next one. I probably will take a small break in between each video, like, of like a three, four minute break to talk, and or just like get up and walk for a few minutes, because this is like two hours worth of videos. This stream is going to be like four hours long. My headset just died. Piece of shit.
Does the backstory have spoilers? No, it just doesn't really add anything to the character. Does me telling you that dark matter is a creature that comes from a far away, that comes from an unknown place in the universe and takes over people's minds? I don't need to tell you that because more than likely the moveset will tell you everything you need to know about the character. It's filler that provides some context. I get that. But that context could easily be explained through the moveset. It doesn't really add anything to the video. It only just, it's fluff. All right. I'm going to need to find a proper volume level for this. Set the 1080 for myself. Even though the stream is locked to 720. I need somebody to help me with uh, volume levels. How is this? How does the video sound in comparison to me? There aren't going to be many instances of me talking over the video. But just in case I do, I want it to be so that you hear me better than you hear the video. Okay, so as I said, Dark Matter. For context, why was this video chosen? This video was chosen specifically because the f it's one of the first things I want to talk about with Brawlfan's design philosophy. And that's the fact that some characters, it feels like he does not try with. Dark Matter is a character has incredible amounts of potential. We are talking about an amorphous creature that can change its form at will, has access to a huge variety of abilities, both from its previous battles and other creatures that are associated with dark matter. And essentially, this character could be anything you want to. It could be Rushdown, it could be Zoner, it could be anything. I'm not going to say anything yet, but you'll see it, and I'll pause and I'll talk about when it happens. This character, well, all I'm going to say is that this character was taken nowhere near as far as it should have been. And thank you, Greenstar, for bringing this up, because I watched, somebody linked me the... Duke of Dorks' Dark Matter video like two days before this came out. And I watched it and I liked it. It was good. I didn't think it was a concept that would actively work for Smash, but I thought that the way that Dark Matter could work off of its doubles partner and all that, that the concept for that character would really work in a game like Multiverses, which is basically made for 2v2s. Uh, that's basically what my opinion of, of it was. It's good, but it's not made for Smash. So the point is that when this came out, that video was fresh in my mind. With the unique stuff that he did with Dark Matter. Which is probably why I'm probably going to be I was probably extra harsh on it because again I had just been shown something that was for this type of character that was completely unique and interesting and well thought out and well designed it wasn't designed well for smash but it definitely could have worked in a different type of platform fighter which is exactly why the disappointment that dark matter gave me was palpable 
another reason I chose this video and another reason I chose this video first is because there's a moment in this video that accentuates a problem that I have with Del- with, not with Del- <laughs> with Brawl Fan. Again, I said, no script, you're going to hear me fumble over my words. They accentu it accentuates a problem I have with Brawl Fan as a whole. And when we get to it, I'll mention it. Chances are high that if you've watched this video, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, I'm also going to say this ahead of time. One of the main reasons that this moveset became simplistic, because that's one of the biggest concerns I have with it, is that it's way too simple for what the character is. One of the reasons that this moveset came out so simple is because of the fact that Kirby is simple, is a game. While I can understand that thought process, I do not think that that translates to the bosses, especially the final bosses. Because for anybody that's played a Kirby game, you know what it's like. Yeah, the gameplay's fun and simple, and it starts off like all happy and all that, but by the end of it, it's a fucking nightmare with horrors beyond your comprehension. The bosses of the last like 10 or so Kirby games have all been these nightmarish monstrosities that aren't simple in your design or attack patterns or anything like that. And I think that applies to Dark Matter as well. Yeah, exactly. You go from cake to eldritch horror abomination. That's what Kirby games tend to be. And it's great. It's a great way to get you lulled in and catch you off guard, even if you expect it, because that formula is very similar between all of Kirby's games. They look, they look cutesy and simple on the outside and at the gameplay level, which is, sim which is fine because you play as Kirby and Kirby in Smash is fairly simple. But then you go to characters like Dark Matter that can be anything it wants to control a wide variety of abilities and possibly have ties to a bunch of other bosses from the Kirby series. While they aren't confirmed, it's pretty much highly theorized that they are. But I'm rambling. Let's start the video. We've been going lot we've been going for, for half an hour. <laughs> I haven't even started the video yet. I told you this stream is gonna be long. My voice is going to be literally gravel by the end of this stream. To the world of Super Smash Bros. Fighters below average. Alright, so this is the start. Thumbnail! Sorry, chapter start here. Back. So getting right into things, Dark Matter can be a below average heavyweight fighter. Common amongst Kirby characters, it have a lot of jumps. Five in total to be precise, and no additional movement options. Okay. I know I'm stopping already. This isn't this is not. Do I have tea? I probably will make tea in between a video. I think I can get through at least this and zero before I go to make something. But yeah, okay, so the design aspect of multiple jumps for a Kirby character, that's perfectly fine. Mid, like, middle, like slightly above middle weight character, 101, 102, that's completely fine. Now, I want you to keep in mind that this, the the avatar that you are in control of is the Dark Matter Swordsman from Kirby's Dream Land 2, which was the first form that we ever see Dark Matter take. <coughs> oh god, excuse me. Oh Christ. 
Now something did not agree with me. The main form you're in control of is the Swordsman from Kirby's Dream Land 2, which is the first form we ever see Dark Matter take before, you know, it becomes the true Dark Matter form in the halfway through the fight, and then, you know, become that we see Zero in Dream Land 3, and then all the other forms in 64, like Miracle Matter and all that. I just want you to keep in mind that this is... This is the character that you're in control of, and if you know anything about the Dark Matter trilogy, you expect this character to be doing some really wild stuff in, because of all the things that Dark Matter is shown to do in those games. And even if we don't go to other games, like if we don't pull from like Dark Nebula or uh, Void Termina or anything like that, even though they're more than likely either part of or connected to Dark Matter in some way because, spoiler alert, Void Termina's true form is Dark Matter. And it basically confirms that Dark Matter and Kirby are two sides of the same coin. The point is that even if we want to keep this specifically to just Kirby's Dreamland 2, 3, and 64, you're going to quickly see why this design doesn't work. The dark matter entity has taken a number of different forms over the years, but the version that you'll be controlling for this moveset will be the form commonly known as Dark Matter Blade, the first shape we ever see it take in Kirby's Dream Land 2. Yeah, that's basically what I just said. It many different powers, fighting in a similar way to the Dark Matter clone created by Star Dream and Kirby Planet Robobot. Okay. Biggest flaw right here. The Dark Matter clone from Kirby's Kirby Planet Robobot is an awful reference to go off of. Now, why is that? Because it's clearly it's like it's a 3D version of Dark Matter Swordsman. And it uses all its abilities from Kirby's Dreamland 2. And some from Dreamland 3, I think. The point is that you are using a reference that does not have anything to do with the entirety of Dark Matter and what it can do. You are specifically choosing to reference something that is very focused and can only use a set number of what Dark Matter can do. It can, like, that's why it has, like, the Rainbow Sword, because it remembers that it was killed by the Rainbow Sword, and it uses attacks from that it used in Dreamland 2 mainly because that's what it is. It's a copy of Dark Matter from Dreamland 2. It's not a copy of Dark Matter, period. You get what I'm saying? This is, this is very limited in what Dark Matter is. It was a nice reference, and it was a cool fight in Robobot, and I wish that he'd come back in a future game and he could get a better model so I can make a moveset for him. Yeah, I never heard anybody call him Dark Matter Blade either. All I hear is, I, I hear people call him Dark Matter Swordsman. Or Dark Matter Sword. Or... I don't know. I've never heard anybody call him that either. But yes, the fact that we are using a limited, a clone that is limited in scope to what the, to what Dark Matter is as a whole, as a bit, as a main reference for this design is flawed. Because as you're going to see, as we get into the basic attacks, they're all attacks from Dreamland 2. And some cohesion would be fine, you know. Fight with a sword. He has a sword. Fight with a sword. Whatever. I also would like you to keep in mind of how the moveset is structured. And that's the thing here. We're critiquing the moveset's design. So, when we get into the basic attacks, I want you to remember them. 
because when you think, when you break them down bit by bit, you have you come to understand that the design is flawed, and that constantly referencing this single focused clone is a bad idea. I mean, if you use the Taxon 2, using the animations from Robots or F makes sense. That's, yeah, that's fine. But I don't think that that's something you should be doing when Dark Matter is not just Dark Matter Swordsman. Dark Matter is an amorphous hive mind of evil that could be anything it wants to and has a wide, vari wide variety of abilities at its disposal. And there's a bunch of, you could do a bunch of really cool amorphous like body morphing and stuff like that and it's not taken advantage of whatsoever in this moveset. Spoilers. This stream will be available in the playlist, but when it's done, it's going unlisted. It's what I do with all of my streams. So if you want to see it later, and somebody doesn't flag it. If somebody flags it, I'll fight for it because this is fair use. This is caught. This is constructive criticism. This is fair use. If you want to see it later, you go to my channel. You go to the playlist that's non-fighting game related slash stream stuff, and it'll be right there at the very end. Okay. Continue. One can argue that the clone isn't quite accurate to the original, but for this moveset, this will just help things remain more coherent. Though I will alter a few things depending on the context. For example, it won't have the rainbow sword. Some speculate that the clone has this because of what the data of its memories remembers destroying it. So those got mixed into Stardream's cloning product. I want you to remember this image here. Because this image encapsulates one of the main issues I have with this moveset. I've already said what it is, so I'm not going to repeat myself. But the fact that you see this image should tell you all you need to know about why this moveset is a disappointment. For the record, I will definitely say that compared to the movesets we're going to see, this moveset is not bad. It's just painfully average. And that's kind of upsetting when this could be so much more. That's not fan art. That is official art that I believe you unlock in Kirby Star Allies. That is like an official art you can unlock in a Kirby game. I know that much. That's only like a third of the image, by the way. The, the image is like this huge, huge collage of all these villains and then at the middle is DDD on a, on a warp star because it's like oh you know DDD's the, the the first villain and then you see how from moving on from DDD we go on to all these like cosmic horror creatures and it's really good Cap Marvel vs. Capcom Shuma Garath somehow works incredibly as a base for Dark Matter. I didn't think of that, but honestly, that's not a bad... I, that's not a bad place to start or a place to, you know, compare. Because what is Shuma Garath in Smash... In Smash? <laughs> what is Shuma Garath in Marvel vs. Capcom? He's this really weird amorphous creature that can like transform his limbs he can use all these sorts of attacks he can transform his eye into like a fucking maw and all sorts of stuff he shoots beams honestly that's not a bad comparison but i think it could be taken a little bit further than just shuma It'll just have its normal sword, which even then is kind of random. Why does it even have a sword? Just to match the night attire that it took on for some reason? There's a lot of mystery behind Dark Matter, but that's not important. For now, let's just get things started with its jab. Dark Matter could use Dark 
Fury, a variation of the Rainbow Fury attack used by the clone. This is a two-hit semi-spammable jab, swinging its sword forward in a figure-eight motion, slightly moving forward with each swing. The dash attack- Okay, so, first attack, 45 minutes in, two-hit semi-spammable jab. Now, that's, it's, whatever is a design, it's fairly weak. Most jabs in Smash, Four, Smash Ultimate that were just like, two hit jabs like that, they got enders. Or they got like, endless combo enders. Because, the two hit jabs tend to be, crap. They don't really work. If you want an example, Samus and Dark Samus. A character with a two hit jab that doesn't even connect into itself. Okay. So we have a so we have a two hit semi spammable jab as a as your neutral combo. That could be the dark dive. A move seen in Dreamland 2, as well as in Robobot in the form of the Rainbow Dive. It's a thrusting sword stab attack, lunging forward out of its dash to impale anyone in its way. The sight... Okay. Rushing dash with the sword works. Perfectly, perfectly fine. Standard. Used to approach. Catch mistakes in the neutral. Bear. Tilt can have it swing its sword vertically from high to low, a little attack that it uses in Dreamland 2 to deter players from trying to attack it from the front. As such, this is a simple little get off me move. It's quick, disjointed, and fairly reliable. Alright, now we move to the side tilt. And as I said, you can now, s this is where, this is the point for me where I got worried. Oh no, is this design literally just Dreamland 2 Dark Matter? Okay, so we have a two hit semi spammable jab. We have a side tilt that is fast but has next to no range. And a dash attack that's, that's standard. Okay, I would also like to point out that there is no clear, concise idea stated on what they want this design to be in terms of archetype. Like, it's not like, oh, Dark Matter is a zoner, or oh, Dark Matter is Rushdown, all rounder, or whatever. There's no like statement of like what this design is supposed to be. And you're basically supposed to piece it together. I still don't know what this was supposed to be, and I've seen this video at least four different times now. And when we get more into his kit the weirder it's going to get. The up tilt can have Dark Matter swing its sword overhead from front to back, but as it does so, small Dark Matter clouds split off from the sword and fly upward at varying angles. These clouds deal small flinching damage, count as projectiles, and dissipate after a bit, so they're mainly good at vertical spacing and pressure. The sword itself is where the real damage is, launching both into the air. Overall, another scary disjointed move. Okay, you know what? Sword Slash summons small dark matters to deal damage. This moveset needs way more of this. Because you know what? That's actually really cool. That's a really cool design idea. But while it's cool, it doesn't work as an attack. Because here's the, here's the problem. The way hitboxes and knockback tend to work in Smash is that the moment if you hit somebody with an attack, you launch them into somebody else and they do a move, all that momentum and all and everything, all the speed and momentum that they built up by being launched is instantly cut in half. It's, it's done. And it's instantly replaced with the knockback of the move that the person that they launched them into uses against them. So if I, like, forward smash somebody as Ganondorf into somebody, like, doing a rapid snake jab, 
the knockback of the of the forward smash will instantly end the moment they make contact with Snake's Fist. That's how knockback in Smash works. So, the idea of, of, a, law, of a super wide-hitting overhead slash is fine, but the problem is that more than likely you're going to hit the person into the disjointed dark matter clouds, and since they do little to no damage, you are essentially canceling the knockback of the move and you're vortexing them. This is probably... If this was in the game, you could probably, like, lock people until very, very high percents. So the concept of the idea is really good, but I think that in order to make it work, they need to all be part of the same hitbox. Like, the clouds are the sour spot, but the sword is the sweet spot. Yeah, you know what? If the clouds didn't flinch at all, then the design would be also really good. But since the clouds make you do small flinching damage, they negate the damage, they negate the knockback of the sword. So in turn, the attack doesn't work. Now, whenever Dark Matter crouches, it's shown hiding the lower part of its body in the shadows of the ground, so that whenever it uses its down tilt, it can surprise its enemies by stabbing its sword out in front of itself to knock them away. <laughs> the idea of Dark Matter hiding in the ground, melting into the ground, is fitting. It makes sense for the design of what dark matter is. While I think that the over, like, cloud of, the cloudification, if you will, because he make because a lot of his references are that dark matter is like a cloud, while in actuality, it's mainly only Dreamland 64 where these enemies are more like clouds. In, like, Dreamland 3, between Gooey and the introduction, they're more liquidy. They're more like a, like a, like a liquid. They don't move like gas. They move like, like a liquidous blob. Liquidous is not a word. So yeah, you you want to make it like he sinks to the ground like like he's made out of vapor. There's not that's that's not there's nothing wrong with that. But the fact that you have this this position and you don't go out of your way to make something that could take advantage of the fact that his body is sunken into the ground like like a tendril with like a jaw, like like a mouth on it or something, anything, then you just you make the sword pop out. And again, it's a really low range attack. Because I imagine if we're going by Kirby characters, I imagine the Dark Matter would be between Man Knight and Deity in terms of size. So which means he would not be very big. So this move is extremely short range. We're talking like Game & Watch down tilt levels of short range. Like, it's very, very short. Now, before I continue, does he have, does it have any use for, for his moveset other than just shove them away? For dark matter. No. So, we have a, no, we have a grounded normals kit that consists of a two-hit semi-spammable jab, a short range, a very, very short range forward, forward tilt and down tilt, and an up tilt that while it hits wide, its hitboxes do not work with each other and would essentially be an infinite juggle tool. You see the problem when you bring these moves together and you think about 
think about this character moving in a 3D, in a 2.5D environment, and then, like, this character actually having to fight. You have to understand that that's flawed. It's effective at far range, but, but it, is it really? And I'll get into that because this character does have, have projectiles. It even has projectile smash attacks. Yeah, you have multiple normals fulfilling a similar purpose. And the purpose really doesn't work. Like he has no, he has nothing to shove people out if they get in close. Yeah, sure, the forward tilt is fast, but if its range is bad, he can just get outspaced. Like a character like Marth destroys this design of dark matter. Marth could easily outspace everything he does and destroy him. Any character with a sword... It's funny. You'd think with a sword, he'd have range. <laughs> but, unironic, but ironically enough, the way that this character is designed, his biggest enemy is himself. Swords. Any character who can advance forwards with each attack could beat, beat Dark Matter too, like Terry or Kazuya. Oh god, god. <laughs> Speaking as a Kazuya main, as a Kazuya main myself, EW, EWGF threw that forward tilt to death. <laughs> so Smash for a Man Knight where he has a sewing needle rather than a sword. No, because at least with Mana Knight, his small sword was offset by the fact that his attacks and like his movement and attack speed was insanely fast. Like while he was definitely not the fastest character in the game, the fact that he could literally ladder you like 12 times with a single attack in one jump was absolute insanity. Oh, this is good to have weaknesses in your design. Who wants an airball man knight? You shouldn't have such damning weaknesses that you have almost unwillable matchups. That's true. I think it's important that you think about how this character, when you're designing a Smash Brothers character or any fighting game character, you need to imagine them moving around in a three in on a stage and how they would traverse it, how their attacks where the attacks would launch, what attacks work with what, like what can con what can I convert this into? Is this a poke? Is this a combo starter? Can I cancel this into shield? Can I cancel this into roll? I think that these aspects like that are very important when designing a character, even if it's not ever going to be something you see in Smash, because then it becomes far more believable. And Brawl fan, I know for a fact, he does not have competitive Smash Brothers experience or, or competitive fighting game experience at all. And that, and I think that's one of his biggest detriments as a designer. Because if you play fighting games, you learn fighting games faster, and you understand the design of fighting games better. It doesn't matter what type of fighting game it is. I mainly played Marvel vs. Capcom, Marvel vs. Capcom 2 and 3, I played Blaze Blue, I played Guilty Gear, I played several games competitively, none of them are Smash, even though I play a little bit of competitive Smash. But like a majority of my fighting game experience competitive wise is not Smash. But even then, I'm able to take the knowledge that I understand of that game and translate it to this game. Because when you break it down enough, 
you find similarities between the two. But anyways, yes, we have a short range. We have a semi standable jab that pushes dark matter forward. We have a very short range forward tilt and down tilts that really don't do anything for him and basically are a great way to let people that can space him absolutely tear him apart. And he has an up, he has an up tilt with a really good design, but the hitboxes conflict with one another and it basically doesn't work as an attack. That's where we are in terms of a, of a grounded normals kit. So let's move into the smash attacks. And this is where things get really weird. Side smash, it could use the Dark Sword Beam, a move from Dreamland 2 where it fires beams from its sword straight forward. For smash, using this move with no charge has it fire a single beam projectile forward. If you do charge the smash, it becomes the Rapid Sword Beam, firing a bunch of beam shots one after another. The amount fired depends on how long you charge the attack, and it's only ever the last beam fired that will actually launch opponents. All others shot prior only cause hit stun. Dark Matter. Okay, so we have a rapid hitting projectile forward smash. On top of the fact that rapid hit attacks in Smash are infamous for having some really, really dumb hitboxes and ways to get out of these attacks, we have a Smash attack that is essentially a long-range pressure tool that you can- that only works if the final beam hits. Which means this is an attack that Dark Matter is stuck in a long time. Like, he can't move. He's he's shooting beams out of his sword for an extended period of time and he has nothing to do. So, it, so basically, if an opponent dodges the first beam or does anything, or the beam, or the first beam knocks the opponent out of the out of the move's range, and they can't, it doesn't do anything because, as he said, only the final beam launches backwards. So, if that happens and they push the opponent outside of the beam's range before the final beam hits, Dark Matter has no defense. He could get immediately jumped by anybody. It doesn't matter how slow you are. If you're shooting a total of five beams, you're more than likely going to be stuck in, you're going to be stuck in an animation where you can't move, and even Gandorf is going to jump you. <laughs> well, I do like the concept that if it, that it, I think that if it was reflected, that it wouldn't immediately go back to Dark Matter. I think that that's an interesting idea. It's not mentioned, but I think the fact that, you know, you reflect the beam, you re if you reflect the first beam, and they all just, like, collide with one another, chances are high that they're going to just cancel each other out. So, against reflectors, it's technically safe, but against literally anybody that can that can uh, dodge out of it, because I assume that this move is going to have really poor hitboxes and opportunities to get out of it. You essentially have what can I can only describe as the worst forward smash in the entire game. Chances are high that somebody is going to get behind him and forward smash him in the time it takes for him to stop and turn around. Once fully charged, you keep that charge until it's released. It's a smash attack. He has to release it. You can't store a smash attack. Although that would be an interesting concept for a character. Well, yes, Me Gunner is better because Me Gunner is not one, two, three, four, five. Me Gunner is rapid, and the final blast affects the entirety of the move at the same time. So it doesn't matter if they're on the tip or right next to you. If you hit them with this, they're going to be gone to the blast zone. And 
that's not in this design for dark matter. So okay, we have a move, we have a forward, we have a projectile forward smash that doesn't work. Oh, sorry. Characters with high jumps could just jump the projectiles and attack. Yeah, like Falco. The neutral B idea. We'll get to that. But as you can still see, we're still stuck in we're still stuck in Dreamland too. Now, we're about to get to the part that is one of the main reasons I chose this video. To be first. And I warn you ahead of time, I don't like using this word because it's complete it's overused and I and it's often misused, but it's cringe. It's completely and totally cringe. And I warn you ahead of time that to brace yourself because it is going to be painful to listen to. Up smash could have it use the dark beam wave. The first attack here to have dark matter reveal its true eye and use it to fire powerful dark shots. Also originally, God, that, that background effect hurts my eyes. Has dark matter roll its eye in a full circle, firing constant shots into the directions it looks into. For the up smash, it won't roll its eye in a full circle, but instead just does the same eye rolling motion that most of you guys do whenever I share an opinion. See, you just did it now. It rolled. Oh my God! As I said, I'm keeping this professional. I'm not saying anything. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything back about it. This is a this is prof this is a professional response. Now I don't know what the context of that statement is, but it's not funny. It doesn't add anything to the video, and if anything. It makes me think that you know that people don't like the way that you construct your movesets sometimes and you're basically telling them to go shove it. That's my take on that statement. I don't know why it was shoved in here. Like, I, I seriously have no idea what led to that being inserted. But it's not now I can't give him the benefit of the doubt that he's that he has an experience with fine game design because he does. As I said, he's not he's not well versed in fine games and how they work, competitive smash, anything. I don't know if this is a person that's watched competitive fighting games at all. But what this says to me is that you know that people don't like your content and you're basically telling us to shove it. And I know that Brawl fan has gone on record to state that he doesn't watch other Smash moveset creators. And I can empathize with him on that because I don't either. I don't watch other moveset creators. I only watched Pizza and he's not around anymore. And I'm not going to lie, ever since Pizza left, doing what I do has become a lot less fun. But, I think that that, I think that that is doing him far more harm at this point than it is give, do, doing him any good. I think that at this point, with the fact that this is his latest video... I don't know if he released one recently. I have not watched it. I'm going to assume he hasn't because somebody in Pizza's Discord has not posted it. Yeah, Pizza's Pizza hasn't been making content for like two two years now. I mean, he's not dead. He's he's a family man. He became the guile main in real life. It is okay, it's his most recent one. Okay. So then my point still then my point stands. 
I think that that it's important at, at this point, I think it's important that you take the time, you make a playlist of videos, like competitive smash matches, move sets, bunch of smash talk from a bunch of different people. I think you should put them together. And I think you should make a playlist and just spend an afternoon watching it. I think it'll do you wonders because it's very clear that the design yeah exactly he's a, he's a dad now i'm happy for him i legitimately am but I, i'm going to tell you i fucking miss him he's not even online to talk hardly anymore either I's just a good man. I think he'll be a good dad. But yes, just so I don't get, I'm going to say, I'm going to finish the statement so I don't get sidetracked again. I think it's important for him to watch other content about Smash, about design, do more research. And honestly, I think that this moveset a week that he's been trying to keep up for as long as he can needs to stop. Because you cannot pump out high quality content in a week trust me i've tried on many many occasions if there's ever an instance where videos i have come out within a week or so of each other it's because they were both being worked on at the exact same time and i was lucky enough to finish it around that roughly around that time i also do everything by myself and I'm, I, I know that he does a fairly good amount of stuff by himself as well. Even though I know he does sometimes have people that helps him. I think that it's important to take a step back. Realize that there could be improvement. And work towards that improvement. Because I'm not going to lie. I feel that if he takes the time to research more and learn more about the characters he's going to cover and possibilities and thinking about unique types of attacks instead of just mainly focusing on references, I think that he would be a really good moveset creator. Especially because he goes out and he makes his own custom poses for, for stuff that he can't reference normally. There needs to be more of that. And it needs, it needs to be taken a little bit farther than it actually is. While I get that that's what the algorithm pushes, the thing that pushes him in the algorithm is that people swamp him with requests every video before the video is even up. That, the algorithm also likes that. I'm not going to say that's the only reason, because it's not. But that's definitely a, contrib a contributing factor. I believe he used to take like three weeks off every ten videos. Or at least that's what he was planning to do. There, were ti there was time off. But I think that there needs to be more. Or, or, get more people involved with the creative process to make the content better in the time allotted. He's cultivated the community. Yeah, I get that. But the problem is that, one, that's a bad way to take it and two because of the fact that he doesn't tell his fans to not take it anywhere else that shit bleeds into every every single comment section for moveset design for smash brothers like that fountain pen exploded it is all over every page in that book I 
I think that there needs to, I think he needs to tell his fans that, no, you shouldn't take this to other channels and do the exact same thing. Requests here, be respectful, be respectful elsewhere. Because if I was in his shoes, that would be the first thing I do. Anytime I said, ask for, I, I ask for requests. I'd be, ask them here, if people, if other people are making movesets, do not swap them with requests, because we, you don't know if they take them or not. And, surprise, surprise, I don't take them. And I've been swamped many, many times with requests. And I do not like it. Alright, so... That point aside, the up smash, it's basically less problematic than the forward smash because it's a wave. But again, we're talking about very thin hitboxes traveling in an arc, which usually means that, again, it's going to be very easy to dodge. And doesn't provide much pressure, especially against opponents with good jumps and with a reflector. Because... Unlike the forward smash, where the beams would just cancel each other out if they were reflected into one another. A character like any of the spaces could instantly jump in on him, reflect, reflect the back to him, catch him in hit stun, and combo him to death. So okay. We have two we have two we have two range smash attacks that don't work. What is the down smash? Well, its eye from front to back, firing projectiles from its pupil all around itself. The shots fired will launch opponents into the direction that they were flying into, and they will disappear after flying a set distance or when they make contact with something. Then for Dark Matter's down smash, it can be shown stabbing its sword into a black fog that appears under its body. And as soon as it does so, two large blades shoot out from the fog on both sides of Dark Matter. You were so close. You were so close to making something that could have been really, really cool. Because I've made ideas for Dark Matter... And his and the ideas I've come up for Dark Matter's Down Smash are very, very similar to this. But it would be like like waves of tendrils or like again like like giant maws extending out of the darkness to bite on either side. Something monstrous, grotesque, something that shows that Dark Matter is this disgusting cosmic entity that is like there's no good in it. It's evil incarnate. But no, it's still a sword. No, you had every opportunity to make it something that was fitting of dark matter as a whole. And you made it the sword. What if... If you want to take it in a unique direction, what if for the down smash, the it, it, it creates a pair of, of like black maws that extend up and bite, but when they bite together, they turn into the sword. That would make that would make this much much better. But again, it's so close. It's so tantalizingly close. To something that truly befits what dark matter can do. But again, we are stuck. We are stuck in Dreamland 2. And we don't have to be. Yeah, Marx's vines would also work. Yeah, it's also weird. He emphasizes how pointless the night is to the design of dark, like the, the night design for dark matter is, but everything around this design is based on the night and the sword, and there's no other aspect for dark matter. Yet. 
he has some ideas for the neutral air for for the aerials we'll get to those bolt stabbing straight up to launch foes into the air foes can also get hit by the normal sword that dark matter stabs down and if they are they'll be shoved forward just far enough to place them directly on top of the sword that shoots up in front of dark matter you overall never want to be right in front of dark matter looking directly at its eye is what puts you in the most amount of danger and okay then why is his design literally encouraging you to get in close and punish his really poor normals? If anything, this moveset rewards you for looking him in the eye more than anything else. Like, I'm confused. I don't know. We're only at the down smash. We are 6 minutes and 35 seconds into this video. And this is still the first video. And that'll become even more apparent as I get further into this hole. Moving on to the aerials, the neutral air can have dark matter use its orbitars, orange palpitations that we see sticking out of the back of its real form. The move has it spawn a bunch of orbitars that quickly orbit around its body like a wheel, then after spinning for a short bit, are all shot off at the same time in all directions. Those hit by the orbitars as they spin are dealt multi-hitting damage, then are launched when the orbitars are launched. This can be another great spacing tool for dark matter, but the orbitars do count as projectiles once they're shot off. The forward air- Okay. So again, Again, we are stuck in Dreamland 2. There is an opportunity here to have Dark Matter transform into its true form. Which is, you know, the black ball with the eye and the orbitars that surround it. That is a perfect opportunity to have that happen here. And if that did happen, I think that that would make the design of that move make more sense. Because the way that Dark Matter's cape hangs over his backside, it obstructs view of the move. And in turn, it makes the way the move look more muddy. And it also brings up the question, do the Orotars count as projectiles? Because, again, we have a move that is very short range, that is nobly short range, and if it has, if it reflects back at the opponent that launched it, it's more than likely going to do, it's more than, it's, it's going to punish him in return. Like, what is the design aspect here? I get it, it's a rapid hitting neutral air. Could probably be used for landing. But why did you keep him as swordsman and not have him transform? Apparently, I'm going to assume they become projectiles when they launch in all directions. I'm going to assume that that's when they become projectiles. Not when they're spinning. I don't know. I feel like that could be taken in a better way. I think that this... That was... That... I think that having him transform into his real form in throughout the moveset would have made it feel a lot more like Dark Matter. And you, we're going to get to a point in the, in the aerials where we do see him transform. And in my opinion, it's too little too late. Can have 
have dark matter open up a large mouth with razor sharp teeth on its body and bites forward three times. The first two bites cause hit stun, the third bite deals the knockback, and every chomp deals a lot of damage. This okay. Another very short range physical attack that does a lot of damage but doesn't seem to provide any disjoint and again it's dark matter is not a large character which means that he would be he could easily be spaced and that move does not work as a neutral tool whatsoever this masticating aerial is a direct reference to the creepy move that we normally only see from dark matter when it's possessing king ddd well, if that's the case, then why did you? Why can't you just come up with something original that could work at any point? Why do you need to reference DDD? He's already a part of the roster. I would understand if it was a move he could use when possessing somebody that isn't already a playable character. And honestly, I think that this would have worked better as the dash attack where dark matter throws his body forward and bites in order to be like a really powerful like cl area closing attack that also does a lot of damage and can be used as a kill option because how does how does dark matter use it when possessing DAD? where the zigzags on his sash turn he dashes mouth. he chases gluttony before gluttony the back air can have it fire more orbital projectiles from its backside, shooting off multiple at once that fly into slightly different angles. It's kind of weak comparatively to most back airs, but each orbital deals individual damage, so the more you get hit by, the more damage you take. Again, a ranged, a ranged back, back air. We've had characters with ranged aerials. It's not anything new. But, this is essentially Dark Matter's spacing tool in the neutral. This is your aerial poke option, if it, as it were. Again, we are dealing with, move, with a move that has five separate hitboxes, very small. There are gaps between them, and they travel outwards, and they spread apart very quickly, meaning that they can easily be either blocked or punished and again i feel like a character with a reflector eats this guy alive and i'm also not really sure what kind of play style he's aiming for because you think from this that he's a zoner but he doesn't really have good zoning tools and we'll get to that when we get to his specials we're almost there he's not rushed down he doesn't have the tools to be rushed down. He's not a grappler. He's not a footsie character. His mid-range is awful. I guess he would have to be categorized as an all-rounder, but... All-rounders tend to have a balance of offense and defense, and honestly, this guy's defense is awful. He has the defense of a zoner as an all-rounder. Correction, he has the defense of a rushdown character as an all-rounder. That's even worse. He's heavy, so he can take a hit. He can probably take a hit better than the characters that are going to be wailing on him. But he just doesn't seem like he has the tools to fight like half the cast. There's a lot of short-range projectiles and random multi-hits. Agreed. It's also not really specified how far these go. I'm assuming they go a decent distance. I'm assuming it's like three times longer than we, what we see here. But the vagueness of the terms instead of providing concrete numbers is a bit annoying. Slow attack could start frame 18 or frame 88 and I wouldn't know. I agree. That's why when I design moves, I try to show starting frames, you know, damage numbers. 
By the way, if you're ever confused about damage numbers in my videos, damage numbers are always the most damage the move can deal. So if I ever talk about a move that can deal multi-hit damage, the number that you see is always the move's maximum amount of damage. Just a pointer. All right. So, we have, just going over his entire kit so far, double hitting neutral jab that is generally not very good because it doesn't have an ender and doesn't really have any purpose aside from pushing dark matter forward and having for some reason better range than almost all of his grounded normals. His forward tilt and down tilt are extremely short range. It can be easily beaten by characters with with any kind of range, any kind of disjoint. His up tilt is a really cool attack that hits wide, but the hitboxes hit boxes conflict with one another and it doesn't work as an attack. His forward smash is a multi-hitting projectile beam that only launches after the final beam. And it has a lot of flaws in that design because opponent, even though it's uh, immune to reflectors, excuse me, even though it's immune to reflectors, it can easily be jumped over and punished. The up smash has the same issues as the forward smash, except it can be reflected with little to no problem. And the down smash it has the start of a cool idea, but doesn't take it nearly as far as it could. Aerials, we have a spinning projectile aerial that explodes outwards, can be easily punished by characters with disjoints and characters with reflectors. A forward smash, sorry, a forward air that has very little range but a lot of damage, which doesn't really make any sense because, again, dark matter is not very large. You would have to be literally right next to your opponent in order for the attack to work. And chances are high that you don't have the tools to get in that close or, you know, you don't want to be that close whatsoever. So it's, it's counterproductive. You have... A back air launches projectiles, and we'll get to the other aerials, but um, I believe the up air is a simple overhead slash. It's not flashy or creative, but the down air, the down air is probably one of the most egregious problems with this moveset, and I'll explain why when we get there. As such, the closer a foe is to Dark Matter when it uses this move, the more damage it'll deal. The up air can show Dark Matter doing a wide looping backflip while swinging its sword. No, it is a design. It is a design issue. It's it's a it's a cohesion issue. It's how these aspects. It's how all these attacks m work together, and most of them don't. That's the problem. Overhead from front to back. It's a little slow, but it covers a lot of area and has great disjoint. And for the down air, this can be the first, well, really the only attack that pulls from the leader of Dark Matter, Zero. Well, more precisely, Zero Two, showing Dark Matter grow a large thorn-covered branch that stabs straight down from the bottom of its body. It's another move with a lot of disjoint, and getting hit by the spikes while they grow will spike you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm talking, and I know that... This chat's going. There's a lot of people here. If I miss, if I accidentally take your statement wrong, I apologize ahead of time. But it's hard to keep up with what I'm saying and actively going by everything that the move that's being said in the chat. I own, I try to catch. I'm trying to catch it as fast as I can, but sometimes things fall through and I don't read everything. Okay. So, as I said, simple overhead aerial could be something unique. Isn't, isn't really taken that far. But here's the problem. Here is the biggest, most egregious problem with this moveset. This is the only attack that references another form of dark matter. Now... I read the comments for this video and I saw somebody point out that he should have taken ideas from care from stuff like Void Nebula, sorry, Dark Nebula, 
Boy Termina, Nightmare, and stuff like that, because they are heavily related to Dark Matter. Now, he says that he doesn't want to do it because there's no concrete evidence showing that they are related. Well, do I have some news for you? Dark Matter in Kirby in Kirby's Dreamland 2 and 3 are under the control of a creature named Zero. And whether Zero is like an ass Zero is a part of Void Termina, because again, it's very clear that this this creature has is tied to the origins of, of Dark Matter as a whole, whether it's a part of Void Termina or it's a creation of Void Termina, and that's what the Dark Matter is, it's un, it's not known. But essentially, Kirk, the Dark Matter in Kirby's Dreamland 2 and 3 is controlled by a creature called Zero. In Kirby's in Kirby 64, you fight a creature known as Zero 2 is the final boss if you collect all the shards. There is no concrete evidence showing that Zero and Zero 2 are the exact same creature. It is a theory. The dark matters of Kirby's Dreamland 2 and 3 and Kirby 64 could possibly be completely separate entities. That is, that is a possibility. So, he doesn't want to reference other bosses because they might not be attached to Dark Matter. Yet, he used a reference for a boss that ha might not actually have any connection to the Dark Matter that he's basing this moveset on. Essentially, it's a loophole. Dark matter, the dark matters of the of Kirby's Dreamland two and three are way more liquidy than they are cloudy, like you know, like the ones in sixty four are. There, there are theories that these are completely separate creatures, and that zero and zero two are completely separate entities, which means that there's more than likely a zero three and zero four, zero five. There's probably more zeros out there. There's also no confirmation as to whether or not all the Dark Matters share the same information. Like, even though they might be separate entities, does the experiences of the Dark Matter in 2 and 3 carry over to the ones in, in Kirby 64? There's never been any confirmation of this. But the main reason why we never get any kind of dark matter representation or, you know, like theories as to what, like transformations into bosses that are like dark matter and not, but not like, you know, cemented to be dark matter is because of the fact that he doesn't, that there's no concrete evidence, even though there has never been concrete evidence for any of this. This is all stuff that we'd have to, that we've had to piece together as fans of the, of the franchise. So, him using a move from Zero Two on Kirby's Dreamland Two Dark Matter Swordsman makes as much sense as Dark Matter Two Swordsman using a move from Void Termina or Void Soul or Void whatever you want to call it. Because chances are high that the connections between these two entities is the exact same. You're never going to get a concrete answer whether or not they're the exact same creature. There's evidence for it. There's evidence against it. No developer has ever come out to say what, what, what Dark Matter is connected to, which bosses are actually a part of Dark Matter. You're never going to get it. Which is why, if you're designing something like this, you need to take a risk, and you need to try something a little bit unique. Again, you can try unique creations that aren't a part of any dark matter. Like, as I mentioned, tendrils, spikes, maws, 
all sorts of other stuff like that. You could try that, or you could have a move that references Dark Nebula. Or you can have a move that references Miracle Matter. Or you could have moves that reference Zero, Zero Two, Void Termina, Nightmare, all sorts of all sorts of these bosses that while they're not concretely confirmed to be part of Dark Matter, they are heavily similar in themes and design, and as a result, you Yeah. You need to take a little bit of a risk there. That's one of the main reasons why this move pisses me off so much. Because it goes directly against his statement of, it's not dark matter. We don't know if it's dark matter or not. You don't know if this dark matter even knows that Zero Two exists. But you give him a move for it anyways. I think that's just something to think about. And it's, it's really upsetting that this is the only move that's taken from any of anything to do with any other dark matter form. It's not even the right zero. Dark matter will grab opponents by emitting a dark mist from its body, trapping them within it. And it pummels by using small dark matters that appear from within the mist to assault their prey. Again, there are instances in this moveset where the ideas are really cool, and I, I've said this before, and I'll say it again, if this moveset had more aspects like this, it would be so much better. Because you know what? That's cool. I expect that from Dark Matter. It's not a single entity working, to, working against you. You are fighting an amalgamation of minds connected to this cosmic entity that is watching over your every movement. Zero. That's basically what I'm saying. The forward throw can have Dark Matter's true eye suddenly and creepily bulge out of its body to knock the foe forward. The back throw can have it pass through the opponent's body, giving them the heebie-jeebies, then slashes at their back. The up throw shows Dark Matter retreating into the shadows below, then shoots up under the foe's feet to launch them into the air. And the down throw has Dark Matter instead pull the foe into the shadows, suffocating them to rack up damage, then shoots them into the air. Now you know what? All those throws are actually really, really good. All of them. I think the up throw could be a little bit more unique and interesting, but that's exactly what I expect of Dark Matter. What he listed was exactly what I expected Dark Matter to do. They're all good. All of these throws are good ideas. This is the best part of the moveset. I'm just really upset that no other aspect of the moveset goes this far. I get giving DMS moves, but from Dark Matter, but giving a board terminal moves feels like giving Kirby. Well, as I said, Kirby and Void Term Vo Kirby and Dark Matter are proven to be essentially the same two sides of the same coin from from Void Termina. Void Termina's true form looks like dark matter. For anybody that's curious is the one I'm talking about. This is what Void Termina really looks like. This is Void Termina's true form. Does that look a little familiar to you? It should. Looks a little bit like, uh, like this guy.
could make could be a call could be a costume idea i agree anyways now we're getting to the specials for dark matters neutral special it could use the dark orb shot this is a pretty simple special it creates a dark orb at the tip of its sword then chucks it forward it has a small amount of startup while it creates the orb, but during said startup, you can point the control stick into any direction to have the orb be thrown into that direction, including backward, letting you turn your shot to potentially fake out opponents. The orb will disappear after flying its max di Is it bad that the neutral special works better for the forward smash than the forward smash does? This works better as a forward smash than the forward smash you came up with. If you wanted to give him a ranged forward smash. Charge on sword, throw near, throw on the ground near himself, explosion, send flying. It wouldn't be the best, most creative idea you could give Dark Matter, but that alone works way better than a rapid fire attack that has the ability, that only works if you hit them with the last beam. or once it hits a player. If it hits the stage, though, it ricochets, bouncing into a new direction and extending its fly time. Getting hit by the orb deals a decent amount of damage and knockback, but if it's reflected, it splits off into three small orbs that all fly in different angles, technically increasing its spacing, but also severely weakening the move, since each small orb only deals small flinching damage. Those okay. Another reason it works better is a forward smash. You could have it branch off into those three shots when it hits the floor to create more range and provide more, more mid-range pressure. What he basically just did was design a move for the wrong category. I think if you wanted to give this to Dark Matter as a forward smash and you wanted to make this mostly about Dark Matter Swordsman, that works completely fine. It's way better than than shooting pew 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 beams. Since this only happens when the move is reflected, it's mainly dark matter who has to worry about it. But considering how weak the reflected orb is, not to mention its ricocheting nature in general, it could potentially be used to bait reflections. Next, for dark matter's side special, it could use its dark lightning attack. Another fairly simple special, Dark Matter fires a lightning bolt from its eyeball. This bolt knocks opponents away on contact, it can be slightly angled up or down, and it does not count as a projectile. Major downsides are that, while the bolt itself is pretty instant, there is a bit of start lag while it charges up. It may also have some good range, but it is pretty thin, so some good accuracy is required if you want to smite your opponents effectively. So what you're saying is that the side special has the same problem that every single one of his other projectiles have, and that it's thin and easy to dodge. As a, as a side special, that's perfectly fine. I think that this would have made it for a bare neutral special. But I think that as a move, I think that people, I think that that move is iconic and used enough in Dark Matter's lineage to make sense for a side for a special move well so yeah start leg isn't a term what you're looking for is startup Now for Dark Matter's up special another simple one it could use the dark Dash. This has it erupt the palpitations on its back, launching it into any chosen direction like a rocket. It's deceptively strong, dealing a hefty amount of damage and knockback to foes in Dark Matter's dash path, and it will go into free fall afterward. Okay, you know how I said his forward air would make more sense as a dash attack? I take it back. That makes more sense as a dash attack. Having Dark Matter shed its swordsman its swordsman facade to rush you down and deal massive damage to catch you off guard 
Because you have to think, dark matter as an entity is designed around, around trickery, control. It's not exactly something that's known for fighting you fairly. So an attack that is deceptively fast sheds its facade of a, of a disguise in the form of swordsman and just rushes you down to attack you would be excellent. You know what? Yeah, combine both. Have them bite at the end of the attack. And that's another thing that I think needs to be stated. There's not a lot of personality with this moveset. Like, dark matter as an entity is tricky. It's vile. It's not going to fight you fairly. It's going to do everything it can to get to control everything. Because that's what it wants. It wants complete and total control of everything around it. And will stop at nothing to get it. No matter who it has to possess, who it has to fight, doesn't matter. That's exactly what dark matter is. It's a power-hungry cosmic creature that wants nothing but control. I don't feel that from this moveset. I'm not sure what... I'm not entirely sure what the personality is supposed to be, but again, his main reference for this moveset was a false version of Dark Matter. A false, purposely limited version of Dark Matter. And lastly, for Dark Matter's down special, it's anything but simple. It could conjure a Dark Matter cloud. Dark Matter opens its real eye and fires forward a slow-moving Dark Matter cloud, much in the same way that we see the possessed DDD fire small black projectiles from the eye on his belly. Again, why do you need to reference moves of it possessing other people? You could have come up with something unique. This cloud flies forward a set distance, then dissipates if it travels for too long. If a cloud hits a player, however, they fall under Dark Matter's influence and become possessed. Possessed players receive a number of conditions. Now, before I continue, because this is really bad, the design of this is really bad, but... I think that everybody was expecting there to be some sort of possession-based thing when it comes to Dark Matter, because that's exactly what it's known for. It infiltrates its way into a settlement or, t or planet and possesses everything. It takes over creatures and uses them for its own gain. Like, that's Dark Matter's greatest strength. It's its ability to take over other creatures and use them however it wants. Now, the idea of possession in a fighting game is difficult. There are characters in fighting games that have done it, and have done it well, like Quan Chi in Mortal Kombat has a great, has a great way of possessing people. Um, Hisako in Killer Instinct has a command grab where she possesses people and does massive amounts of damage, and it's really well done. There are instances of possession in fighting games, and it's been done relatively well. And I think that it'd be possible to translate that, th those kind of aspects to dark matter. Would you like to take a guess at how he designed it? I Spoiler alert, it's not fun for anybody. They become more aggressive, gaining a higher damage output and more launch power, but they also become confused, causing their horizontal controls to be reversed and their attack and special buttons to be switched, making fighting way more difficult if you don't pay attention to your controls. You'll know when you're possessed when you see your character's body emitting black fog. Possession will automatically wear off after a certain amount of time or once the possessed player takes a certain amount of damage, whichever happens first. Wait, 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 wait. hang on, hang on, yeah. sorry, I, I spaced out for a second. Or once the possessed player takes a certain... 
will automatically wear off after a certain amount of time or once the possessed player takes a certain amount of damage. Okay, so it's not specified how long it lasts for. Point stands. Holy shit. <laughs> so, you have a mechanic through one special move that forces your opponent to have their all of their buttons swapped in exchange for more damage. There's no build-up to how long this takes to do. If you land a single attack, you instantly fuck your opponents. <laughs> like, they're fucked. They can't do anything. Hi, did you want to play on Spear Pillar with nothing but Palkia? Congratulations, you have a move for it. You have Spear Pillar Palkia as a move. Now, the idea for possession, as I said, makes complete and total sense for Dark Matter as a character. But I feel that it's something that you need to build up. It can't be something that you do instantly and immediately it happens. Like, you have to, you must have, like, some kind of bar or meter that fills up that slowly, like, wears away at your opponent's resolve. And once they become vulnerable, that's when you can possess them for something serious. And even if it's something you have to build up to, I would never have it be something as convoluted as that. Because that's not fun. That's certainly the equivalent of, well, I just got my controls at first. I guess I'm going to die. I can't do anything. Yes, I know you can still move around and attack and everything. But the fact that your muscle memory is completely swapped on its head and you have next to no opportunity to react to it. That's horrible design. There should have been something that made it so you get more, you get stuck under Dark Matter's influence more over time. There should have been something that builds up, and once it's built up fully, then they're under your, then they're under your control. And it could have been something, and it could have been something as simple as made specific attacks more powerful. It gave you an extra attack option that was that was super powerful and could be used to confirm kills. The point is that there had to, there has to be a payoff or something like that, but that's not it. You want your opponent to have a chance to fight back. And you're not going to get it through that. Yeah, this, this the move set so far has been lukewarm and boring. This is the one part of this move set that is absolutely awful. And I cannot say anything positive about it. I can give pointers as to how it could be done better, but it's really really bad. whichever happens first. It is very strong, but there is a limit. After a player shakes off possession, they gain a natural immunity to it for a little while, unable to be possessed again until that immunity wears off. Okay, I get that, but chances are high that that immunity resets on kill. And since this is something that will more than likely lead to your opponent kill, either killing themselves or you killing them, it doesn't matter. That doesn't help it. Unless the time is like two seconds, two to three seconds at maximum. No, that doesn't help. So while Dark Matter can possess as many people as it wants, it can't keep doing so to the same people over and over. Oh, that's another thing. Apparently, if you're playing 8-player Smash, possess everybody and ruin everybody's fun. 
you are never going to be invited to play Smash Brothers with your friends again. <laughs> they are never going to invite you back. You are going... <laughs> you are going to be put in the timeout corner. What can't gain immunity, though, are assist trophies. If Dark Matter possesses one of them, they fall under its control and can only be broken free once they sustain any damage. That doesn't matter, they're the assist trophies. Dark Matter, it's a very oppressive fighter. Is it? Is it really? If you let it gain control of the battlefield, it'll be incredibly hard to escape its darkness. Do whatever you can to stay out of its sight. Because if you're face to face with that eyeball, it's already too late. No, not really. The only thing that this character has that's decently good is a move that literally breaks the game. It's got an average projectile. It's got crappy ground normals average aerials that can be easily exploited by specific types of characters you've got smash attacks that two of them don't work and one is uncreative you've got really cool throws you've got a fairly standard couple of projectiles and a dash for your specials and then you just have a move that just breaks the game Like, there's no way to sugarcoat it. it. It breaks the game. Also, yes. Thank you for pointing that out, Stinky. What if you have a reflector? Can Dark Matter get possessed by its own shit? Or is Dark Matter immune? to its own possession. If Dark Matter is immune to its own position, that possession, that makes it even worse. This is a grab. <laughs> that's, that's actually funny. What if eight players choose Dark Matter? Then they're all going to possess each other and literally just spaz around. They're going to do nothing for like... I don't know how long it goes for. And that, that that's the thing that, that's eating away at me the most about that move. It's never specified... Sorry for hitting my desk. It's never specified how long the move lasts. Like, is it... Is it like two or three seconds? Is it like seven or eight seconds like you have to understand seconds in smash are extremely important like anything that lasts for more than four to five seconds is an extremely long time in the amount of time that happens in a match you can kill people in the in that time, amount of time you can be like put in kill range from zero to kill range in five seconds against specific characters like, that time is huge. And that's something that I don't think a lot of Smash creators really think about, is how important those seconds are. Because they're extremely important. What if Kirby eats dark matter, then does Kirby possess people? I'm assuming he just gets the projectile. The standard special projectile. So yes, we have a character with bad grounded normals, interesting throws, relatively weak aerial options. His smash attacks, two of them don't work. One does, but it could be better. And a bunch of fairly standard specials that don't really, can't really be used to confirm kills. I'm, I'm curious as to where the kill confirms are. I'm assuming the smash attacks, but it'd be so hard to land. It'd be almost impossible to confirm kills. Get vague times and damage so casual players can understand easier. 
no. It doesn't matter whether they're not they're casual. If the if if you're designing something, you need to show all of your work. Every aspect, you need to show it or talk about it. That's why, if you've looked at the design documents that Sakurai has made for Smash, they are very thorough. They talk about a bunch of stuff in serious detail. You are essentially designing a design document for the character. You need to get across everything that's important. Delston's boring, but that's just me. The point is... Show your work. Show everything. Because you are be you are trying to convince everyone around you that this is the best idea you that the character could possibly have. You are designing what should be what should be considered the best thing you can think of for the character. And you want everybody to know exactly how this character should do it. Everything. I'm not saying you have to go as far as total frames, at like ending frames, cancel windows. You can talk about the move canceling into other things, but you don't need to be like, this move can cancel 10 frames after its initial animation or after the, after the hitbox ends. It's like... No, I think that the things that are most important is what the move does, its damage, when it starts, what it converts into, and how much range it covers. Stuff like that. I think that those, I think that that is what should be considered the bare minimum for design. The other stuff you can work out if you want, but I don't think it's overly necessary. You can talk about cancels. Like, if you have a target combo, by the way, a target combo is essentially a pair, an attack that can be input multiple times, like Snake's forward tilt, for example. That's a target combo. You can cancel the first hit and all sorts of stuff like that into a variety of stuff. Stuff like that, I think, is important. You have to, you are selling your idea to the viewer. You are, that's essentially what you're doing. You are selling your idea to the viewer. Anyways, I'm gonna let him talk about the final smash. For Dark Matter's final smash, you can probably guess what it is. A cinematic final smash where Dark Matter takes on its real form and releases a burst of dark fog all around itself. And all players caught in the fog will get pulled in. Players are then sent to the Hyper Zone, where they're confronted by the source of dark matter, Zero, who spawns countless numbers of. I'm at least glad he chose Basic Zero and not Zero Two. Tons of damage. The final smash ends with Zero shooting a small speck of light from its eye that sneaks its way into the Dark Matter cluster and exploding soon after. Ending the cinematic and launching away all caught foes afterward, with the main Dark Matter reappearing from the fog in the spot where it initiated the cinematic. Quick side note, the exploding light bit came from Zero Two, not Zero. And while I am aware of the possibility that they are two separate beings, I am mixing up their powers a bit for the sake of the moveset. Well, if that's the case, why didn't you mix up the powers of Dark Matter between all three games? You'll mix up the powers of Zero, but you won't mix the powers that they both control? All the powers used by the bosses in Kirby's Dream Land 2, 3, and 64, even if we don't want to go into future games. 
Hell, Miracle Matter shows that Dark Matter has control over basically every element. As does Gooey. And that's never explored. So if you're willing to to combine to combine these two, why not go the full? Why not go all the way and combine all their abilities? Make the perfect dark matter. Again, I don't understand. Like it's so close. Like the idea is right there, and it's. It's just never, never fully realized. For Dark Matter's colors, the default shows it with a blue armor and gray cape. The Orbitars are orange. This stuff isn't important, so I'm just gonna talk over it. I like to just mention we are two hours in. This was only the first video. Then a dark navy one. So I'm going to try being a little bit more straightforward with my explanations of future videos. So that we don't end up having two hours per video. Then here's a monochrome color. I'll call back to the original Game Boy colors. And lastly, here's an alt with red armor and a dull red cape. All right. Its so body becomes white and its eye is also red. Overall, and I've explained to zero itself. This the design row, is overly simple and it doesn't know what it wants to be. It has aspects that are very interesting, but those aspects are never pushed far enough. Like the, the throws, they're all really cool. And some of the stuff, like, in, like, the way his up tilt throws out small pieces of dark matter, that's also cool. But it never goes far enough. And when it does go far, it, it uh, cracks its spine on the diving board. And by that, I mean the possession mechanic. It completely negates the rest of the moveset. Like, every aspect of the moveset is overshadowed by one move. It's not even like it's a move that the, all, that the entire moveset is comprised around. It's not like a grappler where the whole point is you want to get in close and you want to get that command grab. It's not like they have a kit that's designed to specifically help them get the possession. It's just there. And it takes away from every other design aspect of Dark Matter. I don't... And again, this is... I like to also just reiterate, this is the one that I consider to be the least offensive choice to lead this stream. I've been talking about Dark Matter for over two hours. Actually, no, it's been about an hour and a half. I've been talking about Dark Matter for over an hour and a half. Okay. Let's move on. To zero. Second choice. And we'll let this play as I talk. Why did I choose zero? Well. Zero is a character I'm very familiar with. Because I am a, because I am a humongous fan of the Versus series. Which is essentially... A giant franchise, which is essentially a giant franchise of Capcom crossing over with a variety of franchises and creating crossover fighting games out of it, such as, you know, Marvel vs. Capcom, Tatsunoko vs. Capcom, 
SNK versus Capcom. I'm a huge fan. It's, while Vampire Savior is my favorite fighting game of all time, in terms of an actual fighting game franchise, the, the Versus series is 100% my favorite fighting game series of all time. And as I previously stated, I am a com I was once a competitive ultimate Mo a competitive vanilla Marvel vs. Capcom 3 player. I also played a bit of competitive TBC, and I did dabble in a little bit of competitive UMVC3. So the point is that I am very, very familiar with Zero. Zero as a character is one of the strongest fighting game characters to ever exist. And by that, I mean every single game he's a part of, he has always been a top-tier character. Like, he is legitimately fantastic in every game. In TVC, Tatsunoko vs. Capcom, which was his first introduction into the Versus series, he was the top, he was the best character in the game. Bar none. In Vanilla Marvel vs. Capcom 3, he was top-tier. Like, he was top 3 or top 5. In Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3... Top three or top five. <laughs> Mar Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, top two with, with Dante. Um, the appearance of Mega Man Zero in SVC Chaos, top two character. Zero in every game he's a part of is completely and 100% a top tier prime cut rushdown fighter. And he's great. I love I love Zero in in the Versus series. I don't always like playing against him. Um, getting mixed up with Soul Body is absolutely infuriating, especially when you can't block it half the time. But when you're on, but when you're the one dealing the combo that they can't block instead of the one receiving it, you feel like you're a god. Zero in fighting games is amazing. And that's exactly why this moveset offended me so much. Because the way that this this that he handles Zero is nowhere near what he should be. And it also, another reason I chose this video is because it accentuates another problem. With Brawl fans content. It might not relate directly to the to the design aspect, which is which is why I'm not going to focus on it for very long, but it's very apparent. I'd like to just point out this video is 21 minutes long. I will be skipping the introduction. There is nothing of note that you need to that you need to know. Zero was created by Dr. Wiley. He has a sword. Um, he uses that sword to, to cut people to pieces, he has a bunch of Japanese name moves, and he's very good in every fighting game he's a part of. That's all you need to know about Zero. He is very red and very cool, and he has gr giant green nipples. That is all you need to know about Zero as a character. So powerful, they were forced to call on the then command. Panel. Yes, thank you, thank Time you. Sigma supervision to a true hero. With his original purpose lost to him, Zero now fights for the sake. Okay, I'm also gonna point out this video has an obnoxious amount of fluff in it. Like I timed it, the amount of time that's actually dedicated to the move set is like 12 minutes. There's like nine minutes of fluff and or filler in this in this video. And it really bogs down the experience. Justice and a better future. And today, we'll see firsthand just how powerful Zero really is if he were to ever break free of his assist trophy prison and given playable status in the world of Super Smash Brothers. So getting right into things... It's not that dramatic. You don't need to make it that dramatic. Zero would be your average heavyweight character. That was the moment I literally, I, I checked out of this video the first time I saw it. I didn't come back to this video for like two weeks after I heard that statement. Zero 
for those that don't that have not played Mega Man X, Zero is essentially the speedrunner character compared to X. He's got abilities that are all designed around mobility, going fast, killing things quickly, and essentially beating the game as quickly as possible. Zero is the speedrunner character of Mega Man X. Especially in all of his appearances between X4 and X6. That has always been his design. The fact that he went and made him a heavyweight hurt. <laughs> in every game he's a part of, Zero does a shit ton of damage, but Zero can't take much damage himself. Zero is a glass cannon. He does, he hits hard. And he's got great disjoint thanks to that sword. But goddamn, if you catch him, he's gonna die. Especially against certain characters. Like, if Doctor Doom or Virgil catches Zero, making a single mistake, his health is so low, he's dead. He was a bit more lenient. His health was actually a little higher in TVC, which is one of the main reasons why he wasn't why he was one of the game's best characters. But from from going forward, he's always been the super fast, like highly mobile glass cannon zoner. He's like Akuma with a sword. Essentially. And you're going to hear me making a lot of comparisons to UMVC3 and f other fighting games that he's a part of because so does he. As a matter of fact, there are several attacks in this moveset that directly reference it. So if he can make references to UMVC3 instead of making up unique attacks, I can make references to UMVC3 as well and tell you how they don't work. The funny thing is that you'd think he would know that that's how Zero is designed. Because do you know what character? He covered Dante before this. Dante was done the video before Zero. So that knowledge, I'm assuming he got, so that knowledge has to be fresh in his mind because I'm assuming he got the recording done for both of them at the same time. Because that's what I would do. If I have two char if I have two characters planned, they're from the same game, and I can look at these games as a reference point for how these characters would fight, I'm obviously going to just have a single file that has both of them on the same recording. So if chances are very high, these characters were recorded at the exact same time. UMVC3 Phoenix is badly designed. She was worse in vanilla, but yes, you're correct. She's absolutely wor badly designed. His whole Phoenix Riot video moveset was just a remapping of his UMVC3 moveset. Okay, here's the thing. I think it's a little bit more forgiving with Phoenix Wright because that was our first venture into what Phoenix could be like in a fighting game. And I used some aspects of it too when designing my Phoenix Wright moveset. Because I felt that there were aspects of the character that were so well done, it could not be ignored. However, I will state for the record, Phoenix Wright in, in Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 is not a good design character. He's not well designed at all. He's very true to what the character is in his home game. And the way, you know, investigation, courtroom and everything. But it bogs down the character design and makes, it, makes it, the character have a lot of wasted time. There's a lot of wasted time when you're playing as Phoenix. Or Nick. I'm going to call him Nick so we don't confuse him with Dark with uh, Dark Phoenix. I don't think that Phoenix writes a, a well-designed character in Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3. I think that there are aspects of his design in that game that are so well done that they should absolutely be taken to other fighting games if he ever makes it into another one. But overall... His game plan sucks. Okay, I'm rambling. We're not we're not talking about Phoenix Wright, we're talking about Zero. He'd have two jumps, and of course, he 
would have the iconic Mega Man X ability to wall jump. Though I don't think it could be as spammable as it was in those games. Why not? Zero is such a highly mobile character, giving him a giving him a multi wall jump would make would be would make complete and total sense for the design. Not to mention, most stages don't allow you to do wall jumps multiple times anyways. So he could have it, but he's not going to be able to use it that much unless you're playing on specific stages that are completely flat all the way down that you can't jump underneath. Building Zero's moveset was pretty easy, as he has a lot of different abilities and skills that he's obtained over the course of the Mega Man X games where he had a dominant playable role, all of which are done with his two weapons of choice. His Zero Buster, the classic Mega Man arm cannon built into his arm that lets him fire energy blasts at will. And of course, his favorite weapon, the Z-Saber, a powerful energy blade that Zero uses to cut his foes down to size. Fairly standard. The focus should be on the sword, not the blaster. The blaster, even in Mega Man X, you rarely use it. It's mainly the sword and the abilities based around the sword that you are using. Like unless you're playing unless you're playing Zero, and you know, I think it was X3 or X2, where he's mainly only using the the X but his his buster, you are one almost 100 percent dedicated to using that sword. Because it deals more damage and you don't have to stop to shoot it. Yeah, exactly. I've been recently playing through through Act through Mega Man titles for purposes that I will not state as of right now. But in X, in Mega Man X six, X has his main weapon as his X Buster, but he also has the side weapon of the Z Saber. He can't use the Z Saber that well, and all majority of his abilities are based around using his buster. By comparison, Zero's main weapon is the is the Z-Saber, and his secondary weapon is the buster. And he doesn't use the buster nearly as well as X does. It's a very, very rare option, like, attack option. And this will be the weapon that he'll use for his jab using his basic three-hit attack from Mega Man X4 and X5 to do a three-hit jab. Starting with a vertical high-to-low slash, then a horizontal slash, then ends with an overhead high-to-low slash. But that last slash is a little weird. Despite only being swung once, the move actually deals multiple hits of damage before it launches foes away. Now starting with his- That's fine. I mean, that, 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 that is exactly what I expect because essentially it's the exact same for Zero in Mega Man X in, uh, in Marvel vs. Capcom 3. His three hit, uh, his three hit combo is his standard combo from X4. So, yeah, that's pretty standard. That's exactly what I would expect. Dash attack. This will be the first of many moves that Zero learns from the various Maverick robot masters that he's destroyed over the years. These techniques also have some interesting names. So I. They're all in Japanese. All of Zero's names are in Japanese. In comparison to all of X's names, all of the abilities for X being in English. Why? I guess it's because he uses a sword and he's kind of like a samurai. So yeah, that's why all of his names are in Japanese. I apologize ahead of time if I butcher any of them. The dash attack will have him use a move from X4 that he received from beating Slash Beast, Shippuga. This has Zero do a twirling saber slash out of his dash. It's a move that also hits multiple times despite only being swung once, just like the third hit of his jab, trapping foes with each hit until they're launched away. His side- Yeah, that's also fairly standard. It was also a command normal in Marvel 3. And actually, actually in all of his appearances, it's, it's a command normal. It's his uh, forward, it's, 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 it's his forward standing heavy in TVC and, and MVC3, and his forward standing heavy punch in MVCI. A tilt can be another technique that he got next for. This one coming from Web Spider, Raijin Geki. 
This has Zero do a stabbing thrust through the saber straight forwards while it emits electricity. It's yet another move that deals multi-hitting damage. Now this is an option, and this works. I've recently been playing PMEX Remix. I would love to be able to stream that game, but uh, I'd be put on a blacklist if I did, so you're never going to see that from me on this channel. But the Zero that you can play as in that game essentially also uses this as its forward tilt, and it works. However, I don't, I think that in comparison to the way how important his neutral combo is, I think that the better option would have been to go with his alternate combo from X6. Which is two slashes followed by a upward slash. It works better as a side smash. Yeah, actually, you know what? It probably does. And his side smash pisses me off. We'll get to it. But the side smash option pisses me off. I don't call it a problem either. I'm just saying that for a character that's designed to get up in your face, I don't think that Zero really needs a long-range poke option. His sword's big enough as it is. His, his, his jab, his like basic attacks cover range. That enough is enough of a neutral like presence for Zero. He doesn't need a long-range poke option like this. Albeit this one makes a bit more sense as to why. What is unique about it though is that you actually can cancel this attack at any point by using your jab. Reducing its end lag while also potentially taking your foes off guard and racking up more damage. For his up tilt, he can do a simple low to high rising saber swing in front of himself. This move references his new combo ender that he got in Mega Man X6. As yeah, that's basically the end of the combo I was referencing such, before. To reference that, if you want to, you can actually cancel his jab into his... I think that that combo works way better as a side tilt. And that you could cancel into it. You can cancel either into it or to the neutral combo from it. To rack up some serious damage. In PMX, in PMEX Remix, they gave Zero his launcher from Marvel vs. Capcom 3 as his up tilt. And honestly, that works way better. Because it's a simple rising slash, it covers in front of him and above his head, and it does decent damage, and it's a great way to pop them up into the air for a possible combo. Because that's exactly what it did in Marvel vs. Capcom 3. It, set, it threw them up in the air, and you can combo them in the air. I think that works perfectly fine. After the first two hits. So you could go from jab to jab to up tilt as another potential combo option. Whereas the normal jab ender is better for racking up damage, this one is better for launching foes into the air. And for his down tilt, Zero can do a simple saber slash while crouching. Just like also fairly standard, is spot. exactly what I expected for, for Zero. Zero. He also does that for his crouching heavy in Marvel vs. Capcom 3. Side smash, this can have him use a powerful ranged attack that he learned from vanishing Gungaroo in X7. Hodden Geki. Zero does not need a ranged smash attack. He is a rushdown fighter who is all about getting in your face. Also, just realized why is the outline of why is the outline of Zero not covering his hair? That looks really weird. Zero does not need a ranged smash attack. He really doesn't. He just needs a pow he just needs a decently powerful forward hitting slash that does moderate damage. Because Zero's whole thing should be that he, he he's not dealing a lot of damage in one hit. He's a consistent damage character, not burst. Also, Hadonkiki 
is Zero's prominent projectile in the Versus series. And it's handled there way better than it is in its actual game. And I think that that's a design aspect that they should absolutely adopt when if Zero were to make it into Smash. They should be used as a standard projectile. Like your average fireball. Yeah, he gives projectiles to characters that really don't need them. Zero did have a projectile in the Versus series, but he he used it very sparingly. Like, it was used against some characters, and he was mainly used for people that like to run away. Like, it was really good at catching characters like, like Dante, Virgil, Spider-Man... Characters that, are, that have, like, really quick mobility options that can, like, duck in and out of attacks. That's mainly what Zero used to, to Donkey for. And I think that that works way better with a rushdown-oriented kit than giving him a smash attack that is a ranged attack. Zero is so much about being in your face... That I think it's counterproductive to give him a give him an attack that has him attack from afar. Because why? What what purpose does it have? A basic projectile is all you need to to help approach against people that also have projectiles of their own. And you know he doesn't again he doesn't need a ranged kill option because he should have options there designed around. Melee, because he's a swordsman. He's designed to get in your face. It's the equivalent of giving Roy a projectile. It's like, why would you do it? He doesn't need it. He's fast, he's got great buttons, and he has everything he needs to get in his opponent's face. Zero do a strong vertical high to low saber slash and when most people also consider the MBC Hidangiki way better in terms of design than this. And he does so, the Z Saber shoots a crescent shaped wave of energy straight forwards. The long most people won't be able because Mega Man has a range smash attack. Honestly, I hate that Mega Man's charge, charge shot is his range smash attack. I think that Mega Man's charge shot should just be something he gets from holding the A button. And that he can use it while follow as a follow up attack to pressure from afar. Like you hit somebody with Metal Blade and then you instantly shoot him with a charge shot. I don't like the fact that Mega Man's forward smash is, a char is his charge shot. It's kind of a waste of potential if you ask me. Yeah, I know that Roy can shoot fire, but I'm basically saying his playstyle is so oriented around being in your face, he doesn't need it. Just like Zero, his playstyle is about being in your face, so why does he need a ranged attack? Like a ranged projectile smash. Yeah, you could also move and do aerial versions of it. Be a great way to just give the flip the bird to somebody trying to recover. charge the attack the further the wave flies it will disappear as soon as it i also hate that the x7 hadongiki isn't green it's orange for some reason hits anything or after reaching its max distance and it does count as a projectile Violet so it counts as a projectile it's not even like disjointed like non-projectile projectile if zero throws this at fox he can just have it reflected back in his face for this All the more reason to never use it. Does come from Gunguru's move. It could also reference another common attack that we see Zero usually use. Um, here's the thing. That wasn't that wasn't the Donkey Key. What what Zero just did there in Smash 
was Genmu Zero. It wasn't Hadongiki. It's a move he uses in his boss fight in X5. It's also his final that's also his level three super. That's not that's not Hadongiki. That's Genmu Zero. Specifically during boss fights against him. For his up smash, he could use Shoenzon, a technique learned from defeating Blaze Heat Mix and X6. This yeah, that makes sense. That works. In front of himself. Almost that move is broken in X6, by the way. That thing's that. Here's the thing. Sword stops here. The move, the move's hitbox is all the way up here. You can hit people that are like three platforms above you with this move. Sword, this is where the hitbox actually stops. Like what he does for his up tilt. Only this time his saber emits flames, creating a rising wall of fire in front of himself that shoots upwards. The flames go higher than the saber, giving it a bit of extra reach. Both the saber and the flames also act each as their own independent hitboxes. So if foes are hit by both, it deals damage from both of them at the same time. That's not really necessary, but... I'll, uh, I'll give it a pass. And for Zero's down smash, he could use a nerfed version of the Giga attack called Bakuin Jin, a move learned in X7 from Flame High Enough. Oh god, I'm warning you right now. Cover your fucking ears. <laughs> Cover your ears. Because you're about to hear something that is completely and utterly obnoxious. And doesn't need to be in this video whatsoever. Shut up! I should be saying the same thing to you. This is the first attack where Zero uses his buster. He charges it up with fire, then punches the ground, causing a fiery shockwave that flies outwards, hitting on both sides of the Now, that's a fine option for Down Smash. Um in PMEX Remix. That was actually his down special. And it was like a huge pillar of fire that went, that like covered vertical range. I didn't really care for that, for that choice, but I think that's perfectly fine. If I, if it were me and I was picking a zero weapon, I probably would have gone with this. Rakukoha. Which is essentially slam the ground, shoots projectiles in all directions, shoots like small fireballs in all directions. They wouldn't count as projectiles. They would only cover like that amount of range. Zero actually gets to use this move in MVCI as a, as a move he can cancel into if he has a fully charged buster. I should also mention that Zero in MVC3 was very, was like, he was technical, but he had, but he was fairly simple to learn. Zero in MVCI became an extremely difficult character to use. Because they added a mechanic where Zero essentially can charge his buster by holding an attack button. And when you release it during a special move, it completely changes that special move. You think he chose the down smash he did just for the burn to the ground joke? I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't even really call it a joke. As I said, this video has an obnoxious amount of fluff in it. And you're gonna see and you're gonna see it. Like it's one of the worst offenders for fluff, in my honest opinion. It's like you're you're not doing a comedy routine. You're trying to show us a character's design. I'm not going to go to a board meeting, start talking about a character design, and then start juggling. It does nothing. It doesn't add anything. And the worst part is that it's not funny. Zero at the same time. 
And just like another certain robot who has a fiery down smash. Actually, you asked me, is it because of the burn to the ground joke? I think it's more because it's more similar to what Mega Man does. Foes hit by the Bakuin Jin are launched into upwards directions. For his aerials, Zero's neutral air can have him use a technique that he gets in just about all of his playable incarnations. Kuenzon, first learned from Split Mushroom in X4. This has Zero do a single rolling slash attack with his saber, spinning in a clock motion to hit all around him. Is it from Split Mushroom? I don't think that's from Split Mushroom. Oh, that's right. He gets two abilities from Split Mushroom. He gets the ability to double jump and that ability. That's right. Himself. His forward air can be a simple high to low saber swing. His basic aerial attack in X6. He holds his saber in place for a short. Yeah, that's fairly standard, but swing, letting it become that a works. Hitting move to rack up a bit of extra damage as well as to put on some extra pressure in the air. The back air can be a quick overhead slash from high to low. One that starts above, then hits behind as it ends under Zero's x-axis. What's first off, unfunny joke. Second of all, he was going through Marvel vs. Capcom 3, and the funny thing is that Zero literally has the perfect back air in Marvel vs. Capcom 3 to just, just snag. It's his, it's his spike. It's his horizontal slash that he uses to end an aerial combo. It's, it's literally perfect. Yeah, that's right. Zero is busted in Marvel 3 and MVCI and TVC because of Sogenmu. Soul Body. Which is funny because playable Zero never uses it. It's only his boss fights. Yep, I, I even said that at the beginning. He's busting in every game he's a part of. This is an innovative idea referencing what he does in the X games whenever he attacks while sliding down walls. The idea that I have for his up air is another innovative reference, but this one coming from his appearance in Marvel vs. Capcom 3. You know, this is the second video in a row where I reference that game. Yes, it's like I already mentioned this. Then again, this is yet another red colored sword and gun wield. Oh god. Oh god, here it comes. I'm just going to talk over it, but I'm going to let the moment play out. Capcom owned character. Huh. Well, that's all right. I'm sure that's where the similarities end anyway. Uh, no, this isn't happening. There's no reason for me to go on. You want to fill your dark soul with light? Okay, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be completely honest with you. The video stops. Like the video just straight up stops for like a minute and a half. The comparison isn't even that great. Like it's like the way it's handled between Dante and Zero is notably different. It as I said, this video is 21 minutes. This doesn't need to be here. Imagine if you went, if you were taking a design as a design for a character to a board meeting, and then randomly in the middle of it, you say, you just have a you have a, you have a Vietnam flashback, and you just stare at the wall for like three minutes and say absolutely nothing. It's exactly what this is. It doesn't need to be here. If you want to make comedy in a, in a moves like the, in, a, in a video like this, that's fine. It just it the video doesn't need to stop. Have it be mixed into the video, and one of the best ways that I like to do it is that majority of it is either a quick comment or it's in the text that's lit, that's describing the move. Like if you look at the descriptions. Like that, like, for example, if you go in my Kiryu moveset and you look at the descriptions I gave for that, like, that's where the comedy is. 
I don't need to say it because it's there on the screen and it doesn't take away from anything that I'm saying. This doesn't need to be here. Being different doesn't mean being better. Usually, being different means worse. Where was I? Oh, right, the up air. So this can reference Zero's down special attack, where he does a low to high saber swing that arcs over his head. It um, that move is not a down special. For those who are curious, Marvel vs. Capcom 3 is essentially a four button game where it has three main attack buttons and it has a launcher button, which you're seeing is a launcher. That animation is the exact same regardless of whether or not Zero is standing or crouching. It only changes if Zero is in the air. It's the same move, but what's innovated about it is that normally this can only be used on the ground in Marvel, but I'm having it be an aerial attack for this moveset. And for his down air, he can use another technique from X4. This one coming from Frost Walrus. Pure at Susan. A dropping move where Zero turns his saber into an icicle and stabs it downwards as he falls. The ice spike can spike opponents if they're hit at the start of the attack, and it will automatically stop if it takes too long to hit the stage, which might give you enough time to recover if you used it over the blast zone. Okay, so that's perfectly f design. That, that choice is fine. I mean, Zero has used this. In the Versus series, he recently got access to it in MVCI. But I don't think that it fits the design. If you want my opinion of what actually works as a down air for zero, send Suiz on which is another ability that he has in MVC3 and MVCI and TVC. Essentially, it is a downward dash in the air with his sword. In, in the Versus series, it drags the opponent back down to the ground and is a great way to take a combo from the ground, sorry, from the air to the ground and continue. Especially if you have an assist set up. And... I think that an advancing down air works perfectly for zero. And again, it's a move that zero uses, and it's a move that he that has become popular thanks to how well it was implemented in TVC and MVC3. just something to consider. Zero will grab opponents with one arm and pummel with a knee jab. The forward and back throws can both come straight from Marvel vs. Capcom 3, with the forward throw having Zero fire some shots into the foe's gut point blank, then launches them away with the final stronger shot. And the back throw will have Zero dash past the foe, and before they can process where he went, he fires a strong shot into their back, launching them away. The up throw can yeah, Zero I mean, the foe in the PME, PMEX Remix them, Zero also the does that. Firing a shot that sends them high into the air, and his down throw can have Zero step on the foe to bring them to the ground, then fires a shot from his buster point blank These are harmless. The to knock them away. It could be other things, but that's harmless. For Zero's neutral special, he finally gets to utilize his Z-Buster. True to the Mega Man games, this special lets you fire projectile shots, and you can even charge it up by holding the button down to fire a much more powerful blast. Again, he doesn't need this. As soon as you let the button go. While he charges, you can still move around and use all of your other actions not associated with the special button, though shielding and dodging will cancel the charge. 
The Z Buster will have four levels of shots, all of which reference how Zero uses his Buster in Mega Man X3. Just tapping you mean the one the game zero fire that Zero is forced to buttons. use the Buster in? If you hold the button down until Zero's Buster starts glowing blue, he'll fire a single large shot forwards. If you hold it down until the Buster glows purple, Zero will actually fire two shots one after another. The first one medium-sized and the second one large. And if you charge it all the way up, which will be signified by his Buster glowing a green color, he'll fire two large shots, but then will automatically follow up with a quick overhead saber swing from high to low. And that saber swing does a lot of shield damage, so... It's not necessary. First off, the swing in X3 is useless. Because chances are high that you're using it, the move from a range where it doesn't work. Not to mention, its range sucks. If anything, this would have made more sense if the slash was at the beginning of the before the shot. That way, they're locked into it. But, as I said, zero does not need this kind of attack. I think that Zero's, that Zero's Buster should, be work, should work the exact same way it does in MVC3. It's a passive move that you can access by holding an attack button. That is the best way to go about it. That way it's it's not a huge part of the move set. It doesn't disrupt the move set's balance and you could put something else in this spot like Hadangiki. Or you could give him a you could give him a unique mobility option. But you could do a moveset for zero and nix the buster and you would lose nothing. Because the buster is such a small part of what zero is and what he can do. The fact that he had to go back to the one Mega Man game where zero can't use his sword normally goes to show how forced this move, this special move is. Someone right next you try shielding all three attacks from Zero's fully charged neutral special, they're more than likely going to be met with a broken shield. For Zero's side special, he can use the technique that he received in X8 from destroying Gigavolt Man of War, Rai Josen. This move has Zero dash horizontally forward so quickly that he's near invisible, and as soon as he reappears at the end of the dash, a line of electricity appears on the path of Zero's dash. Foes in Zero's way as he dashes only take small flinching damage, whereas getting caught in the electricity causes them to take a bit of multi-hitting damage, then are launched into the air afterward. Uh, well this is essentially, also, this was essentially a special I would give him as well. I mean, it would work differently. The initial dash would deal damage and essentially lock the opponent into the electricity to make it more effective, like it does in MVC3. But I think it's a it it's it, it's an ideal side special choice for zero. Making it so that if they're hit by zero himself, they're more likely than not going to be in for a shocking revelation. The move can also be used for horizontal recovery, but zero Wait, does what go the fuck? the Am I the only one that just saw a boo randomly pop up in the bottom right corner of the screen? Himself, they're more likely than not going to be in for a shocking revelation. What the fuck does Boo have to do with this? <laughs> Boo, you're in the wrong video, man. Why are you here? You need help? Guys, I think he wants out. I think he's being trapped, and I think that he needs to be freed. Why is he here? <laughs> <laughs> the move can also be used for horizontal recovery, but Zero does go into freefall after using it in the air. 
Next for Zero's up special, he could use a technique from X4 called Ryuinjin. I feel it's pretty important thematically for Zero to have this one, considering that he gets it from Magma Dragoon. You don't need to explain why this move makes sense. It's his main upward slash, and it is arguably the most iconic special move that Zero has. Reploid, who was single-handedly responsible for the war that broke out in X4, which is what leads to that. Oh, for fuck's sake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, Ryuinjin has Zero do a jumping slash while his saber emits fire. Foes hit by it will be dragged along, taking multi-hitting damage until they're launched at the top of the attack. And Zero does go into freefall afterwards. So it's one for one, literally just Roy's up special. Yes. What do you think it was inspired by? Coincidence or intentional? Jesus Christ. In which case, for Zero's down special, I've decided to give him the ability learned from destroying Shield Sheldon in X6, the Guard Shell. Oh god, I forgot he gave him this move. I haven't seen this video in a while. Oh dear god, what is this? This has Zero create an energy shield that perpetually floats right in front of him at all times. So this could be seen as a sort of parallel to the very robot that Zero was designed off of. This shield will nullify all projectiles that hits it, but if an energy-based projectile hits it, it'll fire back its own projectile, working as a makeshift reflect. Zero does not need a reflector! That, it, it's weird. That feels extremely out of place. And it would follow zero and essentially allow him to reflect while moving. No, 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 no. Oh God, why? That's not, it, it, it doesn't, it, you don't need it. it. It's not necessary. Oh God, I'm getting a headache. <laughs> I'm getting a fucking headache. Um, no, I don't think that Zero needs a projectile counter. His projectile counter should be his own projectile. A simple attack that he can move with. It counters the attack and allows for him to work effectively. If you want my opinion on what his down special could be, I think the great choice for his down special could be this. And yes, it's a counter, but it makes more sense for Zero to have a physical counter than a projectile one. Also, if you need a forward smash idea, there you go. A big, powerful swing. That's all I'm going to say about that. 
while direct contact with the shield itself doesn't deal damage, foes who are touching the shield will take extra damage from all of Zero's other attacks. Why? Making special something to really give Zero's opponents a hard time, since they won't really be able to reliably attack from afar, and getting too close could be dangerous. So it's a really good special. However, like all good things, it doesn't last forever. The guard shell has its own personal battery, one that's consumed while- That joke would have made more sense if you stopped like halfway through. ...while you use it, and once the battery runs out, you won't be able to use the guard shell again until you lose a stock. That's- Why does it need that kind of extra attachment to it? Like, if you want to make a reflector, just make a reflector that can only last the same amount of time and then it has to recharge. Why does it have to be, if you use it for too long, you can't use it again until the next stock? Banjo and Kazooie tried that, and that move's horribly designed. The only way to refill its energy. It takes a combined 20 seconds of usage to deplete all of its energy to empty. But fret not, using down special again while the guard shell is out will turn it off, allowing you to conserve it until you feel the need to use it again. No, I don't know why it's always the down special. I really don't know. For Zero's final smash! He could use one of his most powerful Giga attacks, learned in X6 from destroying Infinity Maginion. You Marvel players should know what I'm talking about. It's none other than... <laughs> Though he will not be using his Marvel version, he'll be using its much more spaced out original version from X6. Um... For context, in Tatsunoko vs. Capcom, the first versus series game that Zero was a part of, Rikoha was also his level one super, but it clear but it covered the entire room at the same time. Much more like it is in X6. Uh, it was so overpowered and could basically remove aerial pressure altogether that they had to change it in MVC3 to a more condensed version of the move. So if you're curious as to why it's different, it's because it was the same in TVC, but it was completely and utterly broken and was basically the greatest combo ender that Zero could ask for because it confirmed from almost anywhere if he had the opponent hit stun. Zero punches the ground with his charged up buster arm, causing beams of light to rain down all over Do you the think he even knows Tatsunoko exists? Any of the beams take major damage in our long Hell if I know. Which more often than I want to hope that he does. You into another beam. It is possible to dodge by getting in between them, but considering how wide the beams are and how fast they come down, foes may have a hard time gauging exactly where they need to stand resulting in them with zero chance for survival. <sighs> for Zero's colors, his default has him in his classic red clad armor, the color that Dr. Wily came up with when using Proto Man as a reference for Zero's design. His first alt can be the black armor Zero, so, the same design that we've seen in most of the Mega Man X Zero. either an alt or an armor I didn't have as much Zero. to say about his as I did Dark Matter. Purple armor, in reference to the design of the Zero but I still think that overall, six. this moveset Here we have a design is worse than Dark Matter's. Zero's best friend, the main character because it loses itself, track so it of what it's supposed to be. Color used for Zero in and what is and commonplace amongst Zero in every game he's a part of. Hair. In reference to Axel, the former Red Alert member that they meet in X7. Though, it could also subtly reference Zero's love interest from X4. Iris, or I guess I should say former love interest since... Oh, you... Oh, for fuck's sake! Yeah, we do get it! Why'd you play it three times? Douglas, as well as the Maverick Hunter turned Maverick leader... Jesus Christ. Then here's Golden Armor, which can reference General, the leader of the Repliforce Army in X4. And finally, here's White Armor, 
which can reference the lab coats of both Dr. Light, the creator of X, as well as his own creator, <sighs> Dr. Wiley. I think that... So before it, anyone asks, I'm so not including any reference to this iteration of this Zero. zero. Only the one from the X is a heavyweight rushdown character. I assume they can cancel his normals into a bunch of shit. For the iconic Mega Man series teleport beam, the same one that Zero and all other players He's got a ranged projectile forward smash. Move on. I do have and little extra thing that I'd like to throw in. Some weird specials that where the only one that came up with this idea. Whenever zero is oh, good. I have a face to put to, for this horrible idea, then. Um, that's the last time, I promise. So, for zero's taunts, I just lost my train of thought. I just lost my entire train of thought. I just lost all my train of thought because they had to do it again. Long story short, this moveset isn't zero. It's it's zero nightmare from X6. And by that I mean it's a fake. The stats make no sense. Whilst a lot of the attack buttons make sense, the way that they're structured in the moveset does not. What is with the neutral special and the down special, I don't know. Yes, John Young Bosch does the scream very well. That is true. That's because John Young Bosch is a voice actor unlike the person that did it originally. If you want to watch the scene done well, play the game in Japanese. That guy does it even better than Johnny does. That guy lets out the most guttural scream. And it works. But yeah, there's a reason why Johnny Young Bosch has been to zero for over a decade now. His first one can show him cocking his Z-Buster, and he'd say... This'll be over in a nanosecond. His second can have him use his taunt from Marvel vs. Capcom 3, where he pulls out his saber for a few mock swings and says, Just like a training program. I would also like to mention that weirdly in TVC, Zero was fucking huge. Like, in MVC 3, they made him more in line with the size he's supposed to be. Like, Zero and X aren't, like, fully sized people. They're, like, four foot, like, four foot five robots. Zero in MVC, and sorry, Zero in TVC was bigger than Ryu. And it was weird. This is something that Zero loves to do. This specifically references his victory pose from X8. And during this, he could say... Yeah, Zero and X are short. And lastly, for Zero's victory animations... They're not, like, fully human-sized. I mean, they're humanoid. Mission accomplished. Returning to base. Then teleports away. A common victory animation that we've seen from him in the later Mega Man X games. But like was even used as in TVC, in he was in he was massive. That's probably another reason why he was so broken because that massive size made his disjoints even better. During this, he'd say, "Nothing to worry about. It's just another mission," which was victory text that he had in Marvel Three. And his final can have Zero swing his saber past the screen, then sheaths it to pose while continuing to grip onto the saber's hilt. This is a combined reference, with the saber swing referencing his X4 stage clear screen, while the pose is shown in a few games, like in X8, and even in the mobile game, Teppen. During this victory animation, he could say, You thought you were better than you are. I mean, Zero also does that at the end of his taunt in MVC3. Alright. 
we are two videos down. We are now moving on to Cynthia. But not right away. I need to I need to eat something and I need to take a painkiller. But essentially why is this one here? It gave my reasons for for dark matter. It gave my reasons for zero. Why is Cynthia here? Okay. I need to preface this with an explanation that needs to be said about an entire subgenre of moveset design for Smash. Pokemon trainer designs are bad. They almost never add anything fun or unique to the concept of Pokemon trainer. And they flub what makes the Pokemon Trainer work. They also tend to flub the balance between a point, a middle, and an anchor character. Now, Brawlfan has done four of these. For four different trainers. He's done one for the Johto Trainer. The Hoenn Trainer, the Sinnoh Trainer, while mocking my favorite region in the entire series, and the Unovan Trainer. Whether he does more in the future, I don't know, and frankly, I don't care. And then, at the end of it all, he made Cynthia. Now, as I said before, Designing a concept. Designing a concept for a trainer is difficult. So difficult, in fact, that I think it has never been done. By anyone other than myself. You have to understand a lot about fighting game design to make a unique trainer and make it work well. You need to under you are balance you need to understand that you are balancing three characters inside of themselves. You need to make set you need to make designs that make sense so that they can flow between one another. The point character needs to work as a point character and benefit the middle character while the middle benefits the point character while you're having aspects that the point character doesn't. The middle character, in turn, needs to open the gateway for the anchor character. Usually by having an extreme amount of damage compared to the other two options. While the anchor character is the character that is designed to secure the kills that is made that has been set up by the middle and the point character. And then once that's done, you switching back to the point character to do it all over again, it needs to be concise. And no one has done it but me. I don't like tooting my own horn. I don't. But my Pokemon rival design is the only one that's done it. With the way that I designed it so that not only can you... Not only do they have special moves that work off of one another and can purposely be designed to change depending on how they interact with one another, but the way that the Pokemon can be swapped in and out to deal damage and interact with one another is completely unique and original and it was never done yet. But I did it. Now, I'm gonna be completely honest. I've had concepts for other 
Pokemon trainer types. And one of them was a Pokemon champion. It would have been blue using three different Pokemon, but I had I did have ideas for it. I'm not gonna say what they are, because I might want to revisit it sometime down the line. I'm not sure. But the point is that a champion is very different from every other trainer that you fight. They are the ultimate challenge. They are the, tr the character that will push you to your limits and show, and show whether or not you have what it takes to beat the game. That is the champion. What you are about to see, or will see in about 15 minutes, is nothing like what a champion is supposed to be. Which you are about to see is yet another bastardized Pokemon trainer. And out of all of the options he's done before, this one is it was the worst by far. But for now, I'm going to be right back. I'm going to rest my voice for about 10 to 15 minutes. I'm going to grab a little something to eat. I'm going to pop an Advil. And I'm going to come back. I'll put on some music so that you're not left in, not left in silence. But yeah, I need to I need to collect myself for a few minutes. I'll be back.
Hello, I am back. Sorry for the extra wait. I just had to wait for the painkiller to kick in a little bit before we continued. I should be ready to continue. It hasn't fully kicked in yet, but it's enough. So let's uh, return and uh, get this third video started. It starts exactly like you'd expect it to. Was that funny? Did you give, did you have a ha ha he he moment? I sure did. I think that was, that feeling was indigestion. I forgot. Every video, you know, has the requested by this many people at the beginning of it. So if you ever wanted to put a face or a name to the people that that made this bastardized creation come to fruition, there they are on screen right now. It's your fault, all of you. And you, Cynthia, champion of Sinnoh, and one of the most powerful Pokemon trainers in the world. She works hard to keep everyone safe, always quick to jump in if she sees Pokemon yes, yes. Have for this move set were ones that I've chosen for her, based on what she's most commonly used and what makes sense for her thematically. Starting with her usual lead, the forbidden Pokemon, Spirit Tomb. I know, we're not even at the move set, but this needs to be talked about because the Pokemon in a Pokemon Trainer move set are very important. Essentially, I'm going to say it right now, Spirit Tomb, maybe for a like actual Pokemon game, is a really good lead because of all the stats affecting stuff that it can set up and the fact that it's decently tanky. In a fighting game, Spiritomb is one of the worst ideas for a point character you can possibly imagine. Because, what are point characters, first off? <laughs> point characters are designed to be the most effective at the beginning of a fight. <laughs> they have stats. They're mainly designed to deal big damage at the beginning of a fight and get the early percent lead. Now, Squ Squirtle is the Pokemon trainer's lead. Squirtle is may not be the fastest, but it does have very quick attacks and it has great combo paths and a bunch of extra stuff that allow it to easily get a pr early percent lead and make the most advantage of those early percents because that is when its damage and its moves work the best. That is the point of a point character. Now I want you to keep that in mind when we go further into this because this is going to fall apart a little bit. And by a little bit, I mean a lot. the same Pokemon whose egg she gifts you, the Jubilee Pokemon Togekiss. In Platinum, she gives you the egg. 
In Diamond and Pearl, she doesn't give you anything. Except pain. Oh, and, uh, and some medicine to cure the headache that she's going to give you. I'm not saying the Tokus is a bad choice, but you're going to see that the way this, po this Togekiss is designed, it makes way more sense for Togekiss to be the point character and, and have Spiritomb be the mid or anchor. The problem is that Spirit, the biggest issue with this moveset is Spirit Tomb. And I'll get into that more, but you already know what's coming. And finally, a Pokemon that she cannot go without. The Aura Pokemon, Lucario! <laughs> Of course, it has to be the mock Pokemon, Garchomp! Do you have Her to fucking to scream? She always brings it to every battle that she enters. Plus, considering how consistently popular this guy is... Sorry, I got a little triggered there. Uh, Cynthia's Garchomp is a girl. You are going to hear him call him... Call her him many many times in this video just letting you know the most iconic guard chomp of all time is a girl it's not surprising that it would be one of the most requested pokemon up to date <sighs> Making a request for Garchomp on Cynthia's team is a fucking pointless endeavor. Of course she's going to use it. Comparing the statistics of Cynthia's team side by side, Spirit Tomb will be the most sluggish in terms of mobility, due in part to it lugging around that over 230 pound keystone. Did you hear that? The point character, the character that is designed to be the most effective at the beginning of the game, the character that is designed to take the most advantage of the early stock, the early stock percent, and get the early stock slash percent advantage, is the slowest character of them all. I'm just going to leave that silence there to let it speak volumes. I'll give you 108 different reasons why it makes no sense. But that image alone should tell you all you need to know. But this does also mean that it'll be the heaviest on the team. It also has... Why does the point character need weight? The point character doesn't need to be heavy because... It's not the point character's job to be there when the character when you need to KO another when you need to KO. That job goes to the anchor. The anchor is the best at it. Though it's usually often that the mid can also do it as well. best disjoint, using its fog-like spiritual body to give it both incredible and very malleable reach. Again, what you're describing sounds far more like a mid character, like a middle character than a point character. The big heavy damage dealer is not supposed to be the point character. It's like if the Pokemon trainer started with Charizard, then the move, then their moveset falls apart. Togekiss is the lightest, the fastest, and the floatiest of the three, moving around like a carefree fairy in the wind. It also has the best recovery on the team, but it is also the weakest, relying more on combos and poke pressure to get the job done. What you just described is a point character. 
why is Togekiss not the point character of this design? I get it. She starts with Spirit Tomb. That's great. This is a fighting game. This is not Pokemon. This is a fighting game. The fast character... The fast character is the mid. This character is designed... This character is designed to work off of the work of this character. And it also has the best recovery, which is weird, again, because there needs to be a reason why you switch to Garchomp, other than just kill. It's not the weirdest thing in the world. I made Crobat the Pokemon Rivals mid, and he can fly, and he has the most, and has the best recovery. But the main aspect of Crobat was that while he, is, he, had, he was extremely fast and had decent physical damage, overall he was capable of just wearing out opponents with poison. He had the highest raw damage output, but he had the weakest knockback. That's why it was important to bring in for Alligator to secure the kill. It also helped that um, Crobat's defenses were awful and was almost purely designed for offense. He had next to no weight and he could die very easily. All the more reason to call in the bigger, heavier, harder hitting for Alligator to cover the weaknesses of the mid character. They have can wait in Pokemon Smash has gone against that before. That's true. Look at Mewtwo, who's lighter than Pikachu. Actually, I think they're the same weight value now. Squirtle weighs the same weight as a flat piece of paper. Charizard is not a bulky Pokemon, but yet it is the heaviest Pokemon in Smash, tied with Incineroar. Point, middle, and anchor aren't MVC terms. It, it's it's tag fighter terms, and it used and it's and I think it applies to this as well. The point character is the one that's designed to get the big point, to get the big advantage, the one that you want to use in the early game to get as much out of the get as much out of the early game as you can. They usually have moves and such that are designed to catch mistakes in the neutral and get big combos and or lead to big damage from their allies. Middle characters are usually Oh yeah, by the way, point characters are usually really good batteries in the Versus series. Batteries are essentially, is essentially a terminology to describe characters that are really good at building meter. Another character that's usually good at building meter is the mid character. This is the one that usually has the best assists. This is usually the one that you use to Again, cover the mid, cover the point character. This is the one you go into from combos off of the point character. So usually they deal some damage. And then you go onto the anchor, who is your saving grace and basically the one that will make the most out of the resources built by these two characters. It's different in MVC than it is in a game like this, but it the same still applies. This character is designed to capitalize on the work done by these two characters. This one's early game, this one is more mid game. 
And once these two have done their work, it's this one's job to come in and clean up and make the most out of what these two have done. It also pisses me off that these two are on the opposite sides of each other. And then there's Garchomp, who is by far the heaviest hitter, able to dish out the most amount of damage in the shortest amount of time. Its deceptive speed and rushdown potential also definitely help with that. It is also still fairly heavy, so its survivability is nothing to scoff at either. I'd say That's that around the way that I put Garchomp when I made a video, video about her. Most amount of start and end lag on its attacks compared to the rest of the team. In short, each Pokemon have clear strengths and weaknesses to balance each other out, as expected of the Sinnoh champion to give herself a well-rounded team. Plus, they each represent the many sides of... Is it well-rounded? I fail to understand or see how this translates to this that translates to this. This being at the at the in the anchor position, I understand 100%. If Garchomp was going to be on a Pokemon team, it makes complete and total sense that she is the anchor of this team. Because she is the anchor of Cynthia's team as her strongest Pokemon. These two, I feel, could be completely switched. Both in position and to different Pokemon. If you want my opinion on what the best possible point character for Cynthia is, Roserade. Character that's fast, decently small, has probably have some good buttons, combo options, some decent some decent projectiles. All the things that are needed for a point character, I think that Roserade fits extremely better. Not, not good English, but much, much better than Spiritomb. Togekiss could be anybody else as well. Togekiss could be the point character. As well. There are also several other Pokemon that could be the mid character as well. Like Milotic. Garchomp was going to be there regardless. The the two beside him beside her are interchangeable, in my honest opinion. Spiritomb could be a mid character. Mid, the mid character of the team works better as a mid character of the team. The way it's described, it makes more sense to be the mid character of the team. Cynthia's personality. She's strong-willed and will never give up when she sets her sight on something. She's kind, passionate, and always prioritizes the happiness of others. And she can be terrifying. As for movement, Spiritomb and Garchomp both have two jumps, whereas Togekiss gets five thanks to its wings. Yes, I'm well aware that Garchomp can fly somehow, but I'm still only giving it two. It's a jet. It flies because it's a jet. It's designed off of jet fighters. That's why it can fly. And faster than either of these, faster than this one can. I don't know why they describe Cynthia when she's only just going to stand in the background. I feel that's a waste of time. Again, fluff that's not needed. Garchomp will be the only one to get additional movement options, being able to wall jump. Alright, show of hands, show of hands. How many of you think that since he's already shown footage of Pokémon Tournament for Garchomp, that he is going to go out of his way to pull as many moves as possible from Pokémon Tournament for Garchomp? Raise your hand. I can't see it, but I'll I'll feel it. The majority of Garchomp's attacks do come directly from other games, so get ready for that one now. 
fucking god damn it, I hate it when I'm right when I don't want to be right. God damn it. Why? Why would you do that? You couldn't just make something unique and original. Something brutal. Something hard hitting. Something that fits her perfectly. Why do you want to turn Garchomp into Brian Fury from Tekken? If you're curious about why I say that, that's because... Garchomp in tech in Pokémon Tournament has a lot of moves shared with Brian Fury from Tekken. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna pull up a video to quickly show you to prove my point. Now here we are. Show this really quick because it's only five minutes long. But it'll prove my point. And also show you that uh, using Pokemon Tournament as a basis for movesets and designing characters does not work nearly as good as you think it does. Yeah, we all know that Pikachu is a Mishima. Let me just quickly skip past this part because it's obvious. You thought I was kidding. Tell me you probably thought I was kidding. Of course, Blaziken is law. That makes complete and total sense. And a bit of Paul. Oh yeah, fucking Pikachu Libre is extremely k reminiscent of King and uh, Julia from Tekken Tag Tournament 2. How Pikachu was able to do a stunner, I have no idea. 
Look, it's the best Pokemon ever designed. I absolutely adore that Gengar is Bob. That is so fucking amazing. And of course, Lucario is Lars. As you can see, thanks to the fact that it was Harada that was the director of this game, there was a ton, and I mean an absolute shit ton, of Tekken moves put into this game. This feels longer than five minutes. No, it's 5 minutes, 57 seconds. I mean, that's technically 6, but... The point is... Using Pokken as a reference for normals... Kinda doesn't work. Yes. Also, I love that apparently Sceptile is Yoshimitsu of all characters. I mean, I figured considering the Poison Breath attack, but it's weird. You know what? The second one's short enough, I'm gonna show it too. Because it, uh, it has some great ones. Oh my fucking god! Okay, let me explain something. When I used to play Pokken seriously, like, look, like, uh, like I went to locals for it, because we were actually lucky enough to have a, a local scene for Pokken tournament back when the game first came out on the Switch. I fucking hated the fact that Krogunk was a character in this game. Because it felt like, it's like, why didn't they just go with Greninja? Greninja was the one that everybody wanted. The fact that Krogunk is fucking Miguel is amazing. Like, watch. That shit right there made me fucking fall in love with Krogunk. Because it's it's Miguel's one-hit KO punch. I fucking adore that. It's so good. He's also got a bit of Ganryu in him. Also, hope you're ready because Blastoise is literally Kuma.
Oh yeah, Sweetkin's also a panda. Also, strangely enough, Scizor is Jack. It's really weird, but it actually fits very well. I'm not gonna lie, seeing this just makes me more upset that Pitmonchan wasn't put in this game because Tekken has a perfectly, has a, an amazing boxing character they could have just pulled moves straight from. They could have turned Hitmonchan into Steve Fox and that would have been absolutely amazing. I'm so upset that that never actually got a chance to be a thing, looking back at it. I mean, yeah, I guess it's kind of also kind of funny that all of the robot characters are used for Scizor. Also, yes, uh, Decidueye's pose is literally Lars. Anyway, that's the point. The point is that using Pokémon as a reference point for designing a, a Pokémon for Smash Brothers doesn't inherently work because you are essentially taking away more from a Tekken character than you are from an actual Pokemon. Yeah, fuck, that's right. Hitmontop, why did they not just put in Hitmontop and make him Eddie Gordo? That was, that was also just like begging to be made. I would adore a Pokémon 2. I would like it if they do do a Pokémon 2 to focus more on the close range combat and less on the field because the field's kind of the thing that a lot of people didn't like. But yeah, we're derailing, so let's get back to it. Togekiss and Spirit Tomb, who don't make as many appearances, will be predominantly innovated. Starting with their jabs, Garchomp can have a three-hit jab that starts with a horizontal claw swipe to the right, then a horizontal claw swipe with the other arm to the left, then ends with a spinning horizontal tail swipe. Togekiss can have a spammable one-hit jab, simply doing a headbutt forward, and Spirit Tomb can solely have a rapid jab, spinning its ethereal body forward to rack up a lot of damage as foes get knocked around by the Spirit. No, Blaziken's Forest Law. Actually, he he he's technically both. Both laws and Paul. It's inside of Spirit Tomb's body. For the dash attacks, Garchomp can do an overhead. For the dash, for her dash attack, Garchomp can turn into Brian Fury. Claw attack from high to low. If this attack connects, it actually knocks into the ground. <laughs> Literally, just show that this is a move used by Brian Fury. Can potentially be used to spike airborne opponents as well. Togekiss can do a halting backflip, one that comes out quick out of its dash and launches foes into the air if it connects at the start of the attack. The rest of the flip is also an attack, but it behaves like a sour spot. It's only the start of the flip that deals the real damage. Spirit Tomb, though, will also do a flip, a front flip specifically this time around, swinging its keystone overhead to slam it hard into the ground in front of itself. I'm trying to think. How does this character move? Like, how does it run? Like, does it just float? If it's if it's floating with the rock behind it, wouldn't the more effective thing be to use the mouth under the body in some way? Spirit Tomb as a whole doesn't really doesn't really act very well as a fighting game character. It's not like like say Chandelure 
who has that while it's mainly just a ball, it has long arms they can use to attack, which is why it, why it doesn't poke him. Um, or Gengar, who, while stubby, has a really long tongue. If it just shovels awkwardly and slams the, slams the stone... I don't know, it, just, it looks weird. It doesn't look properly structured this dash attack has a lot of startup but if it connects it hurts launching foes into lower angles for their side tilts garchomp can use a form of mud slap kicking up a large amount of dirt forward it doesn't launch foes very far but it does cause quite a bit of hit stun togekiss can use a form of pound slapping one of its wings forward horizontally stopping at the peak of the swing this move has a good amount of knockback on it making it a great get off me attack and Spirit Tomb can morph its body into a toothy beast-like state, letting it do a quick bite attack forward. For the up tilts, Garchomp can do a rising kick attack, swinging its foot vertically upward. A move better. I want to say more, but I'm just enamored that, it, that it, it's all just Brian. For hitting foes in front of itself to launch them into the air, Togekiss can start spinning its body vertically, dealing multiple hits of damage to all foes who touch its body, then launch them upward. And Spirit Tomb can. But I will definitely say, um, I think using animations from the Pokedex are a bad idea. I don't think that stuff like that is, is, they aren't attacks. All it did was spin, and then that's it. It also would be extremely low range. I also fail to see how Spiritomb has a ton of range because a lot of these attacks look fairly normal and or short range. Like, it also doesn't help that we never really get a size comparison between what they look like next to actual characters. Because even, like, with my movesets, I'm, movesets, I'm like, oh, this character is around the same size as Ganondorf. Or this character's, like, small, so they're around the same size as, like, Mario. So we, we don't get that. So I can't tell you, like, where does... How high, how wide does this hit? Because I have nothing to compare it to. simply swing its head in an arc from front to back, covering a wide area. For their down tilts, Garchomp can do a variation of breaking swipe, spinning to swing its tail across the ground to pop foes away. Togekiss can do a quick spinning wing sweep, a weaker move, but it pops foes upward, making it decent for combos. And Spirit Tomb, who, by the way, retreats into its keystone whenever it crouches, darts forward. I don't like that. That is, uh... I don't know how I feel about that. Here's the thing. And while I'm not talking about, while I'm not covering those videos today, these videos today, I should mention it. Because it's all, this is also a problem I've seen in other moves that he's made. It's not un uncommon for a character to alter their, you know, height by crouching or you know doing specific things but what you always want to do when designing a fighting game character is that you want everything to be completely and totally readable you need to understand what what is happening to the character at the current moment how you can counter it blah 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 and uh, one of the most egregious examples of that being a problem that I've seen is his imposter move set where... Oh my God, I'm... Sorry, I have... I don't know why. I'm, ga I'm gassy for some reason. His imposter move set, all of his smash attacks have the imposter pop into a hole. And there's no way to physically read what the imposter is going to do. You just have to you just have to cross your fingers and guess. It's 
and it muddies the design. For this, the, the rock most likely is the hit box, the hurt box, while crouching. The rock, compared to the rest of Spiritum, is not even a third of his body. That was the point of the imposter set, but then it was poorly designed. That's all I'm going to say. If, if, if that was the point, then it was poorly designed. Confusion? No, that's... There are better ways to design confusion than literally making the opponent guess. Rock, paper, scissors! Nope! Did you say rock? No, it was scissors. You're dead. No. That's why all the smash attacks in Smash... They give you a clear indication of what the character is going to do at the end of that charge animation. Mario, he bends his body backwards, he's got an arm behind him, and you clearly see him like getting ready to like throw his body forward. Sonic, he does a wind up, he like winds up his fist. At the very end, he releases the punch. Uh, Ridley, when he's doing his forward smash, he like crunches himself in and then at the end of it he bursts outward and releases fire. Like, it tells you everything you need to know about what the character is going to do. If the character pops into a hole and muddies the design, then you and you can't react to it that's bad design but anyways essentially what this what this is saying is that what spiritum is crouched he is a quarter of his size I'm assuming that's what that means. Because look at the size of Spiritomb here compared to the rock. Apparently this here is his hitbox, his hurtbox, while he's crouching. Which also means that this attack would be very hard to react to. Because you have no idea when it's coming. Stone low to the ground, reaching ahead a decent distance to launch foes into lower angles. For the side smash attacks, Garchomp can do Dragon Claw, doing a two hit strike that starts with a diagonal rising claw swipe that deals a lot of hit stun, setting foes up to be destroyed by the follow up strike, which will launch them away. Out of it all could the have been, you could have just made something Pokemon, different Dragon or Claw unique. By far the strongest. Togekiss can use Sky Attack causing its body to glow as it charges, then when released, flies forward a fair distance with a mighty tackle attack. The nasty thing about this move is that it will not stop at ledges, allowing Togekiss to attack into the area over the blast zone, making it a scary edge guarding tool. Speaking of scary, Spirit Tomb will start to show its malicious nature as it... That might be a, bro that might be a Brian attack? No, I don't think it is. Why wouldn't Sky Attack be an up smash? I don't know. Why does the character that they specifically stated has like next to no reach have a smash attack that covers more reach than either of the other two characters? Charges, it hides inside of its keystone. Then on release, pops its enlarging head out to jump scare foes, launching them away. So, again, it shrinks its hurt box while attacking to the point where, now, I'm going to give us the benefit of the doubt and say that this is the only, this is the only smash attack where Spiritomb doesn't go into, doesn't, 
does go back into his rock. And if that is the case, then it's not as egregious as it could be. But again, we're talking about the equivalent. Like let's let's just let's just give a comparison here. We're talking about the equivalent of let's say uh, let's say Corin or Simon Belmont. Someone with a long range attack. We're talking about somebody so essentially what happens is while charging they turn into the size of Kirby. And then randomly resize to attack. Completely crushing their crushing their hurt box down and making it nearly impossible to punish from specific angles. For their up smashes, Garchomp can do a low to high vertical headbutt, using its head like a catapult to scoop up foes in front of it and launch them into the air. That's another Brian move. Do a powerful wing flap to conjure a fairy gust attack right in front of itself, launching all foes caught in the gust straight into the air. Why didn't you just turn that... Turn this that way. Forward smash. Sky attack. Go up in sky. Up smash. I don't know, that's just me. And Spirit Tomb will once again hide inside of its keystone. Okay, no, you know what? Never mind. I took it back. I take it back. It's literally the imposter problem. You can't... It... If you muddy readability between smash attacks, you are actively designing a move that is poorly designed. The player and their opponent need to be completely and totally aware of what each of what one is doing. Readability in fighting games is extremely important. It doesn't matter which one it is. It could be traditional, it could be, could be hyper fires like Marvel vs. Capcom and Guilty Gear, or it could be Smash or it could be a platform fighter like Smash. Readability is extremely important. This is, this is not readability. This is pick a god and pray, is basically what I'd like to describe this as. Rock, paper, scissors. Charges, then when released this time. <laughs> I see that comment, Xenon. There's a reason I saved Isaac for last. Scares foes out of their boots as it jump scares straight upward with its enlarging head. And for their down smashes, Garchomp could use Earthquake, doing a quick leap up, then immediately slamming down into the ground. It's close to what I gave my Garchomp design. The ground up into it was the Earthquake, but it was done differently. Flaps with each wing on both sides of itself, kicking up fairy gusts that shoot outwards to blow foes away. You know, for a character that they specifically said has really poor reach, Tarkus has some really good reach. And Spirit Tomb can use a form of ominous wind, conjuring up ghostly winds that spin all around itself. Foes caught in the wind are swung around, taking constant damage, then are launched away once the wind dissipates. He turns into a pizza. Aerial attacks for Garchomp's neutral air, it can do two quick curled up spins as it sticks its dorsal fin out, launching any foe hit by its fin on contact. Togekiss will do it's close to what I gave my Garchomp as well. Flip, turning its whole body into a hitbox that launches foes on impact. And Spirit Tomb will spin its body as it faces the screen, dealing multi-hitting damage to foes who touch its body, then launches them away at the end of the attack. For their forward aerials, Garchomp can do a simple claw jab forward, a quick move with decent power. <sighs> of all the things you could have given Garchomp for a forward air, you 
gave her this little hit. It's not even part of a bigger attack. It's just this little, like, poke. Garchomp's moves, Garchomp's hands are sides. They're giant claws. Why? Sorry. Uh, I'm curious about something. I haven't seen it in a while, but I'm curious about something. What the hell did I put for Garchomp's forwarder? Neutralize very similar. Oh. I gave her this. Vertical slash. Covers decent range. Combo ender and stock closer. Has decent landing pow has decent landing leg. Also decent startup, you see the numbers there. You know, a move that makes sense. Instead of just... I don't need this anymore, because I've already done talking about Zero. It's just... Poke. Why is it just poke? Togekiss will start spinning its body while horizontal, dealing multiple hits of damage to anyone who touches its body, then launches them forward. And Spirit Tomb can use Nightshade, firing dark beams from its eyes that are shot into opposite diagonal directions, then immediately moves both beams vertically past one another, crossing as they do so. There's a sweet spot on this attack at the moment the beams pass by each other, making them deal more damage and launch foes into straighter angles. Unless you're playing to hit an ant with that sweet spot, that move's range is not long enough for that hit for that kind of sweet spot to work. Like, like for, yeah, this this small area in here is the sweet spot. You have to you have to get a character in between these two beams to be hit here. This would maybe work on someone like Kirby or Pikachu, somebody very small. If you were to try and use this on, like, Captain Falcon, you would never hit the sweet spot. For the back aerials, Garchomp can thrust its dorsal fin straight backward, launching foes on contact. Why? She has an enormous fucking tail! Why would you go for something that's extremely low range? Togekiss will do a quick horizontal flip to kick its feet backward, and Spirit Tomb can spin its keystone while swinging its head behind itself from low to high vertically, morphing into a whip-like state as it does so. For the up aerials, Garchomp can do a backflip to swing its tail overhead from front to back. Well, there's the tail. Rotate! Togekiss can do an overhead headbutt. More its rotate! Head to back to attack with the spines on its head. And Spirit Tomb can morph its body into a spike-like appearance, stabbing itself straight upward. And for their down aerials, Garchomp can do a falling foot drop, descending with some forward momentum with both feet at the front of the attack, 
This move will spike if it connects right at the start of the fall. Togekiss could do an aerial cartwheel to swing its wings downward from front to back, one wing at a time. Togekiss's face is making me is making me laugh internally. And Spirit Tomb could stomp its keystone straight down, a slow but very heavy hitting attack that will spike if it connects properly. <laughs> yeah, they gave he gave her foot dive. Sounds actually horrifying. For their grabs, Garchomp would grab with both claws, having an average grab range compared to the other two, and it pummels by biting its prey. Togekiss would grab foes with fairy magic that it emits from its body, but this results in it having the worst grab range of the three. It pummels by headbutting the foe, and Spirit Tomb would have the greatest grab range, using psychic powers to make for a scary, disjointed grab. It pummels by shocking its prey with ghost powers. For their throws, starting with Garchomp, its forward throw has it punch the foe a few times. <laughs> More Brian Fury! Stronger strike, its back throw can have it lift the foe overhead, then slam them into the ground behind itself, bouncing them back into the air. The up throw can simply have Garchomp toss the foe high into the air with its head. And the down throw can have it use Sand Tomb on the foe, trapping them in a sand vortex that racks up damage, then spits them into the air. For Togekiss's throws, its forward throw can have it blow the foe away with a powerful wing flap. The back throw has it fly behind the foe to strike and launch them away. The up throw has Togekiss fly high. I don't really have anything to say about this. It's, it's it, it, the throws are usually harmless. Back down, smashing the foe into the ground and bouncing them back into the air. And its down throw can have it drill its body into the foe, dealing damage before they're knocked away. And for Spirit Tomb's forward throw, it can shoot its Nightshade Eye Beam, starting from the ground between itself and the foe, but then Spirit Tomb quickly looks up as it fires the beam, scooping the foe up and launching them forward. Whoever mentioned Shuma Garath earlier, there's your Shuma, there's your Shuma reference. It just did Mystic Ray. The back throw can have it warp behind the foe and attack them from behind with a sucker punch to launch them away. The up throw can have it engulf the foe inside of its body, then chucks them upward. And the down throw can have it terrify the foe with a scary face, dealing damage and knocking them away. For Garchomp's neutral special, it could use Sandstorm! This version of the attack will have Garchomp surround its body in sand, giving itself a veil that causes all foes who get too close to Garchomp to take constant chip damage. And that's pretty much the gist of it. It's a self buff. It lasts for around 8 seconds, mm. after which it goes on to a 15 second cooldown. There is pretty much no reason not to always be using this attack, unless your foes are spacing you pretty hard. Because in that case, you wouldn't be able to take full advantage of it, so you gotta be sure you time it properly to get the most out of it. Why? If it's something you can just keep putting up over and over and over again, then there's no real reason to ever properly time it. You just throw it up the moment it ends. Um, I gave Garchomp, uh, Sandstorm as well, but I made it her down special. And essentially the way I designed it was, uh, it basically created an area of spinning sand that if Garchomp stood inside of it, uh, she would basically bypass projectiles. Like, projectiles would just pass through her. Basically referencing her ability Sand Veil. And if opponents try to go in after her to fight her and try to kick her out of it, they would take small passive damage. It was an anti-zoning tool, essentially. Togekiss's neutral special can be Air Slash. It's a very simple move that has Togekiss fire Blades of Wind straight forward. This move acts as a projectile, and while it only deals small flinching damage, it causes a lot of hit stun, making it a nasty move for playing neutral and even nastier if used to edge guard. But what does it matter if the Pokemon using it doesn't have attacks that can take advantage of it? Like, you gave those attacks to the character with the worst range. Wouldn't that be more beneficial to a character that has range and can, you know, or can close the gap in order to, you know, properly make use of it? 
the guard chop and poking his mail because of the notch on the back fin. I know, but this is Cynthia, so I'm calling it her because gar her guard chop is a girl. Speaking Which is exactly why I may I named mine a girl as well. Tomb's neutral special could be spite. This is a special type of counter attack. Spirit Tomb will put itself into a counter state, and if attacked, reduces the damage it would have taken by half. But that's not all. For making Spirit Tomb angry, it spites you by locking out the attack that you hit it with for 10 seconds. Holy shit. 10 seconds. 10 seconds. I would like to just go out of my way to state that there are matches in Smash that where 10 seconds is a third of the timer. People have spawned, gotten comboed, and died in less time than 10 seconds, in-game seconds. Imagine having a counter, imagine hitting Spiritomb with this while they have spied up, and like, for like, your, your forward tilt or forward air. You essentially have lost a major poke tool for what could be essentially considered like a phenomenal amount of time for a stock. That debuff should be like three seconds at most. And that's being generous. Move something that locks out moves should be extremely limited. Something that'll make them panic in the moment. But not something that they'll have to worry about for an extended period of time. Smash Brothers, even in Brawl, even in Brawl, the slowest Smash game, 10 seconds is an extremely long time. Imagine if you hit him with the recovery. You are now locked out of that recovery for... A extremely long amount of time. And if you're not a character who has multiple recovery options, you're fucked. <laughs> essentially. That is disgusting. That is absolutely disgusting. This could easily be a scary tool for While I am I do I absolutely hate the fact that Garchomp is just poking. Spiritum, the Spiritum in this moveset is the worst part of it. It is the worst design aspect of this moveset. I think that he wanted to have this character be the point character, just be in the, this moveset so bad, they didn't really take into account that a lot of what he designed for Spiritum does not work for the role they're trying to fill. Or any role, for that matter. Because, spoiler alert, Spiritomb has another special that's even more egregiously stupidly broken than this. Punishing players who are overly reliant on one attack. It cannot stack, though. If Spiritomb pulls off spite again on an opponent who was already spited, it will just override the first spite in place of the new one. Oh, that's even worse! <laughs> So there's no limit. You lose, you might lose the spite on like your forward air, but immediately you just get shoved onto your back air. It's not like, oh, you have a timer for your all your moves. If you are at like five seconds left when you hit him again with like a back air, then the five seconds that you were had on your forward air gets moved to your back air. No, it's. 10 seconds per move. If you hit him with a different move, the 10 seconds from that move gets shoved onto a different move and there's no time lost. 
That's disgusting. For Garchomp side special, it could use dig. Garchomp burrows underground and dashes straight forward. That's standard. I also gave Garchomp dig. Max distance, a ledge, or if a foe touches its fin, Garchomp will immediately leap out of the ground with its dorsal fin forward as it rises. Any foe hit by Garchomp as it launches out of the ground will be launched straight into the air. Speaking of which, if you initiate this attack while in the air, Garchomp will dive forward at an arc, then will dig under as soon as it reaches the stage, after which it plays out just as described before. It has to touch the stage in order to continue when used out of the air, meaning that if you try using this with no stage below you, you're gonna look like a Monado boy out there. If you use Dig into a platform, Garchomp will just ignore said platform and will keep diving down until it finds solid stage. For Toga... Why not just make it like Sylvanos in Rivals of Aether, where instead of that, if she hits the side of a stage, she just digs into it and appears on top. I don't know if I gave that to Garchomp in my moveset, but if I didn't, I think I should have. Kiss's side special, it could use Sweet Kiss. This has Togekiss dart straight forward to attempt to kiss anyone in its way. If no one was in its way, it just flies the full distance and can start doing any other action aside from Sweet Kiss again if it was used in the air. If there was a foe in its way, Togekiss will stop to give that foe a little smooch, which makes that foe dizzy for a little bit. That's only if it connects on the ground though. If it connects in the air, the foe will just be knocked away. And for speed- What does that mean? Are you saying it's a ranged stun? Are we talking like wave dashing Mewtwo levels of stun? Or is it like your possession idea where all your controls are reversed? It doesn't really specify I also assume it's a command dash Mewtwo's disable, but even that is nuts. The reason disable is so short range is because if it was any longer range, it'd be extremely powerful. Spirit Tomb side special, it could use curse. This has Spirit Tomb morph its head into a needle shape and stabs forwards while its keystone remains in place. Please don't let this be another debuff. Please don't let this be another debuff. Please don't let this be another debuff. Every time it uses this move, Spirit Tomb will take a set 5% damage, regardless of whether it lands or not. But any foe who is hit by it will be cursed for around 20 seconds. <laughs> okay, what? Cursed with what? Effectively being poisoned as they take constant damage up until it wears off. 20 seconds for 5% damage return. That is the equivalent of buying... <laughs> that is the equivalent... Of buying a Ferrari with a scratch ticket. So, let me get this straight. Spiritomb has a counter that will de that will make it so opponents can't use their move, a specific move, the one they hit him with. He also has a 20 second damage over time special that only does 5% damage in return to him, regardless if he lands it or not. I'm assuming that this does also, this also does damage on hit that's it has to be so we're talking of ten, so we're also not given how much damage over time it get, it's given even like 3% per second over 20 seconds is like 60% damage that's a 60% damage to them in return for 5% damage to you. That is way, way too steep.
that move should do serious damage to you. But even then, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go any, this far with a move like that anyways. Like, you all know how they use it in Pokémon? How Gengar uses it? It does massive damage to him, but it's an extremely powerful attack that crumples and is very useful for combos. There's big pain to yourself, but the payoff you get if you land it is also immense. It is, it is a definition of risk versus reward. The risk is apparent. The reward is also extremely apparent. There is no risk behind the reward of a 20 second damage over time effect. I said it before and I'll say it again. Spirit Tomb is the worst designed aspect of this moveset. While I, it's insulting that he doesn't even try with Garchomp, Spirit Tomb is extremely over designed in the worst ways possible. This move does have a bit of startup on it, so it is easy to predict and avoid, but failing to do so will result in constant pain. For the up specials, Garchomps can be Dragon Rush. Yeah, I also Dragon gave Garchomp Dragon Rush. Charge into any chosen direction That's with fine. Immense power, after which it goes into free fall if used in the air. Foes in its way will be dragged along. Fun fact, the animation from, po from Pokemon Unite is the exact same as Pokemon Tournament. If it shoves them straight into the stage. Togekiss's up special can be Fairy Wind, having Togekiss spin upward while surrounding itself in a twister of fairy dust. It's a move that deals very little damage, but a lot of knockback to foes, launching them into the air if they touch any part of the twister. And Spirit Tomb's up special can be Payback. I'm going to warn you right now. While Spirit Tomb's other special moves were bad, like really bad, this one is the worst. I'm not going to say anything until he says what needs to be said, but I want you to listen very well to how this move works. This is the worst one. This is probably the most complicated move in this moveset, so listen up. It has Spirit Tomb teleport into any chosen direction. Then when it reappears its fixed distance away, it does so with a burst of energy that deals damage to all foes hit by it. The damage that it deals, though, is entirely dependent on the amount of damage that Spirit Tomb takes. Payback deals damage equal to the same amount of damage that Spirit Tomb sustained from when it spawned or since it last used Payback. When payback is used, all of that accumulated damage is reset back to zero, and can only deal more damage again once it starts taking more damage. So you can lose that damage quite easily if you find yourself needing to recover often. The accumulated damage can be held when you switch to a different Pokémon, but it cannot accumulate any more until you switch back. Only Spirit Tomb can build up the damage for payback. It can be a scary move if used appropriately. But here's the biggest twist. If you can manage to accumulate 108% of damage, the same number of evil spirits residing within Spirit Tomb, Payback will automatically KO all foes that it hits. This, of course, would be very Stop. 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 This fucker put a TF2 Telefrag as a, as a fighting game attack. So. Essentially what he's saying is, is that this character has a teleport, has a teleport recovery that will deal more damage depending on how much damage they accumulate before they teleport in between teleports. So if he takes 20% and he teleports and then he takes another like like 100%, the 20% that he took before will not be added on to the second payback. It will only deal the only the 100% he takes 
only the 100% he took after the first teleport will count. Now here's the thing. 108% damage for some characters is something they can literally do to you in a single combo. Kazuya will take you to 108% in a single combo. So what you're telling me, and this peeves me as a Kazuya main, is that I beat, I read your neutral mistake. I EWGF, I EWGF combo you off the stage. You are now at like a hundred and thirty something percent from zero because you made a because you made a crucial mistake. Because you lost that mistake, you are now in possession of an attack that, if I am not careful, will instantaneously kill me. Why 108 specifically? Because because Spirit Tomb has 108 souls in its body. I'm pretty sure he'll mention that. Why well, on pause? I would also like to mention that all this stuff that's being listed for Spirit Tomb, this is your point character. This is the character you're playing at, playing as the most at the beginning of a match. This is the character that they want you to play at the beginning. A extremely heavy, long-range fighter with a with a move canceling counter that will cancel moves for 10 seconds, a 20 second damage over time effect, and a teleport recovery that has the potential to instantly kill. Why in the hell would I ever swap off of Spirit Tomb? Why would I ever swap off of Spirit Tomb? If he has all this, then the two other members of the team do not matter. They are nothing. This makes Ultimate Launch Ivysaur look like a toddler in comparison to how powerful one form is compared to the rest of them. This, this character has a teleport thwack that is a guaranteed instant kill. That is insane. Garchomp could be Garchomp could be way better. Togekiss feels like there wasn't much thought put into the move set because again, all she does is spam. But Spiritum is the worst. Spiritum could probably work as a smash fighter if you really poured your heart and soul into the design. But whatever this is, is not it. This is a character that is extremely heavy. Has, I would assume, disjoints. Like, I don't know what part of its body would count as a disjoint, but I'm assuming parts of its body are probably disjointed. I wouldn't be surprised if he just said, fuck it, the entire head is a disjoint and the only thing that isn't disjoint is the rock. The tiny little rock at the bottom. But anyways... This is a very heavy character with notable range, extremely oppressive special moves, smash attacks that are nearly, two smash attacks that are nearly impossible to read properly. He can shrink to a quarter of his size by crouching. There is no reason for me to ever switch to any of the other Pokemon with a design like that. There's none. Spiritomb is the best choice for every situation. Because even when you're losing, you can just win.
difficult to pull off without some serious attention or some dumb luck. No, it wouldn't because you essentially gave it to somebody a move that is an instant kill for literally losing. Now, granted, they've done that before. Lucario's Aura is a perfect example of that. But, at least with Lucario's Aura, you still have to... You still have to chase down and fight and, you know, actually land those hits. If Spirit Tomb lands one attack after being wailed on, he wins. Since it requires you to take all of that damage as Spirit Tomb only, you can't switch and you also can't use payback, it's only recovery option in case you didn't realize, at all until you reach that number. But that doesn't matter because he's the heaviest character. You, you put this on a character that can take a beating. Of all the characters in this kit, I, I expect Spirit Tomb to be the one that would survive that. This isn't all a glass cannon. This is on a character that is an immovable object. I'm assuming this character is a super heavyweight. If Garchomp was 107, I'm assuming that, that Spirit Tomb is like 120 something. You need exactly 108? No, I don't think you do. I think that 108 is the limit. Plus, if it misses, you're out of luck. You don't get a second chance. You gotta reaccumulate the damage. That's... <laughs> hmm. Do I instant kill or do I live? I win both times. There is no downside for me in this, in this conversation. That's not a downside. If you miss... The point is that the opponent is probably going to be so far away from you that they won't, they won't be able to punish you because they know that if they get too close to you, when you have that, they're going to die. On top of that, there's no real way to keep track of how much damage you've accumulated unless you use your damage percent as a... He said specifically 108%. He said, he said that if you accumulate that much, he didn't say whether or not... It goes up from there. I'm assuming that 108% is the maximum limit to how to what this move calculates for its maximum damage. Like, if I'm at 50% and I'm taking to 168% or higher than that, I'm assuming that the 108% that I've accumulated counts towards the instant kill. And there's nothing in this video that says otherwise. And if it is, and if that is the case, that's also fucking stupid. Because the chances of you having specifically 108% damage are next to impossible. And even then, unless you're really good at math on the go, most people would only be able to do so starting at 0%. Kids, if you can't count to 108 where well, you can't, you know, add 108 to like 20 or 30 something, whatever damage. You shouldn't be playing fighting games. In any which case, lastly, the down special is of course the Pokemon change, with the rotation being from Spirit Tomb to Togekiss to Garchomp, then back to Spirit Tomb. This is irrelevant because you will never need to switch off of this creepy fucker right here. God damn it, Stinky, you almost made me choke. God damn it, you almost made me choke. But that's funny. For Cynthia's okay. So. Pardon me. I'm eating a little something so that I don't get a headache while talking through this again.
So, the design aspect of a Pokemon trainer is, you know, balance between three Pokemon. You know, the point, the middle, the anchor. They all provide unique buffs, weaknesses, and they complement each other. And there's always a reason to continue to swap. There's always a reason to use, to use all three of them, but you're more than capable of using one to do the best. So, what if we said, fuck that design aspect, and we added in a fourth Pokemon for the Final Smash that has nothing to do with anything that you've done or any of the characters you've been controlling. You have essentially thrown away the balance of three characters. Balance in quotes. And basically said, look at this new fourth Pokemon that I possess. Isn't it amazing? It's going to kill you now. All of the all of Brawl fans Pokemon Trainer movesets do this. Except for maybe Jodo. I think he was smart enough to keep the, a triple a triple finish styled super. I do not remember. It's been a long time. But I know for a fact that for the Hoenn trainer, she uses Rayquaza. For the Unovan trainer, she uses Giratina. And the Unovan trainer... Sorry. Hoenn trainer uses Rayquaza. Sinnoh uses Giratina. Unova uses, I believe, Kiram. Reading as he say, well, here's the thing. Whether or not he hates it, it's the best combination. It's the best way to go about it. Because what is it? What is the final smash? All three Pokemon working together to do a big final attack. Could it be done more flashy? Sure. Could it be done? Could it be designed a little bit better? If you want to go that far, sure. Why not? But the point is that. The Final Smash is all three Pokemon working together in unison, just like the moveset. Because what is the point of the Pokemon Trainer? Three characters balancing each other out to achieve victory. I don't care if he calls it boring. It's much better than shoving in a fourth Pokemon and saying... Summon Great Quasar, do Big Beam. Because that's essentially what it is. You are saying fuck you to the design that you have for these three Pokemon. And saying, I like this better. It has nothing to do with anything to do with the design aspect I just spent this entire video talking about. But I like this more. It ruins the character. It ruins them. Now... For Cynthia, he did something different than that. Arguably, it's worse than just summoning a fourth Pokemon. I'm going to let him speak and say it, say the rest of it. But all I'm going to say is that it's bad. And chances are high, you know exactly what it is. If you know anything about Cynthia. Final smash. Thank she you for screaming my ear. Garchomp, the Pokemon that instills fear in all trainers who face it. Yes, instead of flipping the bird to the entire build and throwing in a fourth Pokemon, we are now flipping the bird to two thirds of the move set and saying no, Garchomp. <laughs> Garchomp wasn't active. She calls back her current Pokemon to bring it out. And once it's there, she activates Mega Evolution to turn it into Mega Garchomp. Mega Garchomp then dash- God, Mega Garchomp is ugly. And you all know the funniest aspect of this? Mega Garchomp is worse than, than regular Garchomp as a Pokemon because it's slower. Regular Garchomp is a way better competitive Pokemon than Mega Garchomp is. 
So essentially what this design is, is I'm going to take the best Pokemon Cynthia has and I'm going to make it worse. Just forward with a powerful claw slash and if it can catch a single foe, it begins barraging that foe with an outrage of attacks. Racking up tons of damage, then finishing things up with one final powerful strike to launch them away. After which, Garchomp reverts back to normal, and if it wasn't the active Pokemon, it's then replaced with whoever was out when the final smash was initiated. Why not just have the other two Pokemon help fight alongside Mega Garchomp? Like, is that so hard? They could just... They could provide assistance, you know, the fact that this is a single, this isn't a single character, this isn't a, you know, this isn't a Garchomp moveset, this is a Pokemon trainer style moveset. You basically just throw away two thirds of the moveset in favor of the more popular choice, to which I just ask, why didn't you just make a moveset for Garchomp on her own? If this is what you were going to resort to, why not just make it Garchomp? That's what I did. That's one of the main reasons I did it. It's because obviously Cynthia Cynthia has clear favoritism for Garchomp, and the biggest aspect of her of her team and of her history and and popularity is this terrifying creature. I also find it very funny that he keep that he references the fact that Spiritomb is the aspect of of uh, Cynthia being scary when nobody is scared of her spirit tomb and everybody shits bricks at the sight of her Garchomp. Garchomp is a bit overused for Smash Bros. concepts. She's popular. She's, my, she's tied for my favorite Pokemon of all time. You will never hear me say anything bad about Garchomp. And honestly, she's popular enough that you could put her in at any point and it would make complete and total sense. She's like Gengar in that regard. There are many Pokemon out there that you could just put them in to Smash at any point and it would make complete and total sense because they're going to be more popular than whatever the current popular trend is in a few years. Gengar is still obscenely popular. Garchomp is still obscenely popular. All these Pokemon, they have stood the test of time and have these big iconic designs and spots in the hearts of all these Pokemon players. You could put, you could put Garchomp in Smash in like, like 10 years. And I don't think a single person would bat an eye. They'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. Garchomp's awesome. Or, or Gengar, for that matter. Who's the other one of your favorite Pokemon? Weavile. It's basically Weavile and Garchomp. Weavile I like a little bit more, but Garchomp is right there. But yeah, I don't think, this moveset doesn't work for a multitude of reasons. The Garchomp aspect is literally just poking, which in turn, it turns her into more Brian Fury than an actual Garchomp. Togekiss is very simplistic and not well thought out. Some moves don't make sense. Why the character with the worst range has a super long range forward smash that can go off stage the edge guard, I don't know. Why does she have a long range projectile with a ton of hit with hits done? I don't know. But Spirit Tomb is the thing that makes this moveset the worst. One of the worst. I just feel that after that final smash, 
they should have the just has the Pokemon in their normal colors can be si they should have just made a Garchomp moveset. But that's just me. Because, honestly, as cool as Cynthia is, and she does have a really cool team, most people would probably play her simply just play Garchomp. Because Garchomp is, again, that popular. And then, of course, you would have the people that play Spiritomb because it's absolutely fucking broken. It's funny how Spiritomb's so bad that we overlooked how Togekiss had Mewtwo disabled as a command dash. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Togekiss kind of got buried. Like, Spiritomb was so bad and, and Garchomp was so generic that, yeah, it's kind of funny that... Sorry, just the spin. The, just the fact that Togekiss is just there. It doesn't really have anything, like, you know, super great about it. Except that, that's fine. And then you had to ruin the moment. Since spins a bit. And finally, for the victory animations, Cynthia's first can show her standing there with her hair flowing in the wind, referencing her platinum version sprite. Garchomp during this would jump in from the back and roar to the sky. Togekiss would perch itself next I'm to curious the as to whether or not he gave camera. her the it's Brian soon, Fury laugh. That'd be very funny. Laughter. The second victory animation would reference Cynthia's black and white two sprites, showing her with her hand at her chin, but then holds her arm forward to pose. Garchomp during this one would jump out of the ground, then pose. Togekiss would fly in with some spins, then pose in midair. And Spear- Why is Togekiss the only spins? I swear to god, this character spins more than Sonic. I- I- like, I know, we've been, as we said, we've been focusing more on Garchomp and Spiritomb because Garchomp's generic and Spiritomb is horrible. But I swear to God, is Togekiss literally like 80% spinning moves? I swear. That's what it feels like. Why is Togekiss the Vine Sauce Pokemon on this team? She literally spins more than Sonic, and people say Sonic already spins too much. Tomb would do a flip while inside the Keystone, then pop out for a mini jump scare. And for their final victory animations, these would be the poses where Cynthia interacts with her Pokemon. With Garchomp, Cynthia would be shown. Tokus is a steel chin, ball run character pose. with all this with spin. Togekiss, Cynthia would watch as it flies around her, then Togekiss would come up to her and give her a. Would come up to her and spin her around. Hug. And with Spiritomb, we would just see it retracting back into its keystone, and Cynthia would sit down to place her hand on it while giving a gentle smile. <sighs> I felt like I needed to talk about at least one Pokemon Trainer character that he's made. Like, I felt that it had to happen. And, honestly, looking back at it, there were things I was I wanted to talk about that got completely overwritten by just, by being reminded how bad Spiritomb is. That smile is because she knows she just cheated you out of a win. Yes, my son. Kill them all. As well as channel emotes, you can guarantee that your name appears in my videos or even get the option of knowing what what if characters are coming up next a week in advance. They'll never if nerf you. They're too busy complaining about or, Steve. If you have a character that you want to see be given a possible Smash move set, or a Pokemon that you want to see be given a possible Unite move set, leave a comment down below. An actual man of the society. Who's next? 
Okay, so we've gone through three characters so far that are, well, bad. I they really haven't really they haven't really scraped the bottom of the barrel. These next two characters are the bottom of the barrel. The next one is a character I would I would describe as one of his like bottom five worst move sets. The final character is his worst one ever. Like, this is the point where we're going to get into things that are really bad. And it's probably going to be a point, the part where I start talking a lot more. Hang on a second. Sorry, phone call. Um, next is Evie. And Evie, oh my sweet baby Jesus. Evie is a monster. This one might kill me. <laughs> this video might kill me. We might not get to Isaac today. Because there's so much to say about Evie. Evie... is what I would describe as rancid. While, while the movesets I've shown so far are flawed in their design philosophy and there are things that clearly don't work, there's still aspects, aspects of them that do work. Nothing about EV works. This concept is fucked, to say the least. And again, it gets worse. But we're not talking about him yet. Am I a chance going to do his Unite concepts? No, his Unite, con his Unite concepts are harmless. I have nothing really to say about them. The only thing I'll say is that it's really funny that he's doing this series of Unite Concepts, and the two people he's brought on for, as guests, the movesets that they've made, outclass his in every single regard. Crashy's Rillaboom is the best move, is the best Unite Concept on his channel. Easily bar none. And the, and the Scizor that came, that also came along, but from that other guy, that's, that's second place. They're both way better than the stuff he came up with. I just think that that's funny. But no, I'm not going to review his Unite movesets. Because for the most part, they're harmless. Hello. I'll be thankful I didn't do a vi like an early video of his that had Realm Wars doing the fucking voices. I was like very tempted to do a Klonoa at some like as an extra if we got through this quickly. Because, okay, first off, we're not going to do it because we're already almost six hours in and we're only getting to Eevee now. But there are parts in that video where I thought my ears were going to bleed. That's all I'm going to say. Okay, so... As you can tell by the intro, this Eevee is rooted in Le Pokemon Let's Go as a base. And that's not a problem. I used some aspects of Let's Go as well for my Eevee design. 
but I like to call this video how not to design a composite character. And if you're wondering what a composite character is, a composite character is essentially a character that takes many aspects and puts them together. Kirby, by extent, is a composite character because he can absorb the special moves of all characters in the roster. But if you want a better example of a composite character, Mr. Game & Watch is a composite character. Duck Hunt is a, is a composite character. What you are about to see is one of the worst designs I've ever seen. And I'm not going to sugarcoat this one like I did the others. And one of the reasons I'm not going to sugarcoat this is because I have been told by people that this is what, this is what they consider the ideal EV design. And it scares me. You're right, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You'd think so, Blandaid, but it actually goes worse than that. ...to stand side by side with even the likes of Pikachu. Known for its irregular genetic code, Eevee is a Pokemon that's able to adapt to any environment by being the only Pokemon capable of evolving into one of up to eight different types of Pokemon. And we still don't know whether it has more possibilities than even that. Despite looking so plain, I feel its personal traits and its grandstanding as a side mascot have earned it the chance to stand on its own four feet when being given a theoretical what-if moveset for Super Smash Brothers. No trainer this time, folks! Eevee will be showing off what it can do all on its own. I'm going to, by the way, I know the ideal thing, it's like, the fact that there have been so many whatever. I'm going to assume that they didn't see mine. Or, or EV concepts from anyone else. Pokemon just seems completely unnecessary. So, getting right into things, EV would be a fairly lightweight Pokemon. It have two jumps, and it would be able to crawl. So it's basically Pikachu on all fours. Eevee's basic attacks would be fairly, well, basic. Not too hard to imagine since it is supposed to be the. The fuck was that Simpsons hand? So, starting with its jab, it can have a one-hit spammable jab that mimics its Let's Go counterpart. A quick and simple... Yeah, I also gave Eevee a, a, a jab like that. ...plunging tackle attack. The same kind that we see in its 3D game animations, as well as what we see Eevee do as a Pokeball summon in Ultimate. The side tilt can have it use double kick, quickly turning around to do a horse kick with both feet. I don't remember a lot of what my Eevee attacks were. ...an offensive version of Tail Whip, having Eevee swing its tail... But I want you to remember all of these attacks because they will they will come back later and it will prove how flawed this design truly is at its core overhead from back to front and it's down tilt can have it use an offensive version of sand attack which i guess would just be mud slap but whatever it has ev quickly kick sand forwards it's not very strong but it has some good disjoint and it can rack up damage on foes quickly if they're not careful for Eevee's side smash, it can charge forwards with a powerful lunge to use VV Volley. It's sure hit attack from Pokemon Let's Go Eevee. While it obviously isn't a sure hit A lot of these attacks are generic and I don't really have much to say about them. They're not egregious at face value. They're more egregious when you learn what they go into later on. The attack that never misses as its user shoots a barrage of stars. Again, this isn't a sure hit move, but there will be lots of stars. Eevee creates a vortex of stars around itself that spin upwards. Any foe hit by the stars will be caught in the attack, taking multi-hitting damage, then be launched towards the stars in the sky at the end of the move. And the down smash could also have it use swift, though this time Eevee will spin on the ground while the swift stars spin all around its body horizontally. Like the up smash, it deals- Wouldn't it be better to just have Eevee do a flop and then the stars pop out of the ground from the force? 
How does Evie spin around at maximum speed? Like, I want you to do me a favor. I want... Let, actually, no, this is... That'd be really weird. I was about to say, get on your floor. Try to turn around as quickly as you possibly can. You're not going to be able to do it. Difficulty hitting damage, then launches with the final hit, though it doesn't send both skywards. It actually launches them at lower. Same way Wario does it. Wario spins on his back. Eevee here is spinning on their side. Won't be seeing any stars in the sky, but they'll certainly still be seeing stars. The neutral aerial can have Eevee spin in multiple curled up circles. A move with not a lot of range, but any foe that touches Eevee's body during it will be launched on contact. The idea for this attack came from one of Eevee's physical attack animations from the Pokemon Stadium game. Okay. Perfect time to talk about this. When you are designing a fighting game character that has a bunch of spin-off appearances, using spin-off appearances as source material for your fighting game is a massive no-no. You are at essentially pushing for something that advertises something that's not even in circulation anymore. And has little to no bearing on what the actual product is. Which is, you know, Pokemon. The actual main t series games. It's the equivalent of people saying, I want Grovile from Pokemon, but they only use references from Mystery Dungeon. It would never happen that way. There would be next to nothing if if not any at all references to Mystery Dungeon if they put Grovile in a Smash game. Because it doesn't represent Pokemon. It's its own thing. And it's also something that's completely out of circulation, not something that they would want to advertise. Now, for some people that do know about animations in Smash, you're probably going to bring up one attack in particular... And I'm gonna. I'm going to state my point on it. Mewtwo's forward smash animation is very similar to an to an attack animation he does in Pokemon Stadium. Now, that is true. the The style of animation is very similar. But, hear me out. Let me let me tell you as to why I think that's the case. Why this was why this why it is the way that why it is that way. For those that aren't aware, Mewtwo was going to be in Smash 64. Mewtwo was dropped somewhere through development, and essentially was they didn't have enough time to finish him. Same with Bowser and King DED. But Mewtwo was the one out of all those three that had the most design done. I'm going to guess that the animation from Pokemon Stadium was the exact same animation that would have been used in Smash. Like they just plucked it and threw it onto a Smash 64 model as a means of saving time. Now, as a theory, I'm not going to say it's anything other than a theory, but... In my opinion, it makes complete and total sense as to how that design is something something from a spin-off game. Weren't Marth Gan and Dwarf and Peach also going to be in 64? There was a bunch of talk about characters getting into 64, but the only ones that were ever confirmed were Mewtwo, Bowser, and Duty. Are they aren't they Easter eggs? No. Also, just to state, you could do something unique. Is it really necessary that it has to be specifically from Pokemon Stadium? And this isn't the only one. The forward air can be a forward somersault to have Eevee swing its tail from high to low forward. The back air can be a quick force kick backwards, stretching both legs straight back. The up air can have Eevee backflip to swing its tail overhead from front to back. And the down air can have Eevee wag its tail multiple times down. You see? Tail multi -hitting damage, then launch goes afterwards. This comes from another animation that Eevee does for certain attacks in the stadium games. Is that really necessary? 
You couldn't have just come up with something complete, something unique that makes more sense. Evie would grab foes by biting them, then bite down harder to pummel. The forward throw can just have Evie headbutt the foe forwards. The back throw can have Evie do a jumping twist to toss the foe backwards. The up throw can have Evie headbutt the foe into the air. And the down throw can simply have Evie slam the foe into the ground to bounce them away. So, yeah, Evie does have some fairly... You could do that and nobody would think about it? That's true. But the point is that why reference it when you can make an attack that would fit better yourself? I don't know what I used for my down air. But I'm pretty sure it was better than that. But yes, I hope you're prepared. Because that face on the bottom left is exactly how I feel about the rest of this video. It is an extremely simple, normal type Pokemon after all. That said, let's move from one extreme to the other. Because Eevee's special attacks are anything but generic. As I'm sure most anyone who's even somewhat familiar with Super Smash Bros. are aware, the average Smash character has a total of four special attacks. The neutral special, the side special, the up special, and the down special. But Eevee, despite being so basic, is anything but average. Just like how it has more evolutions than any other Pokemon, it also has more special attacks than most other Smash Fighters. Spoiler alert. Essentially, the design aspect is, think Kazuya's normals on his specials. With, you know, the eight different directions leading to eight different attacks. Yeah, that's exactly what this is. Not four, not five, but eight total special attacks with these eight specials being the eight unique and ridiculously named attacks that can be taught to Eevee in Pokemon Let's Go Eevee. Oh yeah, I hope you're ready for the video to literally stop every time he mentions the name of these special moves. Now, I'm gonna say this I'm gonna say this ahead of time so I don't have to pause and say it later. Yes, the names of these attacks are bad. It's common consensus that they are stupid poor and poorly thought out and clearly thought of by somebody that was probably in an internship but did you mind what Kazuya did? I main Kazuya <laughs> of course I don't I love it I wish more characters did stuff like Kazuya but yeah, we have no idea who it was that named them. And if we do, I don't know who it was, and I can't say it off the top of my head. But the point is that, yes, these names clearly have... These attacks clearly have names that are made by somebody that doesn't actively work on Pokemon. They are dumb names. They're designed to rhyme. Most of the time. Essentially, yes, they're stupid, but they're only in Let's Go. The first of these attacks, which you use by inputting straight forward special, will be the fire type attack, Sidley Side. <laughs> oh, it begins. This simply has. You're going to see that eight different times. I hope you're prepared for it. As EV charged straight forward while engulfed in fire. A great move to charge in on foes, as well as for horizontal recovery. The next move is used by inputting diagonally forward down in special. This has Eevee use the water type Bouncy Bubble. Using Bouncy Bubble is probably the least egregious name on this list. I'm just going to say that right now. It's probably the least egregious and doesn't require you to stop the music and partially chuckle at it. This will have Eevee conjure a bubbling puddle on the ground in front of itself. Any foe hit by these bubbles will take damage, and Eevee will then heal by half of the damage that was dealt. Oh boy. So, Eevee's entire shtick is that it has eight special moves. They all provide unique buffs and and stuff. Forward, forward special is Sizzly Slide, a charging attack. 
Down, down forward special is Bouncy Bubble, a move that heals Eevee for some fucking reason. And yes, I know it heals in Let's Go. I, I got Eevee. Between my friends and I, I was the one that got Eevee. Probably still the best choice to make, but I know that it heals. I know I don't know how all these moves actually work. The point is that it doesn't really it doesn't really you know work shouldn't work one for one in the fighting game. Healing in fighting games is something that needs to be done extremely limitedly and extremely carefully. Healing effects can absolutely one hundred percent break a fighting game if they're done poorly. If you want an example of that, go look up footage of Elena in Ultra Street Fighter 4. Somebody on that development team thought it would be a really good idea to give Elena a healing special, a healing super. And it ruined Ultra Street Fighter 4. I'm pretty sure they nerfed it several times, but it still, it still ruined Ultra Street Fighter 4. Then by inputting Bagley forward up in special, Eevee will use the electric type Buzzy Buzz. This is Eevee's only projectile attack that hasn't fired an orb of electricity straight forwards, and any foe hit by this orb will be stunned in place for a bit before being launched. Next, wouldn't it be more effective to have that on the forward? Or hell, just have that be the standard special. I should also mention that I don't think there... Oh wait, there is a standard special later on. I'll get to that. But the point is that I want you to imagine having to put a standard special on a controller and not expect to have the person accidentally jump forward. Like for those of you that use a GameCube controller like myself, and it's in close vicinity to yourself, pick up your controller and look at it and hold it up and forward. That's gonna make that's gonna make Eevee jump. And considering the problems that Smash has recently had with with uh, buffering its moves, yeah, you're gonna run into some issues with a projectile on that input. Was it bad? No, she. it was only in Street Fighter 4. Ultra Street Fighter 4. By inputting straight down in special, I don't think she had it in... Fatty bad. Oh, what are these names? This has oh, what is this comedy? This has a small explosion of dark energy from its body that extends outwards to deal damage to nearby opponents. While using this move, Eevee will also gain super armor and will take half damage from all non-projectile attacks. Then by inputting so back it's back it's down. essentially it's essentially Zongief's B skill, where he flexes and takes half damage. Is that really something that Eevee needs? Well, Eevee will use the psychic type Glitzy Glow. This move is the same yet also the opposite of Batty Bad. It has Eevee release an explosion to hurt foes, except this time it's psychic energy. And it gives Eevee the same kind of effects while being used, except this one only applies to projectiles, having Eevee armor and take half damage from all projectile attacks only. Then by using but, straight back in special, Eevee uses the I So you have So you essentially have two focus attacks. One for physical, one for special. And they're both right next to each other on the input. And yeah, I agree. Why not just make it reflect at that rate? Not everybody plays with a GameCube controller. Not everybody has the luxury of having a having an analog stick outline that locks into one of the eight positions when you push it. This moves this the, those two moves would more than likely be mismatched a ton if this was an actual design. It's tight, breezy frost. 
This has a Conduit Icicle in front of itself that stabs upwards. It shoots foes into the air and has a chance to freeze foes who are at higher damage percents. It also deals a high amount of shield damage, but it does also have a bit more start lag than the other attacks. Next, by pressing diagonally back up in special, Eevee will use the grass type move, Sappy Seed. For this move, Eevee grows a stalk under itself that raises Eevee as it grows, and after reaching its peak height, it drops seeds downwards that can hurt foes. The stalk grows decently high, and it acts as a temporary platform, so Eevee can move while it grows, allowing it to be used for recovery. Also, yes, it can be used in the air. Just pretend a little floating piece of land appears for it to grow out of. But it can only be used in the air once, so Eevee has to touch the stage before Sappy Seed can be used in the air again. If you wanted to do it more creatively than that, you could have it so that the, that the sprout pops out of the bottom of the stage, curls around, and helps Eevee recover. But that's just me. And for Eevee's final special attack, Used simply by inputting straight up in special, Eevee will use the fairy type move. Sparkly Swerve! Okay. I feel like whoever it was that came up with these names had to have been, like, really proud of them or something, because, jeez. Gee, the person who came up with this comedy routine has to be really proud of it because he's only done it eight times in the past two minutes. Anyways, this has Eevee conjure a small twister of fairy wind around its body that propels Eevee straight upwards. So of course it can be used for vertical recovery, but this is also the one move that will force Eevee into freefall. Though, foes who get caught in the twister will take some damage, then be launched when the attack concludes. Now to help make using all these attacks a bit more streamlined, and to avoid input command accidents, the attacks will only come out while you hold the control stick into the proper direction, and when you actually let the special button go. In other words, pressing or holding the button down, even when pointing the control stick, won't initiate the attack. Oh dear sweet Jesus. I'm not even going to get into how bad that is considering the fact of, you know, again, buffers. And the fact that there's a good chance that that's the way it's designed. The game will eat your input and you'll die if you're off stage. But just, oh my dear sweet Jesus. I'm not here to I'm not here to make you laugh, James. I'm I'm here to show you why this isn't very well designed. I have some dry wit to my name, but I'm not here. I'm not a comedian. While holding the control stick into a direction when the attack will be used. In fact, to make it even easier, holding the button down will pull up a grid that shows all the types, and pointing the control stick will make the corresponding type on the grid glow, signifying which attack will be used when you let the button go. So I guess you could consider that grid to be the neutral special, since. Okay. What if you simply just tap the button? That's something that needs to be considered. This says that if you hold it, it brings up a grid. Well, if I'm recovering, I don't want a grid. I want a recovery option. Because if I don't get that recovery option, I'm going to die. holding the button down by itself does is pull up that grid. Well, okay, that's not totally true. Calling it a grid is only half accurate, since it does make it easier to keep track of what attacks you're trying to use, though more precisely, what it should be called is a meter. Prepare yourself. This is about to go from bad to worse. This meter keeps track of how often you use certain special attacks by slowly filling up with the color of that type each time you use that type of attack. I may not need to say this, but for those who aren't familiar with today's topic, there is actually significance to the types of all eight of Eevee's hilariously named attacks. 
they correspond to the types of Eevee's eight evolutions. And if you use one of a certain attack enough times, let's say a minimum of ten times... Minimum of ten times. I want you to keep that number in your head because it's very important. So essentially, what he's saying is, you know where this is going. I know where this is going, you know where this is going. If you want to evolve into the evolution of your choice, you have to freaking use the move that you want to evolve, that, that corresponds to the Pokemon you want to evolve into, ten times. Now, I want you to also keep in mind about end leg startup time potentially being punished. Do the, do these count even if I don't hit anything? What if I'm what if I'm countered immediately? This is a this is a mechanic that takes away all creative freedom from you, the player, and basically forces you to do a set of tasks. You are forced to do this. Now, he does mention later on there is another way to charge this meter. But I'm going to just let you know ahead of time, it does not help. If anything, it's worse than this. Essentially, if you want to evolve into Sylveon, you have to waste your time using your recovery special ten times. The length and strength of these moves makes it very unfair for people to want to swap into specific evolutions. Like fairy, grass, and ice, specifically, are, are some of the worst. Meanwhile, psychic and dark are some of the fastest, because I'm assuming that these are really quick moves that you could spam over and over again in order to get the result that you want. And then you have the three forward options that would have notable, would have long hit, they would have uh, long recovery times, long animations, and take forever to fill. You are being punished for wanting to play as Vaporeon, as Jolteon, as Sylveon, as Leafeon, or as Glaceon. If you want to be Espeon or Umbreon, you get a free pass. It's not fun for anybody involved. When I designed my my concept for Eevee evolving, I simply just made it XP, you gain XP by dealing damage, evolve into whatever the fuck you want. And that's the way it should be. Because it's free for, it lets the player play however they want, and get rewarded for it. And once they've reached the maximum of what that reward can be, they can cash it out and become an Eevee Lucian of their choice, or stay as Eevee. There's also more... It problems with Eevee that I will get into later on, but essentially, this concept sucks. You are forcing the player to do what you want them to. There is no creative freedom. You are forced to do this if you want to evolve. Which would be enough to fill that part of the meter to full, then Eevee will evolve. Also, you miss input for the back special and forward specials, you level up the wrong stat. That's true! Vaporeon! Jolteon! Flareon! Espeon! Umbreon! Leafeon! Glaceon! And Sylveon! Eevee can take the form of one of these stronger Pokemon once one of the meters on the grid max. Did you catch that? He said stronger Pokemon. Just keep that in the back of your mind for the next two minutes. Is out. And once that happens, then that will be the Pokemon that you'll be playing as for the remainder of the match. Something I failed to mention earlier, Eevee will be a naturally weak character compared to the rest of the Smash roster. 
Another aspect of character design that I'm going to teach you about, nobody wants to play as an inherently weak character. Nobody wants to play as a character that is defined as weak compared to everybody else by purposeful design. Nobody wants that. There are characters in Smash and in other fighting games that start with limited options, but they quickly grow and they learn things as the match goes on and they essentially become way better than they already are. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give you an example with one of my favorite fighting game characters of all time and my main in the last Blaze Blue game to come out back in 2016. Holy shit, it's been so long. Susano. I adore this character. This character is amazing. He's really fun to play. His hits are very satisfying to land. And everything about him is great. I love him. He's the only character that's ever made me drop a main in Blaze Blue. However, as you see right here, Susano's main mechanic is that he has a bunch of special moves. But he, o he starts the match with only the first special move unlocked. And essentially what happens is every time you deal damage with one of your three normal hits, the cursor will like move up this and essentially highlight it. And it will move through them the more and more you deal damage. You start with no icons highlighted. So essentially when you use his normal drive, which is the which is the fourth main attack button in guilt in I almost a guilty gear, in Blaze Blue you unlock that special. And some of them have higher levels that you unlock by like doing it over and over and over again. The character starts limited and you, and you slowly and slowly build this character into a monster. But here's the thing. Susano starts with limited specials. But Susano at the beginning of a match is not weak. His damage output on his normals, all this, is the exact same. So there are aspects of the character that you have to work to unlock, but everything at his core is still immensely powerful. When I designed Eevee, I designed Eevee as the middle of the road all-rounder option that, compared to all the options that you could get by evolving, had no substantial upsides, but no substantial downsides. All the evolutions had buffs compared to Eevee, but they also had nerfs. They were worse than Eevee in certain, in certain ways. Like... <clears throat> like, Jolteon was the fastest by a notable margin, but it was notably lighter and way easier to kill than Eevee. Or Flareon was all close range damage, but in turn had like next to no range. And so on and so forth mixed between them. The point is that each evolution was was a was a deal. You weren't getting everything better. You were choosing to make one aspect of the character notably stronger. With Vaporeon, it was reach and stage control. With Jolteon, it was speed. With Flareon, it was power. With Espeon, it is it is mix-ups. With Umbreon, it is durability. With Leafeon, it is grounded superiority. With Glaceon, it is being a, a glass cannon zoner. And Sylveon was a Rekka special user. They basically, she had 
specials that could convert themselves into other specials by putting in the attack multiple times. If you used it before the attack animation ended. But those, but those attacks in turn were much slower and much more dangerous if you whiffed or, or they were blocked. Your, t your gimmick for Tom Nook was task the player needed to complete. That's true. But while that's the case, it was constantly cycling them out every few seconds. Like every like five or so seconds. So if you got one you didn't want to do, then it would swap it out with another one almost instantaneously. Not to mention, it only really affected one aspect of his moveset. It didn't really take away from anything that the character could do as a whole. It's different. That's not telling you to try some, that's not telling you to play this a specific way. It's try something new. Sprinkle in a little bit of uniqueness to your current play style. Meanwhile, this is if you want to be Vaporeon, you better use that move 10 times or you're not getting it. So ideally, you want to evolve it to make it stronger. Of course, each of Eevee's evolutions have their own strengths and weaknesses, each with new kinds of playstyles in mind. So this is literally a moveset that caters to a wider variety of people. Is there anything good I can say about this? I said, I've said, I said good things about Dark Matter Zero and some aspects of Cynthia, the neck, these, Eevee, you're gonna hear me rarely say anything positive about because this is, this is one that I consider like really bad. Like genuinely awful. The attributes of each evolution yeah, it's a suggestion rather than a task. The evolution in question. They also gain a whole new set of specials with each of them having only four specials like your average Smash Fighter. They also might have different grabs. However, their basic attacks and throws will all visually remain the same, with the only changes to those attacks being what's directly affected by the attributes of the evolution in question. I should also mention that Eevee getting KO'd will not reset the meters. They can only ever fill up, never empty. Also, this is why I asked you to keep in mind of the normals that he brought up for Eevee. Because they all play into this. And if you're curious as to what this is, I'll let him explain. He's probably going to get there fairly soon. So with that said, let's get into all eight of Eevee's evolutions and how they change things up. Starting with the Bubble Jet Pokemon, Vaporeon. Targeting to Vaporeon's awesome bulk, it will be one of the harder forms to KO. Any attacks involving its tail also gains a huge buff in range. It's kind of just average in all other departments, though. For its specials... Look how they massacred my boy. Its neutral special becomes Water Gun, which will behave very much like Squirtle's Water Gun, only it can't be charged, so it does have only one set velocity. It's but yes, did you catch that? All the evolutions normals are the exact same as Eevee's. So, Vaporeon's biggest strength is that it gains more tail range. So what does it gain bonuses to? It's up tilt. It's uh, forward air. It's up air. It's down air. That's, that's it. It's also slightly heavier. That special becomes Bouncy Bubble, which behaves just like it does for Eevee. I'm also going to explain that this is extremely generic. I'm going to also say I'll straight, straight up, Vaporeon is my favorite evolution. So the fact that Vaporeon gets the short end of the stick in this design pisses me off specifically. Probably more than it would other people. So, so what does Vaporeon get? Vaporeon gets 
a boring water gun shot that's similar to Squirtle. Sports Nature Special, not something unique or new. Nothing like that. No. no. It, has, it has Bounty Bubble, like uh, like Eevee does. I am aware that it's currently impossible for Eevee's evolutions to learn these moves, but it's clear that they were made inspired by the evolution. So that will be a rule that I'm breaking for this moveset. Plus, I wish that they could get these moves. They'd make all eight of the evolutions a lot more of a threat competitively if they could. This, that is spoken from somebody that has never seen how fucking broken Vaporeon and Umbreon used to be in competitive play. That is spoken from somebody that has never seen how good the evolutions used to be before Power Creep became a thing Gen 6 through 8. Some of the evolutions in Gens like 3, like 4, 3, 4, and 5 were actually really good. Vaporeon was OU back in Gen 4. It was also extremely good in Gen 5 because of all the weather battles. The point is that there's a reason why he says this. And I'm going to laugh at it when it happens, and I hope you do too, because let's just say that his favorite evolution is very fitting. In any case, the up special would be Whirlpool, which behaves just like Sparkly Squirrel, only it deals no damage, but it launches foes much farther. Also, you're going to be hearing that a lot. The pro... The... The specials of the evolutions are creatively bankrupt. And by that I mean, essentially you're going to be hearing a lot of, it's like this, but with this. Or, it works like this, but actually does a little bit of this as well. You are going to be hearing that a ton for these special moves. So, on top of the fact that they're stuck with the same normals as Eevee, their specials aren't even truly that unique either. And its down special will be Acid Armor, in reference to Vaporeon's natural ability to melt into water. This will behave like a non-damaging but combined version of both Batty Bad and Glitzy Glow, halving damage and being able to armor through all attacks while it's being used. Next. Okay, so... What is Vaporeon? Vaporeon is a heavier bigger version of of uh, of Eevee it gets range on some some attacks it gets a crappy neutral special uh, it gets the same side special as Eevee it gets a, a recovery special that does nothing for it and basically adds nothing to its overall game plan and a down special that is essentially just a useless version of focus attack. Thanks, I hate it. Next up, we have the lightning Pokemon, Jolteon. Jol Before I go any further, is there something about Jolteon that seems a little off? You know. To tap, you know, uh, since they all share the same moves. So, you know, it's missing a little something that takes up a lot of the attacks used by this little shit. Yes, you read that correctly. If you look at the bottom right corner there. Jolteon will use Eevee's tail attacks, but it doesn't have a tail. Now, this is the part where designing unique attacks for the Eevee Lucian to make sense with the design would make sense, which is exactly what I did. All the attacks that used tail, used the Eevee's tail for Jolteon got repurposed into completely unique attacks when I designed Jolteon.
because it has to. Jolteon doesn't have a tail. It has it has rear spikes. They can grow, but functionally they don't work like a tail. Anyways, Tion is the fastest bar none. However, it's also one of the most frail, making it a glass cannon of sorts. It also has the worst tail range, due to not really even having a tail, being forced to rely on extending its rear spines in order to use the tail attacks at all. Why didn't you just give it unique attacks then? It would have made more sense. Its neutral special will be Buzzy Buzz, which will behave the same as before. The side special will be Wild Charge, which behaves like Sizzly Slide, but it's faster, deals a bit more damage. Behaves like Sizzly Slide. Again, it's like this, but with this. Damage, but Jolteon suffers a bit of recoil each time it lands. The up special will be Rising Voltage, which acts a bit more like a spring up special. Kind of like Sappy Seed in a sense, but much more immediate, and it does propel Jolteon into the air. And so it's hit by it will also be launched upwards. And its down special will be Pin Missile, which will have Jolteon attack from a stood still radius like with Batty Bat and Glitzy Glow. Except this has Jolteon fire a barrage of spines outwards into all directions, dealing small flinching damage to all foes within range. Great as a get off me tool or even for gimping. Okay. So, as it should be, comp as it should be made apparent, the. the the evolutions don't feel like they have um like they have a concise playstyle. Like when I designed mine, all the evolutions had a specific character design aspect in mind immediately. Like for example, Vaporeon was a trap zoner, Jolteon was rushdown, Flareon was like a, was basically like the Ganondorf slow but heavy hitting character. Espeon was the floaty mix up character akin to characters like Ness and Mewtwo. Umbreon was the close range physical tank. Jo sorry, Leafeon was the ground oriented damage dealer. Glaceon was the glass cannon zoner, and Sylveon was the floaty Rekka special oriented character that could cancel her specials into unique moves thanks to her ability Pixelate. There is no real aspect that's being changed as to how these characters function. And honestly, the specials they receive don't complement what the character should be. Because again, what is Vaporeon? It's a character with, it's an Eevee that's bigger with slightly longer specific normals and it has some moves they can push around and doesn't really have stuff that's designed for spacing or being a zoner or anything like that because none of, none of Eevee's, none of Eevee's ranged pokes used its tail. This is better than Jolteon, who's got a who's a glass cannon, but has a projectile has a has a powerful projectile, a move that will harm it. Even though, granted, I also gave Jolteon wild charge. I had damage in a little bit as well, but that was because the recovery was extremely good. Rising voltage doesn't really. I don't really get an idea of what it is. Like I get, I think it's just like an electrified jump. It's not. There's no real like visuals or anything to show it because rising voltage in Pokemon doesn't work that way. And Pin Missile is just this weird mid-range projectile. The the rushdown character that's the fastest has two projectiles. Granted, I gave Jolteon Pin Missile as as well, but I had pin, I had Jolteon used like a shotgun. Where it would like turn around the, and like just unleash a, a close range wave of spikes. It was like a it was a risk versus reward kill option. It was also a way to get people away from you. But the point is that the rushdown character has more ranged options 
than the character before it that's more of a zoner. Anyways. Next up is the flame Pokemon Flareon. The best of Eevee's evolutions, by the way. There are so many jokes I could say about that. But again, we're not here to make... We're not here to insult. We're here to... to we're here for constructive criticism. There's a lot of funny things I would love to say about that. And I'm not going to. But... I hope you're prepared... For what favoritism does to a man. Flareon might not be the fastest, but it is all about that raw power. Being the hardest hitting, and it also has the best tail range out of all the evolution. Why does it have bare tail range in Vaporeon? For clarification. Vaporeon is the largest of the evolutions. In terms of size. It also has a tail that is roughly 1.5 times the length of its actual body. It's massive. And it actually, you know, has a tail that can be used as a physical object and is not just a ball of fur. Flareon is not as big as Vaporeon, and its tail is not as long as Vaporeon's either. Why does why does Flareon get a power boost and also more range than the one that's supposed to have the range benefit? This basically just nullifies the existence of Vaporeon altogether. Which is funny because Vaporeon's existence would nullify this thing's existence altogether. It is a much better Pokemon, both design-wise and competitive-wise. For those that aren't aware, Flareon is the one of the worst Pokemon ever designed for competitive play. It is extremely awful. It doesn't have it has stats that do not benefit its type. It also does not get any of the needed benefits to make its playstyle work. Literally from gens 1 to 3, this thing was this thing didn't work. And while the physical special split definitely did help a little bit, it doesn't get enough moves to benefit its type to benefit its type advantage, and its stats suck. It's slow. It gets outsped by everything. Pokemon like Garchomp would turn Flareon into a chew toy. This thing has also next to no physical bulk. It has special bulk for some reason. But it doesn't have an HP stat to help with that special bulk. So even if it has a 130 special defense stat, it's still going to get eaten alive by, by water types. Yeah, exactly. Non-fire types were bare fire type options in Flareon. And for the most part, that's still true. Flareon's really bad. Like, in terms of design, this is, like, one of the worst ones stat-wise. Its neutral special becomes Ember, which works like Buzzy Buzz, but it's smaller and only deals flinching damage, so it's better as a gimping tool. Its side special remains as Sizzly Slide. Its up special is Fire Spin, which works like Sparky's Swirl and Whirlpool, only it deals the most damage but has weaker launching power. And its down special becomes Overheat, which works like Glitzy Glow and Batty Bad, but it's only raw power, dealing way more damage and has a bit more range. I don't know who it was that said that these are all Echo Fighters of Eevee. But the more I listen to this, you're you're probably closer to what it act to the truth than what it actually is trying to be. And lag afterwards. Moving on, we have the Sun Pokemon Espeon. Probably the more tactical of the bunch, having the best frame data and is decently fast, but it doesn't have the greatest survivability. Espeon is also the first not to bite for its grab. Instead, it uses Psychokinesis for a farther-reaching disjointed grab. And here's the problem. He shows that he is willing 
to experiment with specific aspects of the evolution, but he doesn't go all the way with the rest of them. So, Pokemon like Vaporeon and Jolteon are basically left sitting in the dust with nothing to do. And, yeah. And even though its throws and pummel remain visually the same, thanks to its psychic powers, it has the strongest throws out of all the- Why wouldn't you just make- Why wouldn't you just give it a- so wait, let me get this straight. You you gave it a ranged grab, but it still headbutts for all of its for all of its throws. Why not just have it throw them with psychic power? You went to the extent of giving them a unique tether grab. Why not give them unique throws to go with the grab? Because effort. Yeah, you know what? That's true. The evolution. Its neutral special can have it use Psy Beam, which is a simple straight beam projectile attack. Its side special is Zen Headbutt, which works like Sisley's slide with- I also just realized that Psy Beam is the first special to not be like something else, but like this. For range, though it is a little weaker, its up special can be Ally Switch, which by itself is a teleport that can be sent into any direction. But when Espeon reappears, it releases a burst of psychic energy that, the first person it hits, will have that person be teleported to the spot where Espeon teleported from. And its down special will just be Glitzy Glow. Now, here we have the Moonlight Pokémon, Umbreon. Bulk. Nothing but pure bulk. What you're describing is Vaporeon. Despite its appearance, this Pokémon is hard to KO, though that's about all it has going for it. You will need to use a few more dirty tactics in order to be effective with Umbreon. It does also gain a psychokinetic grab, but the power of its throws don't change too much. <laughs> My god. Even Umbreon got the psychokinetic grab. Well, they couldn't give Aqua Ring to Vaporeon. Again, look at how they massacred my boy. Its neutral special can be Dark Pulse, which works like Espeon's Psy Beam as a beam-like projectile, but it's a bit thicker and hits slightly harder, but it does have less range. Its side special can be Snarl, a move that hits right in front, and it stuns all foes who are hit by it before being slightly launched. Not the strongest of moves, but it's great for combo setups. Its up special is Foul Play. Umbreon surrounds itself in evil energy and can then leap into any chosen direction. Any foe who tries hitting Umbreon while it uses foul play will effectively end up getting countered while Umbreon remains unaffected, taking the same amount of damage that Umbreon otherwise would have taken. This doesn't work on projectiles though, those will interrupt Umbreon, and since its down special is just batty bad, overall, Umbreon hates projectiles. They okay. I guess. And we have the verdant Pokemon, Leafeon. Leafeon has pretty great power, speed, and even some decent survivability. But its frame data is lacking a bit, so it won't be winning too many games of chicken. Its neutral special can be... Wouldn't it be more fitting for the powerhouse Flareon to have the bad frame data? Again, it's clear favoritism towards Flareon compared to everybody else. Flareon's the most powerful and has the best has the best tail range. Razor Leaf, though it won't work like Ivy Swords. Instead, it'll shoot a cluster of leaves as a single projectile forwards that deals multi-hitting damage to foes. So it will work a little closer to how Buzzy Buzz works. Its side Buzzy special Buzz will be Giga Drain, which does work just like how Bouncy Bubble works. Its up special is Sappy Seed, and its down special can be Synthesis, which you can hold down to have Leafeon constantly heal about 2% of damage a second at the cost of not being able to move while you use it. Does the kit need it? Again, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Recovery options in fighting games have to be done extremely carefully, or else they're going to be crap. He gave Leafeon two of them. It doesn't need a recovery option. You gave... It doesn't need one, let alone two. 
Usually characters that utilize healing in fighting games are super glass cannons that if they take too much damage, like even half the damage of other characters, they're going to die. Like Gengar in Pokken, for example. Gengar heals off of like throws and stuff in specific attacks. But... Gengar also is like tied for having the lowest health in the game. Actually, second lowest health in the game. Only above Shadow Mewtwo. Great to get rid of all that damage you took from all those lost games of chicken. It's only lost games of chicken if you don't know how to read neutral. Moving on, we have the fresh snow Pokemon, Glaceon. It's like Espeon, having fantastic frame data, but it's slightly slower and weaker. But as a trade-off, it's much harder to KO. Okay. So aside from the fact that, again, it's, it's like this, but a little bit like this. Why is the ice type bulky? For those that are unaware, Ice is, objectively speaking, the worst defensive typing in Pokemon. And sadly enough, there are a bunch of Ice types out there that Game Freak tries to make bulky, but they are all really, really bad at it. That's why when I designed Glaceon, Glaceon was a glass cannon zoner. A powerhouse because what is ice? Ice in Pokemon is one of the best offensive types and is basically all the best, all the best ice types are all focused on dealing raw damage. Glaceon does not work as a bulky projectile user. Its neutral special can be Ice Shock, which works like Flareon's Ember, but it's much faster, hits a little harder, but it still only causes flinching. The side special is Freezy Frost. The up special can be Icy Wind, which works like Sparky Swirl, but it's faster, weaker, and it has a chance to freeze foes at higher damage percents. And its down special can be Freeze Dry, which works as a standstill radius attack like Batty Bad, but really it's closer to Flareon's Overheat, only weaker. But it is still faster, and it does have a chance to freeze foes. And finally, the evolution with... I know I'm not saying much, but I, I don't know how much I can say that it's like this, but like this is uncreative and not fun. Also, we've talked several times about how Brawl Fan likes to bring up one point over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, regardless of how unfunny it is the first time you hear it. I hope you're ready to be hearing about Sylveon's Flesh Ribbons. The incredibly creepy Flesh Ribbons, the intertwining Pokemon, Sylveon. Definitely on the slower side, but it has decent frame data and survivability. It's also the floatiest of the evolutions, having the slowest fall speed. Makes sense since... fairy. It also has a unique grab, making use of those cursed Flesh Ribbons. This gives Sylveon a disjointed tether grab, capable of using them to attack in the air, and they can snap the ledges for recovery. The neutral special could be Moonblast, which works as a slower but more powerful version of Buzzy Buzz. The side special can be Draining Kiss, which is kind of like Bouncy Bubble and Giga Drain, though instead of just being hit by it, Sylveon first has to grab its foes with the Flesh Ribbons that I hate so much, turning this move into a command grab. We the get it. The delicious Sparkly Swirl, and the down special can be the move Charm, Another standstill radius move. Though this one is a non-damaging move that slightly lowers the damage output of all foes hit by it for about 5 or 6 seconds at a time. Now with Eevee's 8 evolutions out of the way... Okay, so now that we're, we're through that train wreck... Let's talk about each of them individually. So... Vaporeon has... is harder to kill. It's bigger, has... has bigger tail attacks but it basically has useless special moves and its tail is hardly used compared to, you know, designing unique attacks around the fact that Vaporeon's tail, like we look at the fucking size of that thing, could be used for, you know, 
majority of its like physical attacks because again it's it's the most notable part of its design and I'm not only just saying this because I'm currently in the middle of designing a Vaporeon moveset that will be coming out in the next two days but it's it's important when you're designing a fine game character especially one for Smash that you take a look at the design of the character and you look as to whether or not there are any aspects that could be easily pulled from when creating attacks for example, everybody loves Waluigi. You look at Waluigi's physical design. What are some of the aspects of Waluigi that are, you know, what are some of the defining physical aspects of Waluigi that lead, that you would immediately turn to when designing a moveset? Well, he's got really, he's got, he's very tall. He's got notably long legs. So obviously, if I'm a fighting game design, if I'm a fighting game designer, and I am, my first thought is these legs are probably going to be used for some attacks, simply thanks to the fact that they're long enough, and they are they are the major physical standout point of Waluigi compared to the rest of his body. He has long le he has also long arms, but his legs are notably longer. That's what I mean. That's why I say Vaporeon it has a tail that double that's more than that's almost double the length of its body. Did I give Sylvia on Eureka? Yeah, I did. But yeah, Vaporeon has longer tail attacks crappy specials and basically is just a bigger slower version of Eevee that doesn't really have any major upsides or playstyle that benefits in any way. Jolteon literally cannot use half of the moves that Eevee has because again it doesn't have a tail. It also for some fucking reason has more projectile options than Vaporeon as the rushdown character. Flareon is the heavy hitting character whose range outclasses Vaporeon. And then you have the tricky character with the psychokinetic grab but it doesn't gain any unique throws. And then you also, for some reason, also gave the Psychokinetic Grab to, to Umbreon, even though it, you basically took away the one unique thing that Espeon had and threw it on another Pokemon, even though it makes no sense. Uh, you made Umbreon just a close-range fighter with no, like, again, doesn't really have moves or aspects that benefit in any way. Because of the fact that its tail is not long, it can't really make use of the moves that Eevee can. Leafeon, for some fucking reason, has two specials that heal it. Also does decent damage, but its main thing is that it doesn't have good frame data, which you think would go to this because it's the one with the most damage. Glaceon is essentially just more bulky version of this, but it also uses moves from this. And... Sylveon has a tether grab, but not but it doesn't make use of the ribbons in any other way when they easily could. Clearly what I'm saying is that if you're playing a character that isn't either Flareon or Leafeon, you have wasted your time. All the other evolutions are awful compared to Leafeon and Flareon. Flareon has range and damage. Meanwhile, Leafeon has range, damage, and two recovery moves. If you chose any of these, you have lost. You've lost the draw. And you want to know the worst part? These two are attached to special moves. They are cumbersome and would be obnoxious to use over and over again in order to help, in order to evolve. 
The two evolutions that have the easiest moves to use are not that good. Jolteon and Vaporeon are are struggling. Vaporeon more than anybody else. You guys have a couple of questions. What you could say that. <laughs> what happens if two or more of the types fill up at the same time? That's not the question I was thinking of. Two. What if I want to keep playing as Eevee? Is it possible not to evolve? And three. Well, yeah, you should. Is there a way to fill up the type that doesn't involve spamming attacks? It, it shouldn't have had to involve spamming attacks to begin with because the design doesn't work. Well, to answer all of those questions, that goes back into where I left off a while ago regarding what I called Eevee's technical neutral special. While you hold the special button down, that will automatically fill up the type meters bit by bit. Like I said, it's only when you let go of the button when Eevee uses an attack. So while the button is held down, that's a way to fill up the meter automatically without making yourself too vulnerable. Albeit you- What do you mean not making yourself too vulnerable? You're literally forcing the player to sit still and do nothing. There is no more vulnerability in a, game, in a fighting game than literally standing still and doing nothing. R is still stuck in place while it charges, but you are able to avoid using attacks by simply not holding the control stick into any direction when you let go of the special button. You still can't move and are left completely open to damage. So even if Press it, you don't have to dedicate yourself to an attack. It doesn't matter, you're still left wide open to damage. While charging, you can charge in one of two ways. The first, while holding the control stick into the direction of a type, which will have the meter only charge that type. It overall requires a combined eight seconds of charging like this to fill a meter. So, okay, you're it's either spam a move for ten spam a move ten times, or literally waste your time doing Nothing. Those are your options. You will either sit there and do nothing, or you will spam that move until you get the result you want. Neither of those is fun for the player. This isn't a natural way to play the game. This isn't suggesting that you use this move to evolve. No, it is telling you if you want to evolve, you will either have to waste your time or waste your time. You can either waste your time by potentially using moves that will get you punished and or killed earlier, or you can waste your time by literally not playing the game. Why was it not designed to be free form? Why was it this designed so that the player could play the way they want and get what they want for playing well? Because all this tells me is that if I want the Pokemon I want, which is the, be the best two ones, I guess, as I said, are Flareon and Leafeon, I would either have to use an attack that throws me forward and possibly be very unsafe on shield ten times, which basically it, ten Mistakes in the neutral of that caliber or the move of that type would more than likely be the entirety of my stocks. Not just one. I would be dead. I would be done. Especially since Eevee is weaker. And I need to be far more careful with my survivability in this time. And again, or it's either that or I literally sit there and... And I hold a button and I do nothing. And in that time, I am leaving this character that is specifically designed to be weak and weaker than the rest of the roster in a position that's basically saying, "Kill me, please! I'll, I'll even turn my—I'll even turn my ass to the blast zone so that you can give me a right good kick."
That's the problem. I'm either throwing myself into an opponent 10 times and possibly getting killed, or I'm sitting still and giving my opponent every opportunity to come at me and eat me alive. So despite EV being weak, it won't take long for you to get your desire in evolution. But going back to the question of what if I want to stay as EV, well, you can. And on top of that, you can play as a much stronger version of Eevee as well. If you hold down the special button while not touching the control stick, it'll actually charge all of the types at the same time. However, it will give priority to the types with the least charge, and only start charging the higher charge types once the lesser charge types become equal with said higher ones. Why, didn't, why not just make Eevee the middle of the road choice? The one that has some decent stats to it, but it also has notable downsides. It's no, it's decently fast. It's got good mobility, decent recovery, decent moves, decent options, but it lacks a little bit of range. It's also not very heavy. Can't take much, can't take much damage. You're also designed far more for close range than long range, and you don't really have many long range options. Why not make Eevee a character that is worth using from the beginning? Because it doesn't take away from the design whatsoever. With this design, no this one wants to play with a weak character? I didn't design Eevee to be weak. Why does he have to? One of two things to happen. Either only one type will fully charge, which automatically evolves EV, or all eight types will max out at the exact same time. And if this happens, instead of evolving, EV will borrow the strength of its eight evolutions to perform its Z move. The extreme Evo boost. Waste of dev time? Then make it just the first three. Make it make it the Cantonian evolutions and then stick with that. Have it just be Vaporeon, Jolteon, and Flareon. If you have to make a compromise, then I think that's the best compromise you can make. Which I unfortunately can't show due to copyright, but it's cool, I promise. Don't worry, Brawl fan. I made sure to have Adblock on for this video. Using this Z move, Eevee gets a large buff. Powering up its power, frame data, speed, Also, and can we back up a second? You need to take a look at these stats. So this is what he expects you to play as at the beginning of the game. You are a character with awful power, no weight, you can't move very fast. And you have the frame data of Ganondorf. But your tail range and fall speed is okay, I guess, in quotes. This is worse than playing as Melee Pichu. And you need to stand still as this and risk yourself by using moves that are potentially dangerous on shield and or whiff as this. Z move, Eevee gets a large... I can't even say Melee Pichu because Melee Pichu is not the worst character in the game. This makes, this makes Melee Kirby look like Brawl Meta Knight. Tristo, you can't say that because they made Sandbag playable in Super Smash Flash 2, and he's an actual character. Survivability, but it also becomes unable to evolve for the remainder of the match. Evo Boosted Eevee definitely has its own perks, being the most balanced out of all the forms, and it still has access to those eight Let's Go attacks as opposed to only being reduced to four. After all, while its evolutions all became what they are to match their environment, you know something? This design, with the way the evolutions work, and everything around it, I think it's clear 
that this uh, this design would have been a lot better if this was truly like Let's Go and Eevee didn't evolve. It'd still be flawed. Like a lot of the a lot of the special moves are either underpowered or overpowered in specific regards. But it'd be a lot better than shoving in evolutions that don't do anything for the character. If you want to make a Let's Go Eevee, why not make it a Let's Go Eevee and have it so that the only people... Sorry, sorry. That the only... Pokemon you can use is Eevee. With all those specials, pro better balanced, of course, they'd have to be better balanced than they, they have to be more properly balanced than they are now, but I think that that overall would be a much more cohesive and understandable idea, and you wouldn't have to tack on something that clearly doesn't work. As I said, half the evolutions are nowhere near as good as, as the others. Flareon and Leafeon make the rest of them irrelevant. Vaporeon is a joke. And as, a, and as somebody whose favorite evolution is, is Vaporeon, I feel insulted. Still has the capabilities to be the most adaptable. Pretty much Pikachu. Situation. Maybe still not the. That'd be, but wouldn't that be a fitting way for the for the for the secondary mascot to be somewhat close to the way the actual mascot is? Best for every scenario, but it's still certainly capable of holding its own. In fact. That's probably the best way to describe the design of this moveset overall. No, it is not. Adaptation. No, it is not. Learning what environment you're in and choosing to adapt accordingly. And choosing to spam the same move 10 times and or stand still for 8 seconds, aka basically putting yourself at a humongous disadvantage with a character that is notably weaker than the rest of the roster. If you can master Eevee's powers and... If you can spam a set a specific move ten times to get the evolution you want, aka the ones that don't suck, aka just Flareon and, and Leafeon, properly decide which form you should take for the opponents that you face. Again, it's, it's, six of them are crap, and the and two of them are broken. Then Eevee might end up being a very formidable asset. Of course, if you fail to learn how to use it properly and aren't able to adapt? If you aren't able to, if you aren't able to pray to the Lord above, to the FGC gods, you know, pray to the god of wave dashing Mango himself and beg for, beg for mercy as you hold that special button down for as long as physically possible, praying to God that your opponent who is faster, stronger, and better than you in every regard, doesn't decide to approach and literally ruin your day <laughs> as you sit there and you charge this one move because you need to get out of this swarm as quickly as physically possible. Then you might just end up catching a bad case of natural selection. That's how I would describe this move set: Natural selection. Learn, adapt, and focus. These are what you need to do in order to truly call yourself an Eevee main. No, it's not. <laughs> it is absolutely not. What religion do you support? Doesn't matter. Pick one of them. Get on your knees, clasp your hands together, and pray as hard as you possibly can that the opponent that is purposely designed to be stronger, faster, and better than you in every regard chooses not to approach and let you so kindly get the form you need. Or put your little tiny, completely 
unbalanced life at risk as you barrel head first into the opponent that again is faster, stronger, and better than you in every regard, praying to God that you don't instantly die. There is no adaptation here. You're not adapting. There's no aspect of this that is adapting. You are telling the players, do this specific thing, or you're never going to do anything with this character. And the alternative option is sit and do nothing for a set period of time, and maybe, just maybe, you will become the Pokemon you wish to be. But by then, it'll probably be too late to care. If you wish to be a true Eevee main, you need to be a masochist. You need to drink like Vaporeon's full of water. You need to eat car batteries like Jolteon's electric. You need to shove your head in the oven because Flareon's a fire type. You need to go to a bad psychic and have her read your palm because of Espeon. I don't even... If you get the... I should have just stopped at drinking because that made me want to drink. Smash ball while Eevee, then for its final smash. But guess what? The uncreativity with the evolutions doesn't end there. It takes on maximum fluffage and gigantamaxes. It appears behind the stage in its gargantuan form, and a reticle appears on the stage that can only move horizontally. Once you press the special button, or automatically after five seconds, gigant. Yeah, you know what? This move set would make us all Vaporeon mains. Why? Because we'd be forced to drink. Max Eevee will use its signature attack. G Max Cuddle. A huge beam erupts from the bottom blast zone and rises straight into the upper blast zone, going through the stage and dealing large damage to all foes. Oh my god, that's true. It can't it can't G Max. Oh boy. Once the beam ends, all caught foes will be shot straight upwards, more often than not resulting in a star KO, and after which Eevee shrinks back down and reappears in the spot where it was prior. And speaking of stars, if you get the Smash Ball as any of Eevee's evolutions, they'll use the powerful attack, Last Resort. He couldn't even come up with something unique for the evolutions. He just gave them all the same boring attack. It plays out the exact same for all eight forms. They envelop themselves in a mass of stars, then charge straight forwards. They charge pretty- You couldn't even have it so that the stars are themed after the evolutions typing. You couldn't have the stars be like liquidy and made of water for Vaporeon or like on fire for, for Flareon. Or, you know, yellow and electric for- for Jolteon and so on and so forth. It's all just code and stars and run. Far with them more often than not disappearing into whichever side blast zone they were aiming for. Anyone in their way will be dealt huge damage, being launched into the direction that the evolution flew into. After which the evolution will reappear in the spot where they initiated it. Yeah, for choosing a bear evolution, you get a worse final smash. Even if some of them are are you choose a worse evolution for a worse final smash. So we have an interesting situation here. So yeah, I'm just gonna talk over this. As I said, the others so far were bad. But they had redeemable qualities. There is nothing redeemable about this moveset whatsoever. It's convoluted. It's poorly structured. There's no clear, concise 
idea in mind that works. And the evolutions are not thought out whatsoever. They are essentially bigger, slightly larger echo fighters of this. And that's the problem. Then the assistance hat. Next we can give them six and yes, as I said before, Flareon and Leafeon make the rest of these characters. Yeah, they're at the, they're at their movesets funeral right now. That's why they're all dark and wearing glasses. Um, the team they make them irrelevant. Vaporeon especially is the worst one. Like, I don't know if he specifically just hates Vaporeon, but it's, it's the worst one. It has a unique bonus that it doesn't even have the best of. It's not the bulkiest. It doesn't even have the best range. Again, favoritism because again, Flareon is his favorite. Also, this animation is a big fuck you to the trainer that chose it. <laughs> it's like, how oh, you expected me to be useful, but it was I, Flareon. He treated Vaporeon like he treated Shadow, a character he stated he hates. And you see, that's the thing. You can't let personal biases get in the way of character design. If you let your personal biases in the way of character design, you have failed as a character designer. I've said this before on, this, on a stream before, and I'll say it again, especially now since it's, it's about somebody different. If you... Designing a character is a selfless process. You are, you can you can pour your ideas into it, but you should never pour your personal beliefs. Could you imagine if actual fighting game developers were like that? Could you imagine if the developers of Street Fighter VI hated Guile, for example, and they hate him so much, they purposely make him the worst character in the game, they cripple all of his abilities, and basically tell the people that like the character to go fuck themselves. Why would you ever want somebody like that designing your fighting games? It, fighting game design is a selfless act. You are not designing a character for you. You are designing a character to work in a fighting game. Any personal biases you have about the character that you are covering should be left at the door. And if you cannot get over said personal biases, you should not be developing this character at all. And it's also because of stuff like that, I would tell you, you will never see me covering a character on my channel that is a character I actively hate. It does nothing good for the design process. And this is supposed to be fun. You're supposed to be covering the things you enjoy. The things you like. The... Fine game design and creation as a whole is about 
expressing how you feel about certain things and mainly focusing on the things that you love and enjoy. Why would you go and design a character that you actively hate? You're obviously not going to do as well with that character as you would one you like. Does that apply to characters I like? I've only done characters I like. And I'll continue to only do characters I like. Do you think it's bias or you think it's mis he's misunderstanding balancing? It's probably a bit of both. But if somebody actively states that they hate a character, then... No, there's definitely going to be some bias that, that muddies the water. In the center spotlight, hopping around in excitement while the other eight cheer from the sidelines. Yeah. One of the worst. This was painful to sit through. The other three, I could josh a little bit about. Take the piss out of it a little bit. This one was legitimately painful to sit through. And uh, we're going to take another 10-minute break before I get to Isaac. Because Isaac is worse than this by a country mile. I also need to rest my voice for about 10 minutes because I'm starting to lose it. I can feel it. I'm starting to lose it. So, yeah. And that does it for what if Evie wasn't mad. When all said and done, I just have to say, I'm serious. Flareon's the best one. And you know why? It's got nothing to do with lame reasons like competitive viability or opinion. Oh dear sweet Jesus, I forgot that this was a part of this fucking video. There's one important fact that points to Flareon being the best of Eevee's evolutions. It's huggability. You know that Flareon is the best one to hug. It's so It's not real. Your judgment is based on an aspect that isn't real. And with it being a fire type, it's got to be so warm and comforting to snuggle up with. First off, that's really fucking creepy. Second of all, let's test that there, shall we? Let's, let's have a bit of fun with this idea. Okay. Flareon. Let's bring up Flareon on Bulbapedia. Let's see. When storing thermal energy in its body, its temperature could soar to over 1600 degrees. Flareon's fluffy fur has a functional purpose. It releases heat into the air so that its body does not get excessively hot. This Pokemon's body temperature can rise to a maximum of 1650 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I looked at the comments for this video, and there were people telling him that if you hug this thing, you will fucking die. <laughs> Because of the fact that it, its body is extremely hot. Now, he responded to that and said that, no, the fur, it uses its fur as an insulator. Several things wrong with that statement. First off, an insulator is designed to hold in heat, not release it. it is an, what it does is the opposite. But you also have to understand that it releases the heat through its neck fur, 
which means that out of any part of its body, that is going to be the one that is the hottest to touch and be around. You could probably cook a marshmallow from a five foot distance within the amount of heat that would release from Flareon's neck fur. Not to mention, its body temperature would have to be notably high. Even something like 350 degrees Fahrenheit, if you fucking hug that, and that's low compared to what its maximum can be, that is insanely hot. That is third degree burns level of hot. You are going to a burn ward if you attempt to hug this Pokemon. If you hug this thing, it'll be the last thing you ever do. So aside from the fact that it's really creepy that, that, that he uses a fake a fake measurement on Pokemon, the Pokemon being good and actively trying to defend the fact that this is one of the worst Pokemon ever designed in terms of competitive viability and stat dis distribution and what have you. What his, de his defense on this Pokemon is objectively incorrect. Seriously, Vaporeon's too scaly. How would you know this? You can, it's not real. Jolteon's too pointy. Leafeon's too leafy. What does that even mean? Glaceon's too cold. It's not real. I suppose Espeon and Umbreon would be okay, but you may as well be hugging Chihuahuas. There's no real satisfaction from doing so. They're not real. Also, yeah, it's toxic. And you. I'm sorry. Oh my god, the image is very crusty. I just don't want to deal with those flesh ribbons. So there. I'd rather burn to death than deal with flesh ribbons. By the way, did I mention the flesh ribbons? Because of the flesh ribbons. Flesh ribbons, I know. They're awful flesh ribbons. Flesh ribbons. There you have it. Flareon's the best. No ifs, ands, or buts. Holy shit, that is a derpy looking picture. <laughs> so, now that you've heard the undeniable facts, and if you enjoyed what you- Okay, no, there's never been an instance in any sort of comedic anything where stating something to be irredeemable facts when it's clearly not has ever been funny. No one has ever done it funny. Ever. But again, I find it very funny that his favorite evolution is the worst one of them all. You saw it, and would like to see even more characters be given possible Smash move sets. Okay, thank you, thank you. We get it. So, uh, I don't know what to do in terms of a friendly intro for this guy, so... Yeah. Naked Child. And uh, we'll we'll talk more about this naked child in about ten minutes. I just I need a second to just get up, walk around, and you know, take it ish. But this is it. This is the last one, and it's the worst one. By the way, this is the worst move set he's ever done. So yeah, I'll be back in 10 minutes. Only 10 minutes. I'm not going to be gone for as long as I was the first time. I don't have a headache or anything like that. I just need a second to stretch my legs, get a drink, and just come back. That's all. So uh, let me just find some music. This will do.
Hello, I'm back. As I said, I wouldn't be taking as long. I also wanted to make sure my voice could at least hold until the stream's over. So I did go ahead and I did make myself some tea. For those of you that are curious as to what kind it is, it's Red Rose Orange Pico. Single tablespoon of honey and a bit of milk. So, we reached the end of this What's going to be over eight hour stream when I'm done. The question is, why is this the worst? Why is this at the bottom of the barrel? So, a lot of the design aspects you've heard me talk about tonight have had flaws. But more often than not, it's more it's usually one major aspect of the character that stands out compared to the rest that isn't thought out and brings the whole design down. Isaac, at, its, at his core, is a phone book's worth of flaws. This is how you do not implement a roguelike character into a fighting game. It's... It's bad. Take every idea you've had about random number generation and video and fine game structure and put them together. Think of the worst possible thing you can think of. And you will more than likely think of something that is very similar to how Isaac is handled in this video. Why is this worse than Monokuma? Monokuma is just stupid. That's why. It, it's clearly just a throwaway. Oh, he can just randomly explode. Yes, that's awful. That's that's disgustingly bad. But a lot of the stuff around Monokuma in terms of his in terms of his moveset and everything, it's it's bad to harmless. Everything about Isaac's design is awful. Like, really bad. This character is essentially designed to be an RNG-ridden mess. That if you were to see this character be made fully into a fighting game character, you would need a fucking phone book to properly to, to learn his matchup. The matchup notes would literally be as thick as a phone book. And I, as a t I am a Binding of Isaac fan as well. I love Binding of Isaac. It is a fantastic game. I might stream it sometime this month because we are in October. And it's a great time. I also need to get to the new DLC, so it would be a great opportunity to do so. But, as I said... Isaac is fucked. Well, there were some even there were even some ideas for Eevee that could have worked if a little more time went into it. Nothing about Isaac works, and this design would need to be made from the ground up completely in order to make something that functions. It is that bad. I'm just gonna let the video get started. More me costumes. Why would you want a me costume of a naked child? Have you ever tried to make an Isaac moveset? I haven't tried to. I probably could, but I don't really have any interest in doing so. I made a I made my roguelike character with Accurate, and I'm and I'm proud of Accurate. 
So, I think I'm going to leave that there for now. Is Brawl trying to do a Faust but not good? Okay. Imagine if, Fa if Faust had every single one of his attacks be what do we have here levels of unpredictable randomness. That's a great way to describe Isaac. A couple of quick warnings. This game is not for the faint of Oh my fucking god. I forgot he puts these disclaimers. Not for those with a queasy stomach. To alleviate this, some footage used in this video will have its color taken away. If you don't if you're if you can't take the the possibility of shooting a sentient piece of shit with your with your sadness, then uh don't watch this video, because viewer discretion is heavily advised. <laughs> this this introduction makes it sound like I'm about to watch a best score video. So apologies if that bothers anybody, but that's just how I'm going to be handling these types of Also, oh, the color's taken away because, you know, I need that ka chinga 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 Characters. Overall, viewer discretion is heavily advised. The young boy who never stops crying. You won't, you won't put, you'll put a disclaimer, and then the next frame you'll just have this naked child in full frame of the camera. Isaac, from the binding of Isaac. Of course, there's a reason why this poor kid is constantly crying. I mean, I probably would too if I had to be on the run from my own mother who was trying to sacrifice me. He's probably crying for reasons that you don't understand. Forced to run through a forever changing maze filled with all kinds of demons and other things that I will not be talking about in this video for reasons that are not safe for good boys and girls. Just know that his mother has convictions that causes poor Isaac's life to be in danger. It goes way deeper than that. All I'm gonna say is, is that oxygen deprivation is a fucking horrible way to go. He's not without defenses, though he does need to find them first during his travels in the depths. But regardless, when coming to Super Smash Bros., he'll have plenty of tools to work with when going up against the many, many other contenders of the Smash world. Though to get this out of the way now, this will be a fairly toned down move set in the context of Binding of Isaac. <laughs> Oh my god! Oh my god! Okay, I get the context of why he's saying that, because, you know, there's a lot of, you know, demonic imagery and stuff in Buying of Isaac. All sorts of stuff like that. But just the fact that he says that this is dumbed down when this is the most complicated thing. This is rocket science. Um... Yeah, I'm just sorry that comment just got a laugh out of me. For very obvious reasons. That's just how it be. In yeah, case, just how it be, all right. Be a pretty light character with some quick but almost slippery mobility. He'd have two jumps and he would be able to crawl. For those who've never played Binding of Isaac, it's a top-down dungeon crawling shooter game. And what does Isaac use to shoot? Well, quite morbidly, his own eyeballs. The waterworks pouring down from his face, that's his main means of attack. This is, this really doesn't need to be said. More than likely, if you show gameplay that people are going to piece it together, that your tears are your main form of weaponry. Also, if you've never played Binding of Isaac, why are you here? Go play it. It's really good. Tear shots. And guess what? That'll be his main means of attack for Smash as well, as it'll be what he does for the majority of his attacks. Okay, I want you to keep this in mind. We're going to need to create a fucking document for this. And yes, I'm pulling up a Word document for this. So, okay. Just so that we can go over this later, because there's going to be a lot to talk about. main weapons are his tears. These tears are a projectile attack. Okay. He shoots tear shots straight forwards for his jab, side tilt, down tilt, 
neutral aerial and forward aerial for the down tilt. Almost every single one of his grounded, every, almost every single one of his grounded and aerial based normals are the same tier shot attack. Specifically, it'll be shot closer to the ground, and since he can crawl, this would be one of the more reliable ways to be able to shoot while moving backwards. To shoot straight upwards, he uses his up tilt and his up air. Using his back air will have him turn around to shoot backwards, and he'll shoot straight downwards for his down air. Scratch that! Every single normal is shooting tears. He can only shoot into straight cardinal directions, never diagonally, and he'll only ever shoot one tier shot per attack button press. He's designed like he is from his base game, as a full shooter character to rack up damage to his foes from a distance. You took that way too literally. Every tier shot is weak for the most part, dealing very small flinching damage, and the rate of fire is kinda slow. Be Tears? are weak and slow, do not accumulate much damage, wondering how in the hell I'm supposed to do anything against a character with a reflector. Question mark, explanation point, question mark, explanation point. able to shoot only two tier shots a second, but it's overall designed like this to allow Isaac to be constantly firing his tiers while also staying mobile. You never want to stand still too long with Isaac, and this applies for both Smash as well as his own game. So he'll very much be like a version of Mega Man, except if Mega Man shot his buster for most of his attacks as opposed to his wider Robot Master weapons collection. So what you're saying is it's Mega Man but even but with shittier design is what you're basically telling me. For his other attacks, this can have him use a select few of the various items that Isaac can find throughout his game. The dash attack can have him use Ares, a power-up that gives Isaac ram horns and allows him to deal damage to foes if he runs into them. For Smash, the horns will quickly grow on Isaac's head and he'll lunge forwards with a quick goat tackle. Then the horns will disappear right after the attack concludes. Uses Ares for dash attack. Moves are all the same, and he has no reason to approach because all of his moves are ranged. Why does he have a unique dash attack that... <laughs> and not anything else? <laughs> strong attack that launches foes on contact. For his side smash, this technically will be another tier attack, but it'll have Isaac unleash a tier explosion right in front of his face. Forward smash is the big cry, wondering why he didn't just use the punch tier item you can find it would work just as well use the launch foes hit by the blubbering blast it has a bit of disjoint as well as some end lag as isaac composes himself afterwards i can only imagine how much it must hurt to force yourself to cry that much you're this forcing me to cry you're forcing me to drink this is a feather that allows Isaac to summon multiple beams of light that rain down from the sky to deal big damage to enemies. For Smash, he holds up the feather and backs up into the Z-axis. Then a light beam quickly strikes down into the spot where he was standing. The crack in the sky up smash is comparable to that of Palvatana's up smash, appropriate enough considering both of their holy origins. It Pop smash is an item. This will become redundant later because of the fact that all of his normals, spoilers, are 
based on getting specific items to change their properties. It's quick to come out, launches always on contact, but it does have some end lag. And unlike Palutena's, it's a little smaller due to Isaac being smaller. So as such, the horizontal range of this smash will be pretty poor. Wouldn't it be more ironic? Wouldn't it be funny if the light, since it's coming from below, would be like red and evil, like you know, devil themed, because it's coming out of the ground? Finally, for Isaac's down smash, this will also be a tear explosion like his forward smash, except he'll be utilizing the item called Mom's Eye. Referring to the old saying that mothers have eyes in the back of their heads, this has a literal eye appear on the back of Isaac's head, and it allows him to shoot his tear shots backwards at the same time as he does when he shoots them forwards. For Smash, that eye will appear on the back- That image is fucking horrifying. Um, down Smash is... Crying on both sides of his face. More tears, more than likely affected by items. Question mark. Look at his head, and he'll shoot two tear blasts on both sides of himself. However, they will be smaller than the blast made by his side smash. But just like his side smash, there will be a bit of end lag as he composes himself, as well as to let that eye on the back of his head disappear. Isaac's grabs and throws will be fairly pitiful, what with his stubby little arms. He can grab with both of them and pummel by headbutting his foe. His forward throw can have Isaac do a single clumsy spin before tossing the foe forwards. The back throw. Why is Isaac smaller than Kirby? Could have him struggle to lift the foe overhead and then chuck them backwards. The up throw can be a simple throw upwards, and the down throw can have him do a single jump on the foe to back up their damage before they're bounced away. For Isaac's neutral special, this could have him lay another one of his most common weapons aside from his tears, and that would be bombs. He'll simply lay a bomb on the ground in the spot where he was standing, or drop it straight down if used in the air. These bombs will automatically explode after two seconds, or if they make contact with a player. And this does include Isaac, by the way. He can be hurt by his own bombs. He can have up to two bombs on screen at a time, and if he tries to lay a third, then nothing will happen. For his side special, this will have Isaac do a sliding tackle forwards, and when he does, he'll leave creep on the ground. Creep and binding of Isaac are puddles of various liquids left behind by enemies or even Isaac if he has the right item, and stepping into the creep will cause an effect to the one who stepped in it, with one effect happening depending on its color. In this case, the creep that Isaac leaves behind when he slides forward will be blue, representing his tears and as if he had the Aquarius item. This blue creep is slippery to walk on for everyone except for Isaac, with characters losing traction while walking on it. The sliding tackle itself does deal some decent damage to foes if they're in Isaac's way. It can be used for horizontal recovery, but it does put him into free fall if he uses it in the air. With that said, if used in the air, the creep created by it will just fall straight down from the flown path, which will create puddles on the ground if used over the stage, which could allow for the creep to be more spread out if platforms are involved. This falling creep won't hurt foes if it falls above them, but it will disrupt them a little bit. Are you essentially telling me that Isaac pisses on people? Acting as a sort of weak wind box. Finally, only one creep puddle can be on stage at a time. If the side special is used again when a creep is already on stage, then the prior creep will just evaporate. Now for Isaac. <clears throat> Standard special uses bombs. Curious as to why this wasn't a smash attack option, instead given their explosive power and ability to clear rooms easily in Binding of Isaac. Side special leaves a slippery trail on the ground does next to nothing for both Isaac and his opponent because said initial dash attack is weak and the creep can easily be jumped over and countered. If used in the air by definition given by Brawl Fan, Isaac will literally piss on his opponent. Isaac's up 
special. This can have him unleash the power of the Holy Grail, which grants him the ability to fly. This will be a fairly standard recovery up special, as it'll have Isaac grow angel wings and fly straight into any upwards angled direction. He can go slightly horizontally with it left or right, but for the most part, he'll always gain height. Makes sense in context of it being the Holy Grail and all. By itself, this special deals no damage, and it does put Isaac into freefall after using it. However, he's not totally defenseless, because if you tap the attack button mid-flight, it'll have Isaac shoot some tears straight into the direction that he's flying into. And they fly slightly faster than he does, so they can be used to possibly thwart any foe that may be trying to interrupt his ascension. And finally, for Isaac's down special... I'm gonna freeze this frame of Isaac smiling because he deserves some happiness in his life. Up special is essentially a worse version of Arsene's recovery special. Basically, it begs your opponent to two frame it more than Lucario's extreme speed. This won't do anything. That's right, if you use it, absolutely nothing will happen. At first. Oh Here's no. The thing. I'm sure that many of you are thinking that this moveset sounds pretty lacking. Mm, that's not the word I'd use. Well, there's a pretty big reason for that. I'm Since sure. Everything that I just described to you up till now will be Isaac's moveset when he first gets started. <sighs> oh no. You remember you remember our Susano discussion? about a character starting out with a bunch of moves limited. Um, this is eight times worse than Eevee. In other words, it's his base move set. That's right, guys. It's gimmick time. Just call it a character mechanic. Gimmick sounds childish. For those who have never played The Binding of Isaac, the best way... If you've never played The Buying of Isaac, you're probably very confused right now. What do you mean he just shoots tears? What do you mean he can just piss on people? Angel wings? Horns? What do you mean he grows an eye on the back of his head? If you've never played Buying of Isaac and you're this far in, you're probably extremely confused. For me to describe it truthfully is RNG the game. Literally every new floor Isaac reads. Tons of people use gimmick, they shouldn't. It's a character mechanic. Which is, is a totally new and random layout, and it changes for every subsequent playthrough. But that's not all that's random. The enemies, bosses, items, and even the power ups are all in completely random spots. Oh, it's no. never the same. So as such, more likely than not, your power and attack build as Isaac will hardly ever be even remotely identical between two playthroughs. Oh, He'll no. only be using different things to help him on his journey. So, I would like to take that gimmick that he has in his own game and incorporate it into a gimmick for his Smash moveset. Oh, Once no. the starts, Isaac will be pretty bare. Metaphorically. I mean, well, he is bare literally too, but you know what? I'm not even going down that rabbit hole. You're way too late with that sensor. Randomly throughout the whole match, Items from Isaac's games will drop on the stage in the same fashion as usual Smash items. Unlike normal items, though, only Isaac can interact with them. Then items will randomly spawn on stage. These are items from the Binding of Isaac, and only Isaac can interact with them. Granted, this does not take into account that these items can probably be safeguarded by opponents that can wall you out and never let you get it. Isaac, if Isaac wanted to get an item, from Fox, it would be literally impossible for him to do anything about him holding his reflector and 
making him take a shit ton of damage. This does also not account for if there are multiple Isaacs in play. Who gets to hold the key? Question mark. How do you determine which item belongs to which Isaac? Maze will not even be there for his opponents. All Isaac has to do to obtain one is touch it. He doesn't need to pick it up, just make contact with it is all. And when he does pick it up, he gains that item's power. It also slightly changes his appearance as well to let you know what items he currently has. Oh no. Appearance will physically change depending on the item you get. This sounds like coding hell for the developers and no there's no end that's it just coding hell an item will spawn on a random part of the stage every 10 seconds <laughs> <laughs> items will spawn every 10 seconds this means that the chances of Isaac living to get one of these items is literally zero. <laughs> Only three items can exist on stage at a time, and no more will appear until one of them currently available is picked up by Isaac. There's no other way to get rid of them. He has to pick them up, which could be bad depending on what you want, because here's the thing. Some items may override ones that you currently have depending on what type of items they are. If you have a build that you're going for, but find that none of the three items currently available are desirable, or will make you lose an item that you already have, you may have to make the difficult decision of giving up something that you already have to make sure that you can keep getting other useful items. Or you could be happy with what you have and just choose to avoid the three items entirely to keep what you got. I can feel my brain melting out of my ear. Of course, your opponents could be rude and purposefully hit you into those undesired items, forcing you to pick them up. That could lead to some fun. These items also have potential negative effects. And like Phoenix Wright from UMVC3, you are potentially forced to waste your time and damage your build. situations. But that's the basic gist of the items. Now let's go ahead and get into the items that Isaac can find. Strap in, folks. There is a hefty amount of them. And I'll be organizing them into three different categories. Tier, Special, and Other. I'd like to remind you all that these are all completely random items that will spawn every 10 seconds. And these categories will have subcategories as well. So let's waste no more time and get right into them. If you haven't realized why I consider this the worst moveset he's ever done by now, you will. The tier category of items will solely consist of things that will change the attributes of all of Isaac's tier attacks. That's why I made so many attacks based on the tiers. Some attacks are based on the tiers. You mean every single one except for two. tier-based items, I'll be separating them into tiers for her. There are three her, her. tiers in total. Tier 1 will consist of items that affect the tiers based on their range or speed. The first item will be the Lump of Coal. This will make it so that Isaac's tiers will get stronger the farther they fly. When he has this, it'll show Isaac's face covered in soot. The next item can be Mom's Heels. These will increase how far Isaac's tiers will fly when shot. 
This actually shows Isaac wearing the heels, as much as it must suck to do so. And the final how would you know? One can be the torn photo. I don't want to know how you would the know. The firing rate of Isaac's tears, making them come out faster. This item will make Isaac look even sadder than usual. Uh, I feel bad. Anyways, let's move on to the items of tier two. There will be five of them, and they all change Isaac's tears physically in some way. The first item is the Spoon Bender. This gives Isaac's tears homing properties, but it also removes their flinching capabilities, making them only deal damage. Okay, so let me go over this. Has an absolute unneeded abundance of items relating to three specific categories, all of which are broken into three tiers apiece. These tiers will affect different aspects of his tier attacks, aka his entire moveset, and by extension, And by extension, force you to play by the hand the game gives you. This gives Isaac a third eye on his forehead, and it also changes the color of his tears to purple. What has to happen to make you cry purple? I don't think I want to know. The second tier 2 item can be the Cupid's Arrow. This will make Isaac's tears pierce, causing them to only disappear when they reach the apex of their shot, and not after hitting a foe like they would normally, potentially allowing you to hit multiple foes at once with a single shot. Which means this is, this is the most useless thing you could get in a 1v1. This gives Isaac a Native American headband. The next is Paul. You can be racially insensitive. With Femus. This increases the size of Isaac's tears, making it easier to hit foes with, but it also slows down their firing rate. This gives Isaac one big gross eye, turning him into a cyclops. The next tier 2 item can be soy milk. This is the opposite of Polyphemus, shrinking the tears, but also increasing their firing rate. However, this also slightly weakens them as well. Having this item will show milk covering Isaac's mouth. And for the final tier 2 item, it can be the technology. This is the most drastic item for the entire tier category, as it gives Isaac a robot eye and allows him to fire thin laser beams. These beams pierce and are much harder to avoid since they have a straight hitbox and are not considered projectiles, with the main downside being that their rate of fire is pretty bad. Oh joy! He has Rob's neutral special as his entire moveset. I should also mention that unlike in Binding of Isaac, they don't have an infinite range. They have the same range as the normal tiers when not factoring in any other items. And now for tier 3 of the tier category. This is the smallest tier with only two items, and these items will give Isaac's tiers secondary effects. The first is Fire Mine, which adds a fire attribute to Isaac's tiers as well as slightly increases their power output. This gives Isaac a flaming eye on his forehead. I should also mention that his side and down smashes will also be affected by these items as well, since they do count as tier attacks. All of these changes affect every single one of his tier based attacks, including his smash attacks. only the tier 3 items will change them. And in the case of Firemind, when Isaac creates the tier explosions with the smash attacks instead of actual tiers, he'll just straight up create fiery explosions, making them much more powerful. Anyways, the final tier item can be Scorpio, which gives Isaac's tiers a chance to poison opponents. This changes the tiers running down Isaac's face to the color green. If purple is bad, I really don't want to know what makes you cry green. In which case, before I continue, I should remind everyone that certain items replace others when picked up. To clarify, items will only start replacing each other if you pick up items that are in the same. So again, 
if you're if you're wondering why I say this is the worst move set, this is the problem. You are essentially going up against a character that even the player doesn't know what the hell they are going to get. And it's one thing if you don't know the matchup. It's another thing when the person playing the character doesn't either. These items alone make Isaac unbelievably complicated. I would also like to state for the record that the, there are attacks here and items here that make his attacks do no have no flinch, which means that the entirety of his moves had turns into Fox's lasers with extra effects. Would you like to fight against a against a character that can shoot at a moderate pace, projectiles that move as fast as Fox's laser, and can poison you like Joker's Eha? on every attack from every angle what in the fuck is this design <laughs> I'm not, I, I said I wouldn't sugarcoat it what is this this isn't even complicated anymore it's just excessive how do you kill? Good question. Very good question. I don't know. It's kind of the problem when you make every move the same. There's nothing here. There's nothing here that works. I said this, I said this, this is why this is the worst one. This is, there's nothing here that works. We're, that's only one category. We're now going to talk about the move, items that change his specials. So for example, if you pick up the lump of coal but already had mom's heels, then you'd lose the heels for the coal. However, if you have mom's heels but pick up the spoon bender, you'll get to keep both since they both exist in two separate tiers. And Isaac will get the benefits from both of them. This makes it so that you can make all kinds of combinations with a single item from each tier, but prevent you from stacking too many items and making Isaac way too powerful. I don't, if Isaac was built like this, his matchup chart would be more fucked than Min Min's. This should also be kept in mind for the special category, which, as you can imagine, holds items that alter Isaac's special attacks. This also has three tiers, with each tier holding items specific to his neutral special, side special, and his missing down special. The up special won't have any alterations. It'll actually be one of the few moves that'll never be altered. That's my face after eight hours. To assure that he at least has a consistent recovery option. But getting into the special category, starting with tier one, these will be items that change the attributes of Isaac's neutral special. These items will not alter Isaac's appearance, by the way. They just change what kind of bombs he uses. So it will be up to you to remember what he has. The first bomb item can be Bob's Curse. This will make its explosions have a chance to poison its victims. The next bomb item can be the Bobby Bomb. I'm totally not some. Why does he have an item that does nothing if he picks up a specific tier cho uh, choice? And you gotta understand that the chance to get the poison tiers is, and the fact that it's in a tier of its own with only two items, the 
there's a very high chance that you're going to use the poison tears if you don't want to use the, the fire tears. So, since that's is in a category with only two items, again, you have like a 50% chance to be using that in that slot at any given time. Why would you put in an item that they could also poison? I'm assuming they don't stack. Because poisons don't tend to stack in Smash as it is. We're not playing World of Warcraft where there's like four different types of poisons. There's only one here, and I'm assuming that they do not stack. A reference to a certain explosive Mario enemy. These bombs will actually slowly move across the ground towards foes before blowing up. Oh dear sweet Jesus. Okay. Then there's the hot bombs. These bombs leave fire on the ground after exploding, which can damage players who step in it until it peters out. Next is Mr. Boom, another basic bomb just like the base bomb, except it's slightly larger and slightly more powerful, also creating a bigger explosion as you would imagine. Then is Mr. Mega, which is even bigger and more powerful than Mr. Boom. These larger bombs are good and all, but remember, Isaac can be hurt by them too, so it is a double-edged sword. N not really. He's a ranged character. To be completely honest, using bombs kind of doesn't make any sense. Because against characters that don't have a way of dealing with the projectile, how are they going to approach? They're all the same move. It's a ranged projectile option. All Isaac has to do is jump. Characters like Captain Falcon are crying in the corner right now because they can't do anything against this setup. The next can be the remote detonator. This reverts Isaac to his basic bombs if he has something else, but as you can guess, this removes the two second automatic explosion that they have and makes it so that they'll only explode if Isaac himself detonates them, which he can do by tapping the special button again after laying down a bomb. However, the downside to this is that it limits Isaac to only being able to lay down one bomb at a time instead of two, so pick your poison. And for the final bomb item oh, that Isaac Christ. can find, it can be the troll bomb appropriate to their name, they're there to make life a little harder. They behave like the Bobby Bombs, except they don't follow an opponent around, they follow Isaac around. This is dangerous to have, but it could be useful for some mix-ups since you can leave the bomb to wherever you want until it explodes. <laughs> mix-ups? Mix-ups with what? The same move? On all buttons. No, my correction, he's shot in a slightly different angle. And yeah, it's also not a pickup. That's it for the bomb, team. That item is just literally a detriment to you. There's no mix-ups with this moveset. The mix-up is praying to God that you're fighting a character that can't deal with the potential items you'll get. While other characters will walk all over you for free regardless of what items you get. Here, now to the next one, which will consist of items to alter Isaac's side special, the Creep Tier. The slide that Isaac does for his side special will still do the same thing. The only thing that the items from this tier do is change the color of the Creep. Firstly, Aquarius is an option to pick up as an item, so if you change the creep but want to change it back to blue, you can. But the second creep item can be the Toxic Shock, which changes the creep into a green color. It represents acid, so the creep left on the ground will hurt opponents if they walk on it. This will also change Isaac's appearance, making it so that his body glows a slight green radiant. In the last- You're giving too many poison type abilities to this one character. These abilities are starting to homogenize, and I'm going to be completely frank with you. Acrid needs a job. Don't take it away from him. The last creep item for this side special tier can be the Ball of Tar, which turns the creep black like... You can become racially insensitive. Tar. This is the opposite of the blue creep, since it makes foes who walk on the black creep slower while walking on it. Having the Ball of Tar will turn Isaac's eyes yellow. Now, there are four other creep types, but, uh... Yeah, I'm not going to use those. They're red, yellow, brown, and white. And I'm leaving it at that. In any which case, for the final tier in the special category, this will be for Isaac's initially missing down special. 
As I said, at first the down special doesn't do anything. The reason for that is because you're required to pick up an item. Color of the color of black. I'm talking about Isaac changing black. Changing to black. I'm not being serious. It's a joke. Every familiar is different, and each behave in mostly different ways. Oh, As good lord. Are, I've chosen eight of them, making this the largest tier out of any category. And just like with the bomb tier, this tier doesn't change Isaac's appearance, so you'll just need to remember what familiar you have. Every familiar can only remain out for a limited amount of time, and each one can also be attacked and killed by opponents. Regardless of how they leave the field, once they do, Isaac has to wait for 30 seconds before he can summon it again. And since he can't summon more familiars while one is already out, the 30 second cooldown doesn't start until the current one on screen leaves the field. Also, if you pick up a new familiar while you have a current one out, that current one will be replaced and will just disappear. But this will also reset the cooldown, so he won't be able to summon that new familiar until after 30 seconds pass. So be smart in when you collect those familiars. I'm sorry, I, I, let me hear that one more time. I tuned out because of, this is rotting my brain. It has to wait for 30 seconds before we can summon it again. And since he can't summon more familiars while one is already... You know, I'm starting to th get the feeling that this guy doesn't really know the concept of time in Smash matches. I'm starting to get that feeling. Out, the 30 second cooldown doesn't start until the current one on screen leaves the field. Also, if you pick up a new familiar while you have a current one out, that current one will be replaced and will just disappear. But this will also reset the cooldown, so he won't be able to summon that new familiar until after 30 seconds pass. Which means you're not going to get a chance to summon it. Familiars. So starting with the first, there's the box of spiders. There to ruin any arachnophobic's day. This summons two to four spiders that all crawl around on the ground following Isaac. They automatically latch onto any foe who gets too close to them, dealing non-flinching damage that racks up while they're latched on. So these are kind of like Pikmin in a sense. The spiders can remain out for 30 seconds at a time at most. The next familiar can be the leech. 30 seconds is a long time. You might as well say they can stay out indefinitely because the chances are that they're going to be out indefinitely. Like the spiders, this little guy follows Isaac around on the ground, albeit it's slower, having a harder time keeping up. Also like the spiders, if it gets too close to a foe, it'll latch onto them to rack up damage. Unlike the spiders, however, the leech has a weaker damage output, due in part to it being alone. However, when it does deal damage to foes, it causes flinching damage until shaken off. And then whatever half of that damage was that was dealt is automatically given to Isaac to heal him. The leech can only hang out with- Why? 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 Why would you give the character who's nothing but ranged an option, an option to have a companion that does Flinching damage, which basically means that they're fucking screwed. Because Isaac can just sit in the back and shoot while his leech sucks him off. And then the damage they deal... Goes back to healing him. Oh my god. <laughs> Dear god. Why does he need it? Next is the smart fly. This little guy hovers around Isaac at all times, generally remaining a pacifist. But it'll drop that pacifism in a snap the moment somebody harms Isaac, and it'll begin to attack the foe who did so, dealing up to 5% of non-flinching damage to them before returning to Isaac. It's good at what it does, but as such, it only lasts for 10 seconds at a time. The next familiar 10 is seconds a long angel. time, pal. This little guy also orbits around Isaac like the smart fly. But the angel will never stop orbiting no matter what. Instead, it makes Isaac completely immune to projectiles, nullifying... Oh, good. Here, you are a character that is all range. All of your abilities are, are literally the exact same. They all function the exact same. They all gain the exact same buffs as one another. The only thing that could possibly challenge you is a character with more project is with better projectiles than you. Here is now an option to win every ranged fight in the game for free. 
Characters like Robin are crying in the corner. Everything shot and thrown at Isaac. It also deals minimal non-flinching damage to foes if the angel touches them as it orbits Isaac. As such, it is his weakest familiar in terms of damage output. Better for defensive purposes overall, and it only lasts for 10 seconds at a time. But now getting into- 10 seconds is a long time. Ten seconds is an extremely long time to be walled out and be unable to ap approach at all. The more directly offensive familiars, first there's Brother Bobby. This will follow behind Bobby. Isaac and will shoot its own tears whenever Isaac shoots his into the same direction that Isaac shoots. It only ever shoots normal tears, but it's still effective. Yeah, everybody's crying. Isaac's tear shots, though they won't ever be fully aligned since the familiar is trailing behind, and moving around a lot will make the shots more spread out. But that could be a good thing depending on your playstyle. Brother Bobby only hangs out for 15 seconds at a time. Next is Little Gish. He behaves just like Brother Bobby, but he has a slightly slower firing rate. But that said, tears shot by Little Gish have a chance to slow foes down, making their movement sluggish for a short bit. Little Gish could only be out for about 15 oh, no. seconds at a time. Let's then double the let's Robo double that range of pressure and by extent also make it harder for them to run away. <laughs> oh my god, Little Mac is checked out. like Brother Bobby and Little Gish, but it shoots the piercing laser beam attack instead, and it also has a slower fire. Hi, do you want a friend that will give you free Rob laser? And finally, there's Seraphim. There you go. Again, behaves like the prior three mentioned, but it defaults to shooting homing tears that deal non-flinching damage, and it, again, has a slower firing rate. Seraphim is only out for about 12 seconds. And that's it for the special category. Oh, only out for 12 seconds. You know, the, the moderate 12 seconds of homing projectiles. Again, you can only have one of each. So the wide variety can help make for a lot of interesting combinations. But that said, the final category, the other one, doesn't have that limitation, but it also doesn't consist of any tiers. Instead, it just has five items, each that more so qualify as quality of light changes for Isaac's moveset more than anything else. You're able to have all of them at once, so picking up one item from the other category will not replace any other that you may have. Oh Starting dear sweet first, Jesus. There are batteries, which aren't actually items for you to pick up and keep. Instead, what they'll do is eliminate any current familiar cooldown that you may have as soon as you pick it up, making it so that you can use a familiar immediately after getting the battery. Next is Telekinesis. This actually extends Isaac's grab range by allowing him to grab foes from further away and pull them to his arms. Why would he need to grab them? He's literally designed to just sit un away from them and pelt them with tears. You know, powerful, rapid shooting, homing, poison, and or flame tears. of his pitiful throws just make it easier to grab opponents. Next is the My Little Unicorn Horn. The only thing that changes to Isaac's moveset when he collects this is his dash attack, replacing the Ares Ram Horns with a single long unicorn horn when he lunges for the tackle. This new horn increases- Again, why would he do it? He, his moveset is literally discourages any kind of re, any kind of getting close, and your kill options are literally limited to like two attacks at most is the range and damage of the dash attack, and it also gives Isaac a slight amount of super armor, making it a little safer to use overall. After that is the fanny pack item. This makes it so that the binding of Isaac items will actually begin to appear more often as Isaac's damage percent increases. And not only that, it makes it so that four items can be on screen at once instead of just three, though this will only proc if Isaac's damage reaches at least 50%. And finally, for the last item that I- That sounds like it should be the standard. It can find among his large amount of loot, it could be Capricorn. This is a temporary item. It makes it so that all of Isaac's attributes will be powered up for 10 seconds. His speed... 
Why, why is it always double digit numbers? Why is it always double digit numbers? Oh my dear God. Image lag, it's all improved. Overall turning him into a much better character for the 10 seconds that he has its effects. And that's everything. All of the items that Isaac could potentially collect to change his moveset around to your liking. I feel dead. I feel like a part of me died watching this and we're not even finished yet. This is the worst. This is the worst. I don't even know what the hell it's trying to be. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a Build-A-Bear Workshop character. But Build-A-Bears of this caliber don't work. This is Susano if Susano only started with his standing heavy <laughs> and had to unlock all of his other physical attacks. <laughs> That's what it feels like. It is, it is asinine. The amount of time that would take in order to properly learn everything here would take you years. I said it before and I'll say it again. The guides and cliff notes about Isaac would be phone books worth of descriptions. It would be massive for this one character. Every potential outcome, every potential you know, familiar, the new bombs, everything, the creep, all these extra items, the possibility of him just randomly finding a fucking power buff that gives him a 10% increase to everything for 10 seconds, which is basically free reign for you to do whatever the hell you want for a very long time. This is the worst. Evie was really bad, but this is the worst. This one, this one is, this one is irredeemable. It doesn't represent Isaac well. It doesn't represent roguelites well. It doesn't represent anything well. All it represents well is the headache that's slowly coming back. long as you're lucky enough to get what it is you're looking for that is and that's the problem i know i know it may seem a little overwhelming at first to have at first no completely and totally 100 percent speaking from somebody that knows fine game design 28 times more than you do it is completely and utterly a mess i have so many options to effectively customize isaac and at the game's mercy no less but that's just how the binding of Isaac is. You're at the game's mercy at all times. That's neat. This is a fighting game. This is not the binding of Isaac. This is not a roguelike. This is a fighting game. Where clear, concise ideas and design philosophy reign supreme above everything else. Being at the mercy of the game is why Phoenix Wright and UMVC3 sucks. Anything in a fighting game that takes away control from the player is bad. And this is the worst thing I've ever seen. If you want to see how to design a roguelike character properly, go watch my video on Acrid from Risk of Rain. That is how you do a roguelike character properly. 
I don't know what this is. I don't want to know what this is. But it upsets me. It upsets me deeply. And the problem is that not a lot of people I've seen make move sets for Isaac. So that this is like more, this is like the only thing that people really have to go off of for fighting game potential for Isaac from buying of Isaac. Unless you played Blade Strangers. It's bad. I said it before, I'll say it again. This is the worst move set he's ever made. It's inexcusable how bad this one is. Also, no, I don't like Phoenix Wright from UMVC3. I think that he does some things extremely well, but I think that at his core, having a, having a character that actively can actively waste their own time is bad character design. Also, I don't know if I consider Blade Stranger's Isaac good representation, but it's certainly better than this. Because at least in that, he's a clear, concise character with, with clear, concise abilities. His understanding of what despair is. Well, why don't we ask Google? What is despair? Definition. The complete loss and or absence of hope. That is despair. And that is exactly how I feel after sitting through almost nine hours of this shit. Despair. Items, power-ups, and even enemies that show up are completely random. But even then, these collectibles don't actually change the moveset itself, just its attributes. No matter what you have equipped, you can still play Isaac the same way. No, you can't. Because considering the fact that all the attacks are the exact same, and that 90% of the moveset is affected by a single tier of attacks, by a single tier for the tiers. No. You can't. You can't play Isaac the same way because the properties completely change. Or maybe you can. Because at the end of the day, it's all shooting. And there's no unique thought process put behind it. It's poorly thought out. And it's bad. It's bad for the character. Bad for the series. Bad for you. It's just bad. So no. There's no excusing this, pal. This is shit. I already said I wasn't going to sugarcoat it. And... The filter's starting to come off even more since we're almost nine hours into this. It sucks. It's bad. It's You should feel actively bad for making this. It is awful. You're just given new things to keep in mind to take advantage of. Yeah, you know, an entire phone book's worth of things to keep in, to keep in mind and take advantage of. Because no party, no party here understands what the hell they're doing with this character. Plus, it's not like you can get overwhelmed with too many things. <laughs> yes, you can. That's why I put the tier limiter on. I mean, aside from keeping Isaac from getting too busted, that is. Oh my god, hearing him try to explain himself. 
It's like listening to somebody like stream. It's insufferable. Even if you get an item from every tier and all the items that you can actually hold on to from the other category, you'd only be able to hold nine items at most. Ten if you have Capricorn. Coming up with the different combinations that the game throws at you, I think would be a lot of fun to do. You're objectively incorrect. Nobody will be having fun. Not the person you're fighting. And not you, because the chances are high that you're not going to get the things you need and or want immediately. There's no fun involved here. None. And it's kind of embarrassing that you're trying so hard to defend what is objectively awful. And I think you know it's awful. Because I've never heard you go out of your way to try and defend this idea. An idea that you've made before. Like, this is, this is disgusting. It'd really allow you to flex that big brain of yours to pull all kinds of unique tech. It really doesn't because you're at the mercy of a game. And you have to take what the game gives you. Unless there's a clear and concise way to get the items I specifically need, no. Just like when playing Binding of Isaac. I don't think you've played Binding of Isaac enough. With all of that said, however, there is one super important detail to keep in mind about everything for Isaac. In the Binding of Isaac, if you die, that's the end of that run, and you're forced to start. Oh over no! You've got to be fucking kidding me. Happens. You lose everything that you collected up to that point. So as such, for Smash, whenever Isaac loses a stock, he loses everything. Oh my sweet baby Jesus. So it's not bad enough that you're at the mercy of a moveset that is literally all the same attack. But, considering the fact that you can only get an item once every 10 seconds, you're more than likely never going to get to use those items because you lose them when you die. And I'd also like to point out and on top of all that, he made he made Isaac as light as Squirtle and Mr. Game and Watch. So another reason why you're more than likely not going to do anything against anybody. Oh my God, that just adds a whole new layer of shit to this move set. My God. Once every 10 seconds, this 75 weight value character has a chance to get an item. And you can, and you can gatekeep him away from that item. And it might not even be the item he needs or the one he wants. And then by the time he's gotten that item, you could have closed a gap and killed him. And made the time he spent trying to get it completely and totally pointless. Fuck this moveset. This is the equivalent of waterboarding. Forget for character design. It was bad before, but this one point pushed it up. 17 layers. Yeah, water boarding with your own tears. This is awful. I can't say anything else.
I don't, I don't know what to say about it. I mean, what, what, what can I say? What, what can I say? At this point, I feel, I feel dead inside. I'm glad that I'm almost done. And will be forced to recollect his items again. That may seem harsh, but any item currently on the stage that Isaac didn't collect will still remain there even after he's KO'd, so that can allow you to save some preserves so that way you're not totally naked when responding. You- That's the equivalent of hitting your- hitting a tree with your car, having it explode into flames, and then somebody coming up and telling you, well, Look on the bright side. The wallet that burned that got burned to a crisp. The cards in it were still good. You need to take advantage of what the game is giving you and use it as your own. You got to do the big brain plays. Otherwise, you might just end up sucking. You mean like this move set? Oh, and speaking of sucking, I'll just mention this now real quick. If Kirby sucks up Isaac and gains his neutral special bombs, then Kirby will be able to pick up some of Isaac's items, albeit only the bomb items. Oh dear sweet Jesus, so good. so of all the characters, Kirby gatekeeps this poor naked child the most. That way Kirby can also use the different kinds of bombs. That will be the one exception of other players aside from Isaac Ditto's being able to interact with the binding of Isaac items. And speaking of Isaac Ditto's, it's three items at most per Isaac. So if there's two Isaacs playing, then six items can be on stage at most. And all Isaacs can interact with any item regardless. Oh my god, that'll be a fucking mess in 8-player Smash. Which I'm sure would lead to all kinds of interesting but fun chaos. No, that would just be fucking chaos. For Isaac's final smash, it can have him use the number two tarot card, the High Priestess. Isaac will pull out the card and a reticle will appear on screen that you can move around. Okay, thank you. You, you can get that image off the screen. It's not related. Out of nowhere. The grotesque leg of his mother will stomp down into the spot where the reticle was. The leg keeps going down until it hits a solid part of the stage, meaning that it will ignore platforms. Any foe hit by the leg will be dealt major damage and knocked back. And if a foe ends up with more than 100% of damage when they get- I feel like I've seen this game more in black and white than I have in its actual color in this video. This final smash is that if the reticle is over a bottomless pit, then the, the things people do for re for ad revenue, am I right? Isaac is standing in, as if to punish poor Isaac for trying to lead her into the blast zone, among other reasons. This won't actually hurt Isaac, it's just sad in context. Sorry to say, but I'm going to avoid giving Isaac any alternate costume. I know he has plenty of options, but with how I built this moveset, and to make sure that you can properly see the alterations on Isaac's character from the various items that he can collect, Maybe he doesn't need those alterations. Having his base appearance be simple, I feel is best. As such, his default is- Also, he doesn't have a lot of the characters unlocked, so I think that should explain how much he's actually played a Binding of Isaac. ...can be his usual skin tone. And for his alternate colors, this can reference the colors that his skin can change to in the game after collecting certain power-ups. The first can be a pure black skin, based off a variety of items like Abaddon, Brimstone... I'm not gonna Star. say anything. This goes on for this one, honestly. Next could be light blue skin, referencing powers like anti-gravity or his PJs. Then light green skin, referencing some of the more sickly-based power-ups. Then there's brown skin, which is what he normally gets when he collects Capricorn, or even others like Sagittarius. I'm not gonna Next say anything! Skin, based off power-ups like Dead Dove or Ouija Board. It's Ouija Board. Skin, referencing the Midas' touch power. And finally, red skin, coming from the SMB Super Fan power-up, which in and of itself is a reference to Super Meat Boy. I feel that this would be a lot better if you just use the other characters. Using the number zero tarot card, The Fool. Which was used if you wanted to teleport Isaac back to the starting room of a floor. This is not Persona 5. Please stop showing Persona characters. Start shaking in a panic before calming down, 
and the second can have him giving a little thumbs up towards the screen. These are both things that Isaac did whenever he obtained certain power-ups. And the final <laughs> that, 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 that one on the left is how I feel, and it probably is. how the player feels. In which case that familiar will hover around him as Isaac watches it. And finally, for the victory animations, the first can show the poor boy crying on the ground in a fetal position as random memories are shown in the dream bubble above him, referencing the between-level loading screens. The next can show Isaac opening a trap door in the ground, only for him to hear the sound of his mother's voice. Isaac! He turns around in a panic, then jumps down the trap hole with it shutting behind him. This references how he's just trying to escape from his mother, and shows that he successfully completed another floor, but now it's time to move on to the next one. And his final can show Isaac opening up a toy chest, and after rummaging through it a bit, he pulls out a quarter, looking proud of himself. This references one of the many, many endings that the Binding of Isaac has. This toy chest one in particular has a lot of different versions of it where you can find all kinds of different stuff. But here's the thing. They're all super messed up! The one where he finds a quarter is literally the tamest! And in my opinion, the happiest one that isn't up to interpretation or just ambiguous! Oh, poor Isaac. He really doesn't have a goddamn clue what Binding of Isaac really is, does he? Oh, whoops. That's better. Sorry about that. But that does it for what if Isaac was in Smash? Ha. Uh. Huh. It messed up, and it was a challenge to create a moveset based around it. Well, you you clearly failed that challenge. But I somehow managed. No, you did not. And I love how it turned out. I did not. And I really hope that you all did as well. Absolutely not. Playing the Binding of Isaac for the first time was an interesting experience, to say the least. But how much playtime did you have before you decided to make this character? How much did you research? Probably not much. That's just another reason why I love doing what I do. I get to expand my horizons even farther than I ever thought to do so before. Right, you probably should have aimed a little lower there, pal. And I cannot wait to see what new games and what new characters the future has in store for me. I, I would say I hope you do them better, but I know what comes in the future and it doesn't get any better. Hope that I get less super gross ones. No comment. Ugh. No comment. Anyways, if you like what you saw, I would like to see even more characters. It's over. It's finally fucking sets, over. And if you'd like to support oh the show, my god! I feel, like I feel I feel like you death. Can join button either below the video or my main page to become a sponsor for my channel. Doing so will get you access to my private Discord as well as channel emotes. You can guarantee that your name appears. I feel like actual death. What what if character is coming next a week in advance? I really appreciate anything. Give me money know. so I can and tell you a week ahead of time which character I'm going to fucking ruin. Either comment down below or contact me on Twitter at brawlfan one on Twitch. I hope you all enjoyed and thank you so much for watching. Shut your mouth. This has been agony to sit through. All of this has been a mistake. <laughs> and I can only hope that you learn something in this nine hour excursion. Because I never want to come back here again. I hope that the next time you see him make content, I hope that you look further into it and challenge what could potentially be horrible ideas. Because more often than not, they are horrible ideas. 
I've said this before and I'll say it again. The five movesets I've shown you today were probably not the worst of all time that he's done. But this one was. And I hope I never have to watch it again. If anybody ever asks about Brawlfan, I'm sending him here. And they can take the time to skim through this nine hour torture fest that I have put myself through for the sake of proving a point. What is that point? That people are willing to accept far, far less than what they should be getting. And that these movesets need to improve. There really hasn't been anybody that stood up and said anything about stuff like this. And I felt it would only be a matter of time until I was the one that did so. Couldn't you have just muted Brawl Fan's name in your comment section? The thing is, I could have, but... Not everything, it, not every comment relating to that would be, you know, a comparison or anything like that. Or it could be like, I liked this is so much better than Brawl Fan's iteration or something like that. The fact that it could be taken and used in so many different contexts is one of the main reasons why I didn't mute it. If we hit 9,000 likes, part two. No. I was tempted to just say yes for the, for the, for the joke of it because I know it's never going to get that. But no. No. I don't, I don't, I don't want to do this again. I, I've had my fill. I, I don't want to watch any more of his videos. Granted, that one guy in Pizza's Discord is going to continue to shove it down my throat. He does. Every single time. I don't, there will never be another one of these. It would have to be, if it, the only way I would do it is if he did something extremely egregious and like really like condescending. But he's not the kind of person that would do that. So I know that I don't have to worry about it. Why don't I block him? He's blocked on my channel. But... He hasn't gone to a point where... Why just outright block Brawl Fan in general? I think one of the main reasons is that he's like a car wreck. You just can't you just can't look away. I just sometimes it's, yeah, I just can't look away. Man made horse beyond my comprehension, yet my eyes are glued to the fucking screen. Oh, I'm person in the pizza server. I did for a while. But now it's also, now I'm also in other discords where people post his movesets. So 
even if I did, I probably wouldn't escape him. What about looking at the good ones for part two? What good ones? If you can give me five videos that are good, like actually good, maybe, but good is subjective. Thankfully, being bad isn't. A good one. Well, then the stream would only be like 15 minutes long because it would be like one video. Not necessarily Brawl fans, but any moveset videos that you liked and want to highlight. What? You want me to do one for pizza where I just watch his videos and talk about how good they are? It'll make me sad. I'm going to tell you that right now. It will make me sad. Because his content used to be the main inspiration for me and was one of the reasons I continue to do moveset videos. But the problem is that if I did something like that for pizza, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be adding anything to it. I'd basically just be watching and saying, I love that idea and stuff like that. There there's rarely ever been an instance in pizza's movesets where I've stopped and, you know found that there was an idea that needed to be challenged. I'll definitely say that um, for, you know, since I was going through this and I was trying to decide which characters I would cover, um, let me look. Let me, like, give a list of what I was going to do, of what I was thinking of. Um... I was considering Eggman specifically because the, the mechanic is dumb, but a majority of it was just references and it, it was an early video and I didn't want to do it because of that. I also considered Paper Mario because I know somebody that comes to my streams a lot wanted me to do this one. And yeah, it's extremely biased, but I didn't think it was as egregious in specific areas that I want to talk about as the ones I covered today. Um, Agumon was almost up there. He was almost in the same boat as, uh, as Eevee. He's very similar to Eevee in how badly he's designed. Um, I was in Monster Hunter because I love Monster Hunter and I, and the way he did it pisses me off. I almost did Doom Slayer because, uh, because Doom Slayer is like the character that I've basically been a pioneer for in terms of you know smooth move support in the smash community i was like the first ones pushing for this character's inclusion and i kind of feel that this becoming a thing as soon as it did partially rests on my shoulders 
and it was bad. It, it's bad. But I didn't think it was as bad as some others that I wanted to talk about. Hang on a second. Fuck off, Uber Eats. Metal Sonic was, was pretty bad. That was one that I was considering doing as well, but I dropped it. Impmon has the same problems as Agumon, except not to an extreme degree, and I didn't want to annoy you for 22 minutes because he does a really bad attempt in a New York accent the entire video. Malakuma, I know, is is bad for a multitude of reasons. Henry Stickman is kind of in the same boat as Isaac, but I think Isaac was even worse. Ori upset me because it took the potential for a character and basically shafted his some of his most important ideas because he clearly couldn't think of ones. Master Chief, I don't even want to talk about... I don't even know what the guy was thinking when he made that. Imposter almost got there. Imposter almost got there for a multitude of reasons, but I decided that nobody really would take that seriously because it's important because it's among us. And I need a serious talking point. Steve was awful. I don't want I don't want to cover Steve because Steve's already in Smash. That's one of the main reasons I never looked at the characters that already got in Smash. I'm trying to think what video it was in. The, 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 he had a comment that made me laugh. I can't I think it was Pea Shooter or Chell. I don't know which one it was. But essentially there was a comment that he made that basically was along the lines of Oh, I'm not going to just pull references. I'm going to come up with something creative or something. Basically, basically, it's like, could you imagine if I just did that? If I, if I, could you imagine how uncreative that would be if I just pulled references? It was very, very tone deaf. And I don't know which video it was. It was one of these three. It was in. It was Chell. That sounds so immensely tone deaf. Especially considering everything I've shown you and talked about today. I don't remember. All I know is, is that for people that do what I do, this is the front runner. This is the person that people are going to see the most. And this is the person that in terms of content production makes the most in the shortest amount of time. Now, I say it before and I'll say it again. You can't produce high quality content in the amount in in a single week's time. You can't. You just can't. And I don't know. I don't know if he'll improve. I don't even know if he's gonna see this. And I'm probably expecting even if he does, he's probably not gonna watch it because I wouldn't sit through nine hours worth of it. It's nine hours of some guy telling me that I'm bad at what I do. But I'm just leaving it at this. I think that that's the this is the best place to stop. And just go. I thank all of you for watching. Those that, you know, 
stuck around all these nine long painful and uh, painful as fuck hours my voice is my throat is so immensely sore right now you have no idea how sore my throat is right now and i'm gonna say that this is probably gonna put back my latest video by like by like a day so because i'm gonna probably need to take a day a day's worth of time to rest my voice so for streaming since i do want to come back to streaming again sometime soon i was thinking maybe on I want to say Thursday, maybe Thursday or Friday. We'll uh, we'll come back and I'll I'll maybe continue blasphemous. I want to continue blasphemous, or maybe we can mix it up a little bit and we can throw in some Binding of Isaac. I mean, considering it's it's the month of Hall it's the month of Halloween. The bones are out. The bones are being rattled. My bones are fucking rattled. And, uh, yeah. I'm not sure. But yeah, there's a new video coming this week. And... I have several more videos planned for this month. I'm gonna try and get as many of them done as I can. I don't know how many I'll be able to do. I'm one person, I work alone, and I'm not always motivated to work, so, until next time I see you, I'm going to literally go and melt into a puddle in the corner of my room. Good night, and remember... Say no to bad character design.